August 11th day, April 2024. I'm going to be your host tonight, today. I'm Dana Durnford, also known as the Nuclear Proctologist.org. I see we have a grand total of nobody watching, a show I've been doing for a decade. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was, uh, and we're going to be covering a House Committee Energy Subcommittee hearing on nuclear fuel and small modular reactors. We're just going to get after it. You can call into these shows, by the way, uh, this at 709. I'm a Canadian. I apologize. At 709-589-4406. Always takes me a moment or two to get up to bashing speed. Ooh, so you're going to notice a watermark in that YouTube video from the House Senate Committee, sub-Senate, subcommittee, rather, hearing. And uh, that's the way it works here sometimes. So this is a three-hour, ten-minute video where they have witnesses and the politicians um, trying to flush out nuclear fuel uh, Deep geological repositories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, unfortunately, the reason I'm the only reason I'm going to show up to a video like this is because of inconsistencies for three hours and twelve minutes. And so, before we we're going to start the video off right from the beginning. We're going to walk right through the whole video, and every time they're telling a lie, we're going to stop and try to articulate what the law is and what the truth is. Uh, and so I'm just going to, one of their main witnesses is Lake Barrett. And Lake Barrett was the guy who covered up him and uh, Ernie Gunnison helped cover up Three Mile Island's emissions. But Lake is being asked in the la very last part of the video, so I'm just going to go, because we want to bring the credibility of the witnesses to the front of this conversation, because that's important to help articulate the story. So I'm going to play this video of Lake Ferret responding to questions from the Energy Subcommittee hearing. Here we go. Uh, communities and or individuals that could be exposed, should there be an accidental leak, should it not be 100% contained? The risk to the people who live by any of these facilities, be they the current ones or be they ones in the future, is very, very low. They, these are all... No, no, no. I'm, I'm asking what, what the byproduct of the cause and effect to, to, the, to the people, if there was an accident, a leak, if it were to get into their water stream, how would it affect the environment that ultimately could it have a negative health effect on the people? There's no credit, in my opinion, there's no credible situation that could cause that. Now, a, a meteorite could come out of the sky and blow something up, and yes, there could be. Um, first, it's much more, you know, to suggest that the only thing that can cause uh, uncontrolled release would be a meteorite coming, from, which is very credible, by the way. We're hit by meteorites all day long. But if you have a tornado, if you have a severe event, even rioting, if you disconnect the external power from the site, uh, these generators take a very long time to start up. You jeopardize the, the integrity of the, the fuel that's in the reactor cores. They need constant cooling and circulation also in the fuel pools. Uh, at the minute that they don't have the cooling, they'll start to denigrate the fuel. And if it loses water, uh, as soon as the zirconium claddings are exposed, they catch fire and start to burn at enormous temperatures. And this is where it'll run away. So a tornado can take out 
uh, the power system at a nuclear power plant, including for the generator. It's completely reliant on external power, and it usually has two dedicated external power supplies, which is typically cold because that's cheap, and it keeps the, the cost of the enormously expensive nuclear down a little bit. But the consequences of the nuclear biological aspect on the, pub, on the public is minuscule. All the fuel pools are hemorrhaging radiation 24 hours a day because the fuel that comes out of the reactor cores are still splitting atoms for millions of years. So when you put them in a fuel pool, they still split the atoms. That's taken up by the water. The water evaporates at a bit of rate of 120,000 liters per day. Each liter has a catastrophic amount of radiation into it. And all of these facilities are surrounded by farms. So there's another venue where you're guaranteed to poison the majority of the population within a several hundred square miles. It's a const they're constantly emission emissions. And the older the fuel pool, the more fuel that's in it, that means, which means there's more emissions every single day from these fuel pools. There's a thousand fuel pools worldwide. On all of these situations. And this is Lake Barrett, by the way. Okay, you call it minuscule, but what is the health effect if somebody comes into contact or a community is, is exposed to this radioactive material? The, the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest consequence is going to be a psychological one. Um, it just, I, he does this all the time, by the way, where he says it's strictly in your head. There is psychological problems. There's the first studies they do after a nuclear accident are for autism and Down syndrome. There's a perpetual amount of heart issues, a lung, respiratory, pituitary, thyroid, adrenaline, and down the road there's Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, diabetes, Down syndrome, schizophrenia. There is some very tangible mental health issues, but not psychologically in the context of being the only issue. And psychologically, there 100% should be, everybody should have a psychological issue from an accident because you can't contain the emissions. As we saw from the accidents at Three Mile Island or in Fukushima. The so he's suggesting that Three Mile Island and Fukushima, there was only psychological issues. That completely discredits him as a witness. Every facet of his story discredits him. True impacts were, from radiological were very minimal and, and virtually non-existent. Um, it's shocking that somebody would say anything like that, or non-existence. They actually closed, or the food was banned from 14 prefectures by 55 countries, including America for a decade. So to suggest that there was no adverse side effects, he should have been, he should never have been used as a witness. It's, you got a wolf in the chicken coop. That's what Lake Barrett actually is. The psychological impact of those things were huge. So the, the, Ameri the impact of some accident, assuming there was a major accident, uh, would be basically psychological in my opinion. It, so it sounds like you're leaning on if a tree fell in the woods and nobody heard it, then it didn't fall. What do you mean that on those incidents there are no verifiable cause and effects to the, whether it be human species, other species, from those accidents? The, the, the vast evidence of international scientific evaluation of Three Mile Island uh, and also Fukushima is minimal. Now, Three Mile Island was, was really nothing compared to Fukushima, but those, the biological impacts on the environment and the human, human lives are, 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 are undetectable. My time's expired. I'll give you an opportunity to answer on the record, all of you gentlemen. So he's claiming that it's undetectable, the adverse side effects. And so let me go back for one second when he's asking Lake Barrett. Uh, communities and or individuals that could be exposed, should there be an accidental leak, should it not be 100% contained? 
the risk to the people who live by any of these facilities, be they the current ones or be they ones in the future, is very, very low. They, these are all. No, 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 I'm, I'm asking what, what the byproduct of the cause and effect to, to, the, to the people, if there was an accident, a leak, if it were to get into their water stream, how would it affect the environment that ultimately could it have a negative health effect on the people? So that's a pretty straightforward question. And Lake says, in his opinion, there's no credit, in my opinion, there's no credible situation that could cause that. Now, a, a meteorite could come out of the sky and <laughs> blow something up, and yes, there could be. But the consequences of the nuclear biological aspect on the, pub, on the public is minuscule on all of these situations. Okay, you call it minuscule. But what is the health effect if somebody comes into contact or a community is, is exposed to this? radioactive material again lake refuses to uh, answer the question he just the, the biggest in my opinion the biggest consequence is going to be a psychological one as we saw from the accidents at three mile island or in fukushima do you see that reaction but he blew up laughing he couldn't contain the, it the biggest in my opinion the biggest consequence is going to be a psychological one as we saw from the accidents at three mile island or in fukushima uh, this is a straw man argument, but it's it's a her, it's an unbelievable betrayal that someone like that, which is a ter Lake Barrett is a terrorist. Anybody who knows anything about nuclear and the legacy of nuclear knows Lake Barrett is a terrorist. Uh, this is the mainstream media. This is ABC Australia, BBC Rupert Winfield Hayes, the biggest in BBC uh, United, United Kingdoms, CBS Seth Dorn, the biggest in America. Pretending they're in a fuel pool, which is what we're talking about, fuel. Pretending they're in a fuel pool at Fukushima Reactor 4. And you have Lake Barrett telling him people that it's completely benign and innocuous and harmless. Uh, the question Americans should first ask themselves is, why is every single nuclear power plant surrounded by farms, as far as you can see, when an uh, absurd amount of studies not only suggest, but scaringly point out that this is a nightmare scenario. Growing food alongside the nuclear power plants is literally the worst thing you could do, and yet all nuclear power plants, except for just a few, which are typically in cities, don't have that particular attribute. And the effects on the humans are devastating. Uh, just a very tiny fraction. For adults, 50 atoms, and you can put 200 million atoms on the head of a needle, but you can't see it. But 50 atoms on the head of a needle will cause irreversible lesions to their organs. So growing food alongside these disease factories, which are hemorrhaging radiation from the fuel pools, is just it's heartbreaking. The studies, the academics, clearly show it as absurd adverse side effects. But Lake Barrett, and that's my depiction I drew up last night for Lake Barrett, significantly, he's literally the worst human you could have as a witness. So now we're going to go through methodically, this might turn into a two-part video, but it's such an important video, such an unbelievable, unimaginably important video. And now I'd done a two-hour show 12 hours ago, but here I am, a sucker for punishment, back again. House Committee on Energy and Commerce, because the video is so important, they're going to op open statements. I'll let them... Uh, here we go. That'll take a second. I chopped the video, the first five minutes off. It maybe takes another minute. And what is stunning for me is the fact that they lie so, so, so easily. The Subcommittee on Energy, Climate, Grid Security, and Outcome to Order. Chair recognizes itself for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you guys for being here. Good morning and welcome to the Energy, Climate, Grid Security Subcommittee 
hearing titled American Nuclear Energy Expansion, Spent Fuel Policy, and Innovation. This Congress, the Energy and Commerce Committee, has taken a bipartisan approach to the advance and expanding nuclear energy here in the United States. I'm pleased we are holding this hearing to examine a critical piece of our nuclear energy industry here in the United States, and that's spent fuel. It's important for the subcommittee to examine the state of our spent fuel policy, given its role over nuclear regulatory policy and energy policy more broadly. Over 40 years ago, Congress formally established a comprehensive nuclear waste management strategy. In 1982, Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which created a federal government responsibility to dispose of all high-level radioactive waste and started a process for selecting sites. In 1987, after the Department of Energy conducted extensive studies of nine potential repository sites, Congress amended the Nuclear Policy Act to focus on Yucca Mountain and Nye County, Nevada as a site for permanent geologic repository. Unfortunately, the political objections of one state, not based on scientific reality, blocked the repository from being relicensed or being licensed rather, and constructed following its formal selection in 2002. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff found that Yucca Mountain Permanent Repository could safely store waste for over one million years. Uh, <laughs> it's quite the statement could store nuclear waste for over a million years. My apologies. Like I say, when I'll get the kinks out of this in a little tiny bit. This was a picture I drew up yesterday to try to help um, people that are interested in this topic visualize Fukushima. This really doesn't do it justice. There was 105,000 storage sites across Japan from the radioactive fallout just in, I'm sorry, just in Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, they picked up over 30 million one-ton bags by 2016. And, uh, like, you can mount in was judged on how much heat it can hold for 200 years because fuel is pretty hot, right? And it can only hold so much heat, obviously, right? There's a calculation, and they have way too much fuel in the United States. But the big problem with Yucca Mountain was it was a an active earthquake zone for many thousands of years, and that's known to reappear. And so recently, in the last several years, they've had significant earthquakes right within miles of Yucca Mountain. And that, I think, I do believe they knew this and they disregarded it, you know, how it was 20, 30 years ago compared to today, right? They, they ignored a lot. There was no descending voices. Same as today, there is no descending voices. Let's keep rolling. The Energy and Commerce Committee has remained committed to upholding the law. And in 2018, the House passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act by an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 340 to 72. Uh, they've been doing the same thing for 70-odd years. The 70 years, they come up with no solutions. They, they poured money at it. They throw money at it. And it appears to me that the reason that to anybody else that's honest, the, the reason that they're not coming up with a solution is on purpose. And the problem with nuclear waste is it's splitting atoms. So if you can try to comprehend how many atoms you have to split to boil a glass of water, the numbers are, are incomprehensible. Now, if you take the number of atoms you have to split to boil water to power a million homes and businesses, each minute and each day, the, the numbers are mind-boggling. It's more than all the stars in the solar system that we acknowledge by orders of magnitudes on top of that. And so once the fuel comes out of the reactor, it's still splitting those atoms. There's no longer any containment. The fuel pools are boiling off water. The water is saturated each liter the amount of atoms per liter that are anthropogenic are very dangerous, are very 
long term or astronomical. They're released into the ecosystem. And anything that falls close by is landing in prime farmland. That's very big producers. This stuff is shipped off to supermarkets where unsuspecting consumers are being hit with endless diseases and illnesses and autoimmune deficiencies and injuries. Because once it gets in your body, your body attacks it for the rest of your life. If this bill had become law, it would have incentivized the completion of the licensing of Yucca Mountain, enhanced host state benefits, and accelerated consolidated interim storage, a benefit to both ratepayers and taxpayers. Unfortunately, politics obstructed this bill and we remain in the current standstill. Ratepayers across the country have paid nearly $50 billion into the Nuclear Waste Fund to establish a permanent repository. And they steal from that constantly. And think about how much interest $50 billion grow every day, let alone every year. And they siphon around $20 billion of that for litigation with Yucca Mountain alone. It's a big well of money for them just to dip into whenever they feel like it because they're not planning on coming up with a solution. And so the interest is not going to be missed. $50 billion by now, the interest, which is from the ratepayers paying extra money under bills to deal with the nuclear waste, but they're, they're not planning on coming up with a solution. And if the minute they start tapping into that is the minute they can't start stealing it, continue to steal it the way they've been doing it. And they don't want a solution because they want to be able to have access to that and do whatever they want. So it's easy to throw millions of dollars here, millions of dollars there because of the interest that they're growing. Now these ratepayers, folks who benefited from nuclear energy, paid fees, which were baked into the utility bill for the construction of a permanent repository. With interest, ratepayers in my home state of South Carolina had contributed over $3 billion to the Nuclear Waste Fund. This is the third most of any state in the nation. Additionally, as a result of the government's failure to follow the law, American taxpayers are on the hook for up to $800 million annually out of the judgment fund. This breaks down to about $2 million per day. In addition to commercial waste, many DOE sites across the country like Savannah Riverside or Hanford store legacy or defense waste intended for permanent repository. And Hanford, that, that story is actually, they expect another $700 billion will go to Hanford. Hanford will be at least 300 years to clean it up. But the $700 billion they're talking about is not over 300 years. It's over the next 20 years or 30 years. And so they got 177 tanks with about 300,000 gallons in each tank buried in the ground, which they knew was a temporary solution, by the way, because of the fact that the sludge you're putting down there has gammas, alphas, neutrons, and betas, which means you're going to cause eventually a chain reaction that's going to burn a hole through the bottom of the barrels, the drums, these large drums, and that the material will run out into the soil, which is right alongside the Columbia River. It's 177 tanks at about 300,000 gallons per tank. But they actually dumped 1.4 million of those tanks into the soil on line trenches uphill from the Colombian River within close proximity and easily seen from the dump sites, which is equal to an aquarium five, uh, six feet wide, 518 feet tall, 518 feet tall. Wrapped around the entire planet more than once, was dumped into the soil. And downstream of the Columbia River, of course, is tens of thousands of farms. But there's spots on the Columbian River where years ago were measured at 70 sieverts per hour. So if you were idling by in a fishing boat, you would get a lethal dose. And by the time you got home that night or the next day or the day after, your organs had melted significantly enough for you to die with no way to connect it to that fishing trip. Now remember, at Fukushima, the first year, there was 865,000 cancers, but cancer is not the only illness or disease or autoimmune deficiency or injury or illness that manifests from radiation. You have compromised your immune system, right? 
So when Lake Barrett is suggesting that there was no adverse side effects on the psychological side effects, there was 13,646 children with thyroid tumors out of 38,000 when typically it was one in a million, which means it's 358,000 of a million when you scale it up. And a child's thyroid, the tumors were around two centimeters. When an adult thyroid is only three by five centimeters, a child's is much smaller. So these are very large tumors, which also means in order for that to happen, then the thyroids are saturated, would mean that the child is producing radioactive hormones for the rest of their life, which, which is the worst case scenario. And that in order to be that contaminated, then that means they're skeleton is completely contaminated and they're mutating their stem cells. So you have developing children and insects and birds, mammals and animals with those attributes is the quickest and easiest way to destroy the ecosystem. Which And let me touch on the poll that we got to help articulate nuclear. Is recycling nuclear fuel the most efficient way to indelibly, permanently, poison the air, the water, the animals, the insects, the humans, and the biosphere and the ecosystem, the oceans. It's unassailably yes. Now I'd like to emphasize that spent nuclear f fuel is stored safely on sites, but the federal government must fulfill its legal responsibility and reduce the cost burden to the taxpayer and the ratepayers. State uh, safely on site. What's going on here? I want to check. <clears throat> you can't store it safely on site. Well, ain't that interesting? They screwed over my sound? I've only been doing this for a decade. Let me check. One, two... Must have been me, my apologies. You can't safely store it on site because there's no containment. So the rate, the fuel is still splitting atoms into the environment. You know, I had 39 thumbs up last night when I went to bed on my last video. And two hours later, I had a look because I didn't fall asleep. Uh, I had 32 thumbs up. They took away seven thumbs up like they'd done the day before. They took six thumbs up in the first few hours. And I'm censored heavily on a subject that, uh, you know, is the most important subject in human history. Let's continue with this. You can't store nuclear fuel safe on site, and that's what he said, because it's there's no containment. It's hemorrhaging radiation because it's splitting atoms. Spent fuel, ecosystem. spent nuclear fuel in the United States also provides an opportunity to be an asset as we deploy advanced nuclear technologies. The technological landscape has shifted since the 1980s. And the technology is talking about small modular reactors, but they don't have any applications into the regulatory agency. So why would you put your eggs in that basket when geothermal could be up and running at less than half the price in one-tenth of the time? And companies like Oklo and Curio and Shine are aggressively pursuing reprocessing for the small modular reactors, and which is illegal, by the way, in America, except a couple of the national laboratories, same as Canada. Re reprocessing is the unbelievable polluting way to deal with nuclear fuel. And you're only going to reclaim a small fraction of the fuel. And recycling technologies for spent fuel. Spent fuel recycling, especially to support advanced fuels, provides exciting promise for the future of nuclear energy, now, he's reading a script, which is very telling, and he's, uh, he's a good reader, but he, doesn't, he didn't write that. Now, I'd like to emphasize that spent nuclear f fuel is stored safely on sites. Again, that's an absolute dishonest, disingenuous assertion, because you can't store nuclear waste safely because it's splitting atoms. And the amount of atoms we're talking about is the same amount you would use to boil water for a million people each day. Now there's no containment. 
it's out of the reactor core, no containment, it's in a fuel pool, and that those atoms are released in the form of vapor. And once it separates, that's why they have them install skinny stacks at a nuclear plant. Now you're going to poison everybody within a thousand miles of these facilities. In the United States, especially for the advanced reactors that we hear about, our policy should reflect innovations and advancements as part of an integrated fuel system that includes a permanent repository. No, your policy should be to phase out nuclear immediately because it's, it's a disease factory and to come up with other solutions like geothermal, like storage. There's endless ways to store energy now, particularly like in salt or in lava rocks, for instance, or in compressed air, you dig mine shafts and you compress your air down there. We actually have windmills, that's all you do is compress air. This technology is already acknowledged, but the minute that they start including that in the conversations, the minute everybody else will go like, wait, what, there's other technology? And so nobody else is allowed to exist because nuclear can't if something else does. But the federal government must fulfill its legal responsibility and reduce the cost burden to the taxpayer and the ratepayers. State uh, spent fuel, spent nuclear fuel in the United States also provides an opportunity to be an asset as we deploy advanced nuclear technologies. The technological landscape has shifted since the 1980s, and companies like Oklo and Curio and Shine are aggressively pursuing reprocessing and recycling technologies for spent fuel. Spent fuel recycling, especially to support advanced fuels, provides exciting promise for the future of nuclear energy. In uh, so the spent fuel they're talking about, by the way, is weapons grade. It's 15% or so. It's high, what they call a high assay, high low. And it's typically acquired from Russia, which produces it at the Mayak, which is a nuclear wasteland for thousands of miles. It's... And the, and the reason they're using this high assay, this high grade, military grade fuel, which is plutonium mixed oxide, which is the worst case scenario, I might add, because once you take it out of the reactor, it's splitting atoms into the environment are unbelievably catastrophic to everything with replicated In the United cells. States, especially for the advanced reactors that we hear about, our policy should reflect innovations and advancements as part of an integrated fuel system that includes a permanent repository. Well, look, you've been saying those songs and dances for how long? This is another picture I just put together yesterday or the day before. To help articulate how nutty this whole industry actually is, and this is like a nuclear power plant and... Uh, you got a, it's an incredibly energy demanding system, right? You need two large power plants to supply power to the power plant. Like, there's no other industry. Like, gas, oil, and coal works on their own power. They don't need external dedicated power to build it, to run it for its, its legacy, and then for another 50 years for the decommissioning. You don't need two external power supplies dedicated. Japan has picked up 30 million one-ton bags of radiation, which means just 30 million reasons not to even look at nuclear. It may seem we're at a standstill, but we should look at this as a moment of opportunity for the United States of America. The U.S. has always led the world in nuclear energy advancements. The Manhattan Project harnessed the energy of the nucleus atom, and the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 ushered in the age of the peaceful use of the atom, demonstrating American leadership around the world and the amazing benefits of nuclear power. See, I don't, even, I don't even think he read that that paper before. You got to deal with the nuclear waste for how many years? For a million years. Black bags are not going to do it. Trust me. We're on the precipice of the next frontier of nuclear energy here in the United States. Recently, the House overwhelmingly passed the Atomic Energy Advancement Act that Ranking Member Deget and I put together to advance durable bipartisan policy that will expand nuclear energy. Responsible and... But, like, they've only had two reactors come online in the last 35 years or so. 
this has been we've been down this road before where they throw whatever money they want at the nuclear industry the nuclear industry will just steal it 90 percent of it goes to administration it just gets gobbled up they've had every opportunity they got every university on the planet at their beck and call they got all the national laboratories at their beck and call they they got every resource imaginable like there's nothing they're short of and yet they can't get it together it's 50 years playing around with this alleged small modular reactors, and they're still no further ahead than they were 50 years ago. Effective spent fuel management is a critical part of the equation. It can help foster nuclear expansion here in the United States. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on the opportunities and challenges associated with spent nuclear fuel management in the context of nuclear energy expansion. I'll take my last 10 seconds. I've been to Yucca Mountain. I've stood on top of that mountain. I thought... Stood on the motherfucking mountain top. That's like, what kind of response is it to say he stood on the top of a mountain and that somehow quantifies his assertions? But if we can't put the, the nuclear waste of the nation here, we're not going to be able to put it anywhere. So if you don't put it, this is the most ludicrous assertion conceivable, is that if you don't put it at, New, at uh, Yucca Mountain, then it can't go anywhere? Well, Yucca Mountain is a known earthquake zone now. You have to find another solution. That's simple. It is what it is. You can't change it. And you and wouldn't be in this position if the industry was honest because he knew this 50 years ago that that was an unreliable place to put it. But saying that because he, he stood on Yucca Mountain, therefore he was knowledgeable, is one of the most ludicrous the most dishonest and disingenuous assertions conceivable. We're on the precipice of the next frontier. But we're, how, what are you talking about? We are not on the precipice. The precipice of the next frontier is geothermal. It's everywhere. The technology now exists to drill anywhere on the planet and tap into a thousand degree Fahrenheit temperatures. Of nuclear energy here in the United States. Recently, the House overwhelmingly passed the Atomic Energy Advancement Act that Ranking Member Deget and I put together to advance durable bipartisan policy that will expand nuclear energy. Responsible and effective spent fuel management is a critical part of the equation. It can help foster nuclear expansion here in the United States. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on the opportunities and challenges associated with spent nuclear fuel management in the context of nuclear energy expansion. I'll take my last 10 seconds. I've been to Yucca Mountain. I've stood on top of that mountain. I thought if we can't put the, the weight, nuclear waste of the nation here, we're not going to be able to put it anywhere. The repository was chosen for a reason. I've also been to Hanford. I've been to Savannah River site. understand the EM process going on there, the high-level legacy waste that's coming out of the tank farms, been vitrified or being vitrified and needs to be so he's talking about Hanford, where they're taking waste out of the tanks. The majority of the tanks are empty. It's just like this guy is a pump. Duncan is a pump for the nuclear industry. He he didn't write any of it. His job was to sit there like a, a media whore and sell whatever product or story was on their memo at that moment, right? ...be stored somewhere. That's waste that I don't think can be reprocessed as spent fuel. So we have legacy waste that needs to be stored. We have spent fuel that's an asset for the nation that can be reprocessed and used as a fuel. So I look forward to today's hearing from all of our witnesses. I'll now recognize the ranking member to get. Uh, so, see, we have fuel that needs to be reprocessed, which is illegal, by the way, in America except for at some of the national laboratories experimentally. And then we have waste that needs to be stored in geological repositories. And who, who's to really say, outside of the industry's apologist, that a deep geological repository is the only solution? If you put all your nuclear waste, high-level waste, the splitting atoms, in the same spot, at some point it's melting down. It doesn't matter if it's... 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, it's going to melt down. Not maybe, not perhaps, but it's going to melt down. Oh, 
me adjust that again here. It's going to melt down is the problem. Be stored somewhere. That's waste that I don't think can be reprocessed as spent fuel. So we have legacy waste that needs to be stored. We have spent fuel that's an asset for the nation that can be reprocessed and used as a fuel. So I look forward to today's hearing from all of our witnesses. I'll now recognize the ranking member to get for five minutes to give her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for having this hearing and for all the reasons you stated. It's a really important hearing for this committee to have as we continue to look towards nuclear energy to provide us with a carbon-free source. Again, you can't call nuclear carbon-free source. How can you call nuclear carbon-free source? Like every nuclear power plant should have at least that many people going around cleaning it up. Every nuclear power plant that is surrounded by farms, which is almost every one of them, nuclear dump and geological repositories, if you're surrounded by farms, you should be closed. You have no right to exist. They're the dirtiest because the fuel, once you put it in the pool, when you take your first fuel out of the reactor and put it in the pool, it's hemorrhaging radiation into the ecosystem. Because we have to find storage that does not abandon the communities that host nuclear reactors. But you don't need to put the fuel in a community. And this is how they avoid storing it is by trying to put it in a community or close to a community. The NIMBY are not in my backyardism. And then they use that as, oh, well, because people won't let us put it in their back garden. Well, Let's put it in your back garden, and your answer is going to be the same as theirs, right? Let's put it right by the Congress and Senate's buildings. They're going to fight you to the death not to, right? And so is the community, because that's how they avoid coming up with a solution. Is Then they'll have referendums. The community, they'll throw millions of dollars around the community, and then they'll, have, they'll divide the community. Then they'll have a referendum. The community will say no, and they say, oh, well we got to go somewhere else and start the whole process. It takes five or six years. To, uh, so they're so dishonest, they've lost track of the human experience. Because we have to find storage that does not abandon the communities that host nuclear reactors. Again, the community becomes, once you put nuclear power in a community, it becomes dependent upon nuclear Right? It becomes dependent upon nuclear taxes, uh, the nuclear, the people there spending money, using the gas stations, the restaurants, the coffee shops. The, the refueling brings in a thousand people because they don't want their own crews to get poisoned. They work at the plant permanently, and then that shows up under insurance later, right, 10, 20 years down the road. Nuclear fuel that has already been used in a reactor has been stored on site where it was once used to generate power, even if the reactor was decommissioned and is no longer uh, operating. Spent fuel is stored at 75 different sites in 33 different states across the country, including 23 sites that are no longer operating. The Biden administration has focused on pursuing a consent-based siting program under existing authorities. Right, so a consent base is where you have a referendum. And if you don't get it, well, we can't store it. So sad. We wanted to. We have the money. We can't do it because they won't let us. But you got entire quadrants of land where there's no, there's no conflict. You got the Northern Shield where you're deep bedrock. There's, there's no issues with earthquakes. There's no issues with water penetration, there's no issues. Uh, but again, you can't store it and just walk away. You can't store it, lock it down, and then walk away because at some point it melts down. It doesn't need oxygen. It consumes all the rocks, the steel, the rebar. It atomizes and aerosols that, by the way, and ionizes and radiates it. And eventually it just chews its way up into the surface. If it hits water along the way, Water expands significantly per liter, 1,800 cubic feet basically per liter, which will crack the earth open like we've seen at Fukushima. And the steam coming out of the ground there is at around 10 sievers per hour in six places from some of the reactor cores going to proverbial China syndrome deep into the earth. Not to China, obviously, but 
It's just meant as a connotation where the reactor cores burn at 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures and tunnel down to the earth. And some of it hit the water tables, the water exploded and uh, ruptured the earth in multiple places and that the steam perpetually coming out had made it so that at Fukushima they have to abandon the site many, many times because the whole site gets covered in these lethal doses of radioactive steam. What this would do is it would allow for the siting of spent nuclear fuel under consent-based siting consortia, which engages the states earlier in the process. Nuclear spent fuel policy in the United States is governed by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which called for a permanent waste repository to be set up in 1998. As the chairman said, the process is obviously not easy, or it would have already been solved, as we saw with the state of Nevada and, and uh, what happened with Yucca Mountain. And I, too, went to Yucca Mountain. And what, what I thought at the time was the same thing that the chairman thought, is this is pretty remote. But nonetheless, the testing that we needed to do there never finished. And the reason it didn't finish was because of the political winds on both sides in Washington. And I think that's a shame. But be that as it may, I think that the Biden administration is smart to, to, to seek a consent-based siting program. The price tag for storing spent... And the consent base is where you're never going to get consent. You don't need, you don't need to store nuclear waste in a community. Like these are disease factories. That's the only way to describe nuclear, right? I asked AI to to draw me a picture of a nuclear meltdown. This is what it gave me. So even artificial intelligence is not to be deceived. Uh, you know, I, I, you want to come up with robots, you're going to need nuclear power robots for thousands of years after all the species are exterminated, including us, to continue to clean up these sites. That fuel has been increasing for the Department of Energy and the Government Accountability Office estimates the DOE may have up to $60 billion in liabilities for storing spent fuel by 2030. So $60 billion in liabilities by 2030? And as the cost liabilities increase, court decisions have prohibited DOE from collecting their fee of 0.001 per kilowatt hour of electricity generated from nuclear power. So that's equal to about $750 million annually, which was previously used to fill the nuclear waste fund, and that was designed to pay for the expenses of storing this spent fuel. So other nations, including France and India, process, uh, reprocess their spent fuel. She, she has never read what she's reading there right now. And I've actually been to the plant in France as well. That's a and she's talking about La Hague in France? And that is outrageous that she would even say something like that. What the hell was she doing in France? Seriously. It has 500 security guards. That's how insane that disease factory... And that the studies of the La Hague in France reprocessing facility are showing that between France's reprocessing facilities and United Kingdom's Sellafield and Donneray's reprocessing facilities have contaminated entire Arctic with radioactive fallout and by proxy, obviously, Europe. A process in which 96% of the spent fuel can be recycled to make fresh fuel for nuclear reactors. Again, that's simply not true. It's, it's just a very tiny fraction of uranium and plutonium. They're not, they're not reclaiming everything else. It severely lowers the amount of spent fuel that has to be stored in a... It doesn't severely lower the amount. It's just a fraction. And then a lot of it is hemorrhaged into the environment and has contaminated all of Europe and the Arctic and certainly the ocean. Repository. But it's expensive to reprocess spent fuel. But again, the cost of doing nothing is also high if we leave the spent fuel stored on site, even if the plant was decommissioned. In 2020, President Trump withdrew his support from Yucca Mountain, and he didn't request funding for the repository in fiscal year 2021. 
Ten years earlier, in 2010, President Obama established the Blue Ribbon Commission on New America's Nuclear Future to examine alternatives to Yucca Mountain. The report re recommended that the federal government create these new consent-based siting processes for future interim and permanent storage repositories. In April 2023, the Biden administration moved forward with this approach and issued the final guidelines. And the spending bill that we passed just last month had $55 million to fund DOE's consent-based siting facilities activities. So whatever we do, we have to figure this out if we're going to have more nuclear reactors. I look forward to this hearing. I look forward to our uh, debate. And with that, I would like to recognize Congressman Peters uh, to, uh, to yield him my remaining minute. He knows about community engagement regarding reactors, uh, but he wants to introduce his witness from his home state of California involved in these issues. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. It's my pleasure to introduce Dan Stetson, who serves as chairman of the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station Community Engagement Panel. Uh, the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, or SONGS, is just north of my district in San Diego and is a, presents a serious issue for my constituents and those of uh, Southern California. Dan's worked with the panel for over 10 years and has been on the front lines of developing solutions to spent nuclear fuel issues. Before his work on songs, Dan served as president and CEO of the Ocean Institute for nearly 11 years, where he helped provide marine science and maritime history programs for over 100,000 students annually. He has a BA in English from the University of California, Santa Barbara, an MBA from Cal State University, Fullerton, and is a veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard. Dan and the panel do a lot of great work for my district and the surrounding region. We're proud to have him represent San Diego while discussing this important topic. Uh, thank you again for yielding, and thanks for joining us today to the witnesses. Thank you. Gentlelady, time time's expired, and um, I now recognize the chair of the full committee, Chair Rogers, for five minutes for our opening statement. Okay, so now we're going to start getting to the witnesses. Let me see here. Just bear with me one second. That's the future. The only humans left on the planet will be in these suits working to try to clean up the nuclear legacy because all the other species will be gone, and they'll basically have to go back deep underground to hide away from the radiation when they're not working, trying to clean up the legacy of nuclear industries. So the witnesses are handpicked, no pieces already, with, for decades for the nuclear industry. It's, it's quite interesting to see that... Um, it's controlled opposition. The, the people that are supposed to be in charge of uh, helping their country flush out what's going on are bought and paid for by the industry. Nuclear energy technologies are essential for our national security and a cleaner and more secure energy future. Like, what are you talking about? Nuclear energy is important for securing your security. Like if it's energy security, then geothermal and renewables. Like last year, there was 1.7 gigawatts of nuclear lost. They didn't gain anything. There was 507 gigawatts, which was almost 700 large nuclear power plants worth of renewables, came online in just 12 months. Nuclear is the best way to destroy your country. It's the quickest way not to come up with no solutions. And it's the best way to dig a hole you can't climb out of. It's exciting to see how the promise of innovative nuclear technologies can help support the energy demands of a growing economy for industry, for manufacturing, and for the American people. Right. And she's reading something she never read before herself. The future of nuclear is no insects, no birds, no mammals, no animals, nothing safe to drink, nothing safe to breathe. This Congress has been encouraging to see a renewed bipartisan focus on restoring American technological leadership in nuclear energy. And but there's, there is no technological leadership in nuclear. Right? Post Three Mile Island, they... they they uh, had a th 100 nuclear power plants that were scrapped. 
that they had to spend enormous amounts of money building sirens, and some of these plants have 140 sirens within 10 miles of them. Right? This was a concession rather than close all nuclear down like they should have, because Three Mile Island, you know, we got the media and academic studies after Three Mile Island, thanks to people like Lake Barrett, um, coming out and saying that, yeah, two million people got irradiated from anthropogenic man-made radiation, but it was equal to watching color television for an extra year. And so conflating color televisions with nuclear fallout, these people are still alive. They should be arrested and prosecuted. These are the worst crimes you can imagine. You poisoned, permanently harmed and destroyed two million people, but any of their offsprings, any of their children and grandchildren would have debilitating illnesses and diseases and autoimmune deficiencies and injuries. These are simply genocide machines, and she's reading a script like the rest of them that she's never read. It's unbelievable. This Congress has been encouraging to see a renewed bipartisan focus on restoring American technological leadership in nuclear energy. Energy and commerce has a rich history of leading on these issues. Our work this Congress has been no exception. We've advanced solutions to lay the foundation for a more robust and innovative nuclear industry with strong bipartisan House votes that underscore the wide support for these policies. This includes legislation that will support the production of the innovative advanced fuels needed for new types of nuclear reactors currently under development. So, uh, but you don't have any applications into the regulatory agencies, right? You know, you're spending, and she just told you there, like everybody else has told you, they're spending billions on development, but they're spending nothing on solutions for, like, geothermal. It's just, it's everywhere. You can dig, every community can dig down, get geothermal, and power their community for a fraction of any other source. And so what she's saying is, and all of them are doing the same thing, we're just saying the only solution is nuclear. Nothing else exists. It's only nuclear, and nuclear is clean, green, too cheap to meet, or that same song and dance for 80 years. And they're the people that are in charge. They're the ones who are going to make the decisions. They're the ones who can allocate the monetary. They're literally the worst people conceivable for the job. There's no intentions of actually coming up with solutions. And every intention of destroying everybody's future so they can have uh, a suitcase of money that's untraceable, right? This is your future because of nuclear. This, you got to hope this shows up and resolves your problem because they're not going to. Our work has also included measures to make sure Russia will not be able to undermine our supply chain by seeking to bolster our domestic fuel manufacturing. No, you're completely dependent upon Russia because of your incompetence in the nuclear industry. And you're talking about getting a chain of high SA fuel, high grade military fuel for small modular reactors that don't exist. You've got tons of time to resolve that. But the reality of it is you don't need it. You have geothermal. You have wind and solar. That is phenomenal. Come on. Like last year, it was 507 gigawatts worldwide versus nuclear went backwards 1.7 gigawatts. And that over the next two years, 25% of all nuclear reactors are going to go offline. And so all of this posturing is just helping your country fall apart. That's what you're doing. You're destroying your country by being a useful idiot for this industry. That bill, H.R. 1042, the Prohibiting Russian Uranium Imports Act, passed the House by a unanimous vote, and I'm hopeful that we will get it signed into law soon. Yeah, but it's not a law. And you don't need it. You've got nothing to use it on. You've got nothing, no nuclear reactors to use the fuel on, but you're burning all these resources, time, energy, monetary, on something that you still don't even have an application into the regulatory agencies for. And the whole process is 25 to 30 years down the road. But your problem is right now. 
You're helping nuclear rob the essence of your country and the youth of your country. You're destroying every facet and everything good about your country for an industry that hates you, the insects, the birds, the mammals, the animals, and the air and the water. Our agenda has also included the Atomic Energy Advancement Act, led by Chair Duncan and Ranking Member DeGette, that will provide the most consequential... So the chair is the guy who's promoting nuclear. It has the most to gain from it. And he's there to try to come up with a solution. And his only solution, of course, can only be nuclear. It's unbelievable. ...reforms to nuclear regulation in decades. And with the continued partnership with the Senate, many of those policies should soon be on their way to enactment. Today... She actually smiled. ...we turn to examining spent <laughs> nuclear fuel policy. By all accounts, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which governs both spent nuclear fuel and high-level nuclear waste generally, is long overdue to be implemented to address the needs of today's industry. The program has been stalled for over a decade as a direct result of actions by opponents to Yucca Mountain to the Yucca Mountain project. No, this was because of Fukushima. That's why it's been delayed over a decade cuz Fukushima had showed us the flaws, the incredible flaws of the nuclear industry. The, de the designated storage facility for spent nuclear fuel. These un Listen, you've got 70 years plus of nuclear fuel. You've never come, you never try to come up with a solution. The, the whole industry has, has celebrated the fact they haven't come up with a solution by trying to get consent-based solutions in communities where it should never exist in the first place, rather than a thousand miles away from humanity, from cities and that, and then have a reasonable, like, they can, they can come up with a solution 500 times a year, but they refuse to acknowledge that solutions exist. And so they always try to put it in someone's back garden and let them fight about it, let that be the narrative, rather than actually come up with solutions. This is not an accident. This is the best way to poison the biosphere. The, de the designated storage facility for spent nuclear fuel. These unfortunate actions have undermined the law and poisoned public trust in how we manage spent nuclear fuel for far too long and have jeopardized efforts to manage defense obligations for things like Navy fuels and cleanup of legacy Cold War sites like the Hanford site just outside of my district in eastern Washington. As we will hear in town... And Hanford has 41 miles of unlined trenches. 41 miles of unlined trenches. 41 miles, like, we're talking, these are dirty bombs by the kilogram. Testimony this morning, this opposition is not safety related or technical. It's political. Opposition from states like Nevada in particular. No, they are technical. They are not political. It's completely dishonest to suggest that is political, not, and which is one of the oldest arguments we've we've been listening to for a very long time. It's not it's not a legitimate argument. They don't have the technology, or they would have implemented it. They don't store it everywhere because they have the technology, and they just don't want to use it because of a political. What a terrible person. Testimony this morning. This opposition is not safety related or technical. It's political. Op Again, this is unbelievably dishonest. Opposition from states like Nevada in particular to this program has inhibited congressional appropriations and driven the executive branch to dismantle what has otherwise been a, su a technically successful program. This program, if allowed to move forward, would provide the public information that's critical to earning people's support and trust for nuclear energy. This Again, she smiles. Unbelievable. This committee took steps in 2018 to get the licensing program for Yucca Mountain back on track with a reform package that culminated in a very strong bipartisan House vote. While those efforts ultimately failed in the Senate, they proved that it is possible to build bipartisan support for a durable spent fuel program, which is what brings us here today. 
My goodness. The reason they're not using Yucca Mountain is because Yucca Mountain is in an earthquake zone. To secure American nuclear leadership, we must continue this committee's work to update the law and build state support for a permanent repository at Yucca Mountain. Our conversation this morning will also highlight the prospects of a growing fleet of nuclear reactors and how, by utilizing innovative technologies, we can improve the management of spent nuclear fuel in the U.S. Oh, she forgot to smile that time. Innovative companies like Curio and Oklo are already developing innovative technologies. They don't have any applications into the regulatory agency. They, like, they don't clean up their own mess. They got, they're hoping somewhere in the future that robots will show up and resolve what they're creating. And, and, and like we've covered the companies that she can barely pronounce multiple times already. That and will sure. enhance the use of energy from spent fuels. We should be building... Now again, she's talking about mixed oxide fuel, which is illegal in the United States. She's reading a script that she's never even browsed before. ...on this work to ensure America's dominance for the next century. By embracing American technology and innovation, we can ensure nuclear energy benefits communities across the country and around the world. Look at a weasel back in the background there. American leadership matters. Failure to lead will result in the international civilian nuclear markets being dominated by our adversaries, like China and Russia, which undermines our energy security and nuclear safety. Oh my God. Again, like, what's wrong with this lady? That she would take a job like that, in all honesty, what's... You kind of lose faith in humanity when you see people like her. These goals should be bipartisan, and I look forward to discussing how this committee can help ensure the U.S. wins the future and restores nuclear leadership. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. I yield back. <sighs> well, uh, most of these got a five minute, and some of them you'll notice... What you'll notice is uh, they'll, they'll talk for four and a half minutes and then they'll ask the witness if we ever get to it for their reply. And the witness literally got to go, blah, 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 and then it's too late because they got to yield back the two seconds that are left. Generally, yields back. We'd be remiss if we didn't recognize the work that our former colleague John Shimkus did on this particular issue. And I appreciate the work. I'll now recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's been now nearly 70 years since the emergence of civilian nuclear energy in the U.S., and yet we still have not found a workable solution to address the storage and disposition of spent nuclear fuel. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act set a goal of setting up a permanent repository to accept spent fuel by no later than 1998, but 26 years later, we're no closer to finding a solution to the problem. And that's unfortunate because the magnitude of the problem only continues to increase. American nuclear reactors have created nearly 90,000 metric tons of spent fuel that must be stored. And right now this fuel is being stored on site at nuclear facilities across the nation where it was once used to generate power. It's even at locations that no longer have an operating nuclear reactor like the Oyster Creek site not far from my district in New Jersey. And the lack of progress on spent fuel is particularly difficult for these communities since they cannot complete decommissioning or start redevelopment of a former reactor site until the fuel can be relocated. And the federal government has a responsibility and an obligation to the more than 70 communities that currently are home to spent fuel throughout the nation. It's critical that we find a solution that does not abandon these communities and that does not continue to come, up, come at a steep price to American taxpayers. The Government Accountability Office projects that uh, taxpayer liability relating to spent fuel will exceed $60 billion by 2030. And we have a duty both to the nuclear communities and to all taxpayers to find a solution that allows us to move the spent fuel as soon as we can. 
This committee has a history of bipartisan work on this issue. 2018, we worked together to find a bipartisan path forward by passing the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act, led by former committee members John Shimkus, as was mentioned, and Jerry McNerney. Building on that progress, I hope we can develop new bipartisan solutions, uh, solutions to this long, intractable issue. Now, the Biden administration has recognized the urgent need for action as, and has responded to the call. It has continued building towards a consent-based interim storage siting process. And just last year, the Department of Energy made $26 million worth of awards to a dozen different consortia to explore a community and consent-based approach to siting facilities to store and dispose of spent fuel. These efforts will help us find a path forward that is legally and politically durable, just what communities across this nation need. And I believe that Congress must support the Biden administration's efforts here. It's a small step forward, but it represents the most concrete progress towards the solution for spent fuel that we've made in the last 15 years. And while most of the debate recently has focused on what to do with existing spent fuel, as we move to more advanced reactors that demand advanced higher enriched fuels, the spent fuel issue will change. While some advanced reactor designs tout innovative ways to limit the amount of spent fuel that they produce, we still must take these technologies into account as we develop solutions to responsibly store this material in the decades to come. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how we can find a durable pathway forward that works for communities, ratepayers, and all Americans. And I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to Representative Matsui. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pallone, and I want to thank you, Chairman Duncan, for organizing this important hearing, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. This is an important matter that affects many of us in our districts that have had nuclear plants or nuclear plants have been decommissioned. Now, the federal government has a duty to manage nuclear waste. They should not be and cannot be the burden of communities to deal with it on their own. In my district, the Rancho Seco nuclear power plant shut down in 1989. But 30 years later, our utility, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, is still storing the spent fuel. So there's really nothing they can do with the land over there and anything, any redevelopment or anything. To make matters worse... You wouldn't want to reuse the land because it's permanently contaminated. Like 90% of the site is contaminated and has to be put into a repository if they ever come up with one, right? The whole community is contaminated permanently because the fuel is stored on site is still splitting atoms into the ecosystem, into the environment. And these communities, you'll see explosions of Alzheimer's and dementia and autism and diabetes and Down syndrome, heart problems, liver problems, lung problems, respiratory, pituitary. If, like, they talk about cancer, but they refuse to acknowledge this, this destroys your immune systems and leaves you more susceptible to pathogens and viruses that were normally harmless and innocuous. So, in every scenario where I asked the artificial intelligence to make me a picture of nuclear waste, it gave me stuff like that or stuff like this where you're going to need endless robots to try to clean it up it was it's unbelievable really and every time you mention the word fukushima these are the pictures you get endless one ton bags and then no humans typically but robots how come Artificial intelligence is thinking that way. Mud has had to sue the U.S. government every single year to recover the millions of dollars it costs to safely store this waste. This Again, you're not safely storing it. The waste is splitting atoms into the ecosystem. What are you talking about safely storing it? But this is not very difficult science. The, the fuel is dangerous because it's splitting atoms. It's splitting so many atoms that it's a liability for 8 million species in the future of humanity. Mud has had to sue the U.S. government every single year to be a policy failure. 
And I really believe there's enough concerns on this committee, as you're going to be hearing, that we have to do something about it. If we're going to make any progress on nuclear power itself, we have to deal with some of these past issues. So I encourage all my colleagues here to work with us to find a path forward. Now, I'll be submitting a statement into the record from the Sacramento Municipal Utility District detailing the costs of storing spent fuel in our district, and this is probably like every other district. And it has brought all of us together in a very bipartisan way. So I think that we're, he we're here to work. Now, I want to thank you very much, and I want to thank the um, ranking member. I yield back to the ranking member. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman's time's expired. Um, We'll now conclude the members' opening statements. Chair, I'd like to remind members that pursuant to the committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. And it should be a criminal record, shouldn't it? Shouldn't, shouldn't these people that are leaving it for an imaginary future to clean up and an ecosystem that is completely contaminated the cubic, every cubic meter of air on this planet is saturated with anthropogenic man-made radiation. Let me give you an example, actually. Because having a conversation doesn't seem to do it justice. After Fukushima, and every nuclear power plant creates these same plumes, this plume is based on venting from Fukushima. This is France's model. It's based on a million to 10 million atoms of cesium-137 per, per cubic meter of air over 30 days. So when the model stops, you're at 30 days. The entire biosphere from the bottom of the ocean to the upper troposphere is saturated with a million to 10 million atoms of cesium-137. So you can't just have cesium-137 gamma. But by the way, the cesium-137 pulses energy 600 feet every second. So you're talking about every species, all the fungus, the bacteria, everything, is getting full body x-rays for millions of years from anthropogenic sources. And that... Uh, the, the human body, the ants, the birds, the mammals, the insects, the, the biota, the bacteria, the fungus, it's based upon stardust. And uh, we call man-made radiation, man-made anthropogenic radiation, because it's not created by the sun. It's not from the solar system. And there's nothing on the planet with replicating cells that has not only been triggered to defend against it. And so when you see a plume like that, you need to multiply that by a thousand every day because there's a thousand fuel pools splitting the atoms every 24 hours into the environment that over two or three weeks are going to create a plume like that. But it's a continuous plume. Think of like think of a radiation emissions from a fuel pool as a snowstorm. And think of this picture as a snowstorm. And now the snow never melts, the snow never goes away, the snow never stops coming out, and after 30 days the entire planet is a snowstorm, but instead of a, something you can visually see, it's something invisible that's pulsing energy almost at the speed of light every second, long past the human experience on this only little dot we have in the solar system to survive on. We got a single industry has compromised the integrity of the biosphere, and it's helped by the people that you turn to to control that monster. Are the very people that is allowing it to eradicate us and the eight eight million species and oxygen, and it's destroying the water. What's your most precious resource? Water. And nothing can survive without water. Water is literally your gods. Without water, you, there is no god. Because you can't exist. Without water, we look like the moon. And we're not going to protect that. And we're going to let these greedy weirdos in positions of authority Steal that from you? Snatch that from every future generation? Withhold that from the insects, the birds, the mammals, the animals by contaminating with anthropogenic man radiation that nothing on the planet has the ability to defend against? 
There's nothing wrong with that. Excuse the language, but like I'm I'm literally here in shock and horror as I listen to these. We're coming pictures. with open minds to no, hear from the witnesses and learn as much as we can as policymakers on this issue. Your prejudice uh, throughout the whole narrative is clear that you're not there with an open mind. You. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today and taking time to testify before the subcommittee. Each witness will have the opportunity to give an opening statement, and then we'll follow that with a round of questions from each of the members. So our witnesses today are Dr. John Wagner, Laboratory Director of Idaho National Lab, Mr. Lake Barrett, former Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Civilian Waste at the Department of Energy, Mr. Daniel Stetson, Chairman of the San Onofre um, Nuclear Generating Station Community Engagement Panel, and Mr. Greg White, Executive Director of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. So we appreciate you being here today. I now recognize Dr. Wagner for five minutes to give an opening statement. And let me just say, the light's in front of you. I'm giving you five minutes. Uh, try to adhere to that. Lights will go from green to yellow to red. At red, it's time to wrap up. And if you can wrap up um, and then add during the members questioning whatever, if you had anything pertinent to add there at the end. But let's try to stay on time. We've got a lot of, uh, of Congress people here to uh, ask questions, a lot of witnesses. Dr. Wagner, five minutes. First, I have to see if this is actually working. Is it working? Right, from the National Laboratories, now we've covered these laboratories, and we've covered him. And uh, these are not people that should be there as witnesses. They're, they're the criminals that should be in the jails as an incentive for other directors not to be that evil. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Rogers, uh, Ranking Member Pallone, Subcommittee Chair Duncan, and Ranking Member Degat, and members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. My name is John Wagner. I am the Laboratory Director at the Idaho National Laboratory, the nation's center for nuclear energy research and development. Throughout my career, I've been directly involved in technical issues related to the nuclear fuel cycle, which we're talking about today. In fact, my first position following graduate school was with a private company designing and licensing spent fuel storage and transportation systems that are deployed around the world today. So I very much have a lot of interest in this topic. Let me start, though, by noting that as we speak, our nation's nuclear reactor fleet is excelling. It generates the nation's most reliable. Like, there's it's simply not acceler accelerating. Their, their nuclear fleet is falling apart. It's all, it's fragile, and it's brittle from decades and decades and decades of neutron bombardments. We're coming with open minds to hear from the witnesses and learn as much as we can. The one before us. I screwed up today. New reactors online in Georgia recently and several next generation nuclear demonstration projects progressing through collaboration between industry. It took them over 30 years to get those reactors online, right? It'll take them 30 million years to clean up the mess and the national laboratories, new and innovative nuclear technologies are positioned to play an increasingly important role in America's energy future. Through both legislative and technical efforts, the U.S. is on the cusp of achievements that could usher in a new era of nuclear energy and reestablish U.S. global leadership. And so it's no longer a matter of whether we need advanced nuclear technologies, but rather how much nuclear power we need and how do we enable its success. Again, geothermal, anything nuclear can do, particularly small modular reactors, geothermal can do 10 times quicker at less than a third of the price, the current prices that they're spending on. The future is everybody will be working to clean up radiation if there's anybody left. Yet, despite these dramatic changes, our approach to managing the nation's spent nuclear fuel is guided by policies developed decades ago, in a different time and during very different circumstances. These policies no doubt reflected the national priorities and concerns of the time, but today the questions that we must ask are whether those policies continue to reflect our priorities, and if they enable or impede the development and deployment of advanced nuclear technologies that our nation needs. 
At the center of this discussion is the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. Various attempts, including from this committee, have been made to amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, but none has yet succeeded. A new, a new waste policy framework is needed to move beyond the current nuclear waste management and disposition stalemate. This is not only an issue for the nuclear industry, but also for U.S. taxpayers. Another spent fuel policy issue is recycling. Even though it is no longer prohibited, no commercial nuclear fuel recycling occurs in the United States because the once through fuel cycle is considered the cheaper option. And the new for, first off, as far as I know, it's not legal. It's, it's legal at a couple of, like Los Alamos National Laboratory where he's from. And, and there's a, the Savannah River site was try, tried to build a mixed oxide fuel facility, right? And they just, they couldn't do it for starters, and they stole the money. They did buy a lot of equipment that they ended up giving away later because it never even got used. And they had all the money necessary. They had everything you can give them to do it. They had the authority, they had the entire government, federal government, to back them up. They still couldn't do it. And so when he's, when he's talking about the, the mixed oxide plutonium fuel as a necessity, they don't have reactors to put that in. Any reactors that they want to put it in, they're going to have to modify significantly. They're wasting all this unbelievable time and money and energy and academics and universities and, and, and meetings and everything on a technology that has no right to exist in the first place because it's such a, a despicable pollutant, but he's, he's the one who's going to gain from it. I mean, Lake, Lake Barrett, why is that person allowed in the building? It doesn't make any sense that he's even in the Nuclear that Waste Policy Act provides no financial incentives or mechanisms uh, to support recycling. It's worth noting that the U.S. originally did intend to recycle. Recycling was envisioned at the time as the prudent and sustainable option. For geopolitical and... No, it was because you wanted to make breeder reactors to produce plutonium from bombs. The, the only reason they want to reprocessing in the first place is for weapons. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act provides no financial incentives or mechanisms uh, to support recycling. But there's no part of the nuclear industry that has those particular attributes, let alone the recycling. It's worth noting that the U.S. originally did intend to recycle. Recycling was envisioned at the time as the prudent and sustainable option. For geopolitical and By security reasons, the U.S. terminated the commercial recycling program in 1976 believing that such actions would persuade other nations to follow suit. That did not happen. Instead, countries like France... Oh, yeah, like they had an honorable reason. No, they just didn't have the technology. 1976. Russia and China have moved forward with their recycling programs, creating a competitive disadvantage for the United States. The problem with... One of the big problems with recyclable... recycling nuclear is the emissions from the uh, reprocessing sites is catastrophic. You know, what they used to do was they used to pump the emissions down into the earth, but it contaminated the water tables for thousands of miles so bad they stopped doing it. You can't put it in a container. You can't contain it. You can't filter it. And so what you end up doing is you pollute the biosphere for millions of years. With this background in mind, there are several questions I believe this committee should be asking, such as, should we update our nuclear waste management policies to reflect the realities of today and the needs of tomorrow? Listen, you haven't even come up with a solution for nuclear waste anywhere on the entire planet, outside of this hyperbia to build, to dig a big hole in the ground and put your nuclear waste down there and everything was going to be wonderful and let the next generation perish because you got away with it. What role should nuclear fuel recycling play in the United States? And how do we balance spent fuel management and disposition with the need to develop and deploy new... And you know what the word disposition is? It's radioactive fallout. It's right. That's their way of not saying that the fuel is hemorrhaging isotopes into the ecosystem. 
nuclear reactors now. Answering these questions and addressing our nuclear waste management obligations would boost public confidence in nuclear energy and offer certainty to plant operators, utilities, energy investors, and the communities where stent fuel is, is <laughs> currently stored. In closing, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this process, and I want to thank the committee for their work on nuclear energy and for their attention to this important issue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Uh, Mr. Barrett, you're recognized for five minutes. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, Chairman Duncan, Ranking Manager Jet, uh, and uh, another committee chairman here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Our generation and the one before us created nuclear reactors for our national security and energy needs, and we are going to need more clean energy in the future, as has been clearly stated. We are the beneficiaries of this technology, and ethically we have a responsibility to dispose of our waste so as not to burden our children and successive generations unfairly. This is Lake Barrett, by the way. Lake is one of the most criminally insane people you'll ever see in the nuclear industry. His entire history is predicated upon poisoning you. Nuclear reactors now. Answering these questions and addressing our nuclear waste management obligations would boost public confidence in nuclear energy. Many benefits for them. Sorry. And this hurts us when we try to market American products and know-how overseas. I cut that off right there for a second. Historically, after a decade of intense discussion, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 laid out a program for how DOE was to build a geological disposal system to support our critical defense and commercial nuclear programs. Although challenging, we made initial good scientific and regulatory progress with the Yucca Mountain Repository site, and we would have had an operating facility about now if we had not been stopped. However, starting in 2010, the host state of Nevada... Well, they were stopped because... It's an earthquake zone. It can only hold so much heat for 200 years. And they were trying to supplement it by using air conditioners. Try wrapping your mind around that statement. Ada was able to politically stop all progress on Yucca Mountain by stopping funding. Did they spend $20 billion in litigation? Yucca Mountain just simply wasn't proper. So move on. So they're trying to blame everything on something that was the problem in the first place. And the reason it was litigation, because smart people understood that this was a big mistake and fought them in court. So the Yucca Mountain disposal option, although the law, is indefinitely politically blocked now. Sa so why are we talking about it over and over and over? So the Yucca Mountain disposal option, although the law, is indefinitely politically blocked now. Sadly, we have no workable spent fuel disposal program in this country now. Reactors need to operate, so our spent fuel management plan has devolved, sadly, to installing thousands of spent fuel canisters on our lakes and seashores and rivers. On our lakes and seashores and rivers. Well, ain't, like, that's such a, an important facet of the truth. And it's not thousands of canisters because the majority of it is in fuel pools that are boiling off about 120,000 liters each, each day, into the environment, into the biosphere, and into the farms they're surrounded by. And so just their existence on the lakes, the rivers, your fresh water, and the seas, and like the Great Lakes are populated heavily by nuclear waste and nuclear power plants. So you essentially contaminated the biggest aquifers in North America now already. What a, what a deceitful, dishonest, disingenuous creature this guy actually is. Although temporarily safe, they serve no useful societal purpose. They're not temporarily safe because the fuel pools are hemorrhaging radiation into the ecosystem. If you have a if you have an accident there, you lose the water, you can't put it back in, they'll melt down within 50 minutes. Although temporarily safe, they serve no useful societal purpose other than compensating for federal inability to perform and are blocking the reuse of our shutdown reactor sites. There is always talk about doing something someday, but really right now, our plan is to give it to the grandchildren and let them figure out what to do 
and wishing them good luck. You're not even doing that. This is Lake Barrett. This is the guy who hit Three Mile Island, who went to Fukushima. Here, wait a second. Let me play a clip of Lake Barrett, who was the, um, an advisor to TEPCO and the Japanese government after Fukushima hit. Let me see if I can find it. Very telling. It's unbelievable. They're really like a snake in, in the grass. We're almost there. Lake Barrett, Fukushima. For the first time, potentially fatal levels of radiation have been discovered outside the crippled nuclear plant, raising concerns. So for the first time, this is right within two days, fatal, lethal levels of radiation are outside the site. Don't forget that. The contamination is working its way further into Japan's water and food supplies and foreshadowing. Right, has, has already been reported in the food and the water supplies. Lake's job is to now to spin that. Shadowing a long and expensive cleanup. Nuclear engineer Lake Barrett knows what it takes to mop up a catastrophic mess like this. Lake led the initial response to the Three Mile Island accident here in the United States. He's with us this morning from Washington Lake. Where are the major concerns? Well, the iodine-131 that you hear about, uh, that has an eight-day half-life, so that decays away fairly quickly. I think they should be fine from a health point of view. Lake so why would you mention iodine-131? and multiple nuclear meltdowns, because it decays away pretty quickly. We're beginning to hear more about plutonium. What's the significance of plutonium in this situation? Plutonium is something that is more emotional than it is uh, technical in this situation. The reactors are running on pure uranium and plutonium. They melt it down. If iodine-131 is in the environment, the plutonium is out there too. And the biggest byproduct of the radiated fuel rods is the curium isotopes. And curium isotopes, you need lead shielding 20 times thicker than you do for plutonium. I think the biggest concern people have is the cesium and the strontium. Now, the biggest concern that you have perpetrated for 70 years upon the population, but that's not the real concern, is curium, which is the biggest byproduct. Uh, and the iodine is short. Don't get me wrong, like, they're real problems. Cesium and strontium-90 are definitely real problems. Paul, uh, yes, there is some plutonium. Uh, there was some plutonium. In there, there's always plutonium in reactor fuel. So There's always plutonium, but it's all psychological, right? Well, it makes more emotional news to talk about plutonium. Emotional, psychological. All right, let's talk about... So it's going to be decades and many billions of dollars to clean it up, but it's just a large um, uh, industrial catastrophe. In like, it's not an industrial catastrophe. It's a nuclear meltdown. And Chernobyl, which is only one one hundred of a Chernobyl re or a Fukushima reactor, because it was graphite, whereas Fukushima pure uranium, pure plutonium. They closed nine thousand four hundred farms in Ireland, Scotland, and United Kingdom, three thousand kilometers away from Chernobyl, after Chernobyl. And Chernobyl is basically a paper towel compared to Fukushima, and Chernobyl is, is brutal. It's brutal. You go look up the presentations I've done on this site here on Chernobyl. It's unbelievable. Internally to the plant, it's not a health catastrophe for the country. So Lake Barrett's saying it's not a health catastrophe for the country. It's not, it's, it's, uh, people like that shouldn't be allowed to be public. Like, there's a study came out in 2019 at 14.2% of neonates and infants in Japan, the entire country, needed per 100,000 need open-heart surgery. That's 14,200 children per 100,000 that need open-heart surgery. These numbers are, are the most terrifying numbers conceivable. 36.5% uh, of children had thyroid tumors of two centimeters or bigger on their thyroid, 
which is only about two centimeters by two centimeters. These are massive tumors, and on a gland that produces the hormones for your bodies, for goodness sakes, and with children that are developing it. 865,000 extra cancers in the first year. They, they can't get rid of the sewage in Tokyo or most of Japan because it's so radioactive, which means the people are excreting numbers that are not never heard of before. They can't get rid of the sediment from the water filtration plants because, and we're talking about tens of thousands of tons in cities each year. They can't get rid of the ashes from the incinerators. Not only that, they got billions of radioactive pounds in the nuclear wasteland are grinding up and shipping to other prefectures and burning it in the incinerators. And some of these incinerators would have to shut down because people are having heart attacks all over the place during the, that process. These are dirty bombs by the kilogram. Every facet of the story is insane. And Lake Barrett is like, oh, no, it's all psychological. Not a health catastrophe yet. But Here, lots of stuff appears to have been exposed to the atmosphere and radiation is finding its way already into vegetables and the Tokyo water supply. So at what point in your mind does it become a health disaster as opposed to just an operational disaster. You're going to start have a findings of some radioactivity outside for weeks ahead, so it'll be news. Weeks ahead for weeks. Now, I, I chopped a video for time constraint. Right? About it, but I don't think overall it's going to be a, a huge health catastrophe that some people predict. Well, the iodine-131 day half-life, so that decays away fairly quickly. So compare, if you will, this situation to what we saw take place at Chernobyl and the after effects of Chernobyl over the past uh, 25 years. Well, I think Chernobyl was, was a much worse situation. Uh, that was a Soviet reactor that basically blew itself up and spread things all over the area. <laughs> this is a different type of reactor. There's a lot of water and most of the radioactivity is kept in the water locally on the plant. Although like, uh, just hang on, because that's offensive, what he's doing there. Let me show you Reactor 3. Here's Reactor 3 at Fukushima. Now, Lake Barrett was aware of that picture. He knew the reactor was gone and the fuel pools were gone. But he chose to say nothing has happened so that the people that believe in Lake Barrett didn't have a chance now to, to protect their loved ones and themselves from radioactive fallout. This is a mass murderer. This is a serial killer. This is a terrorist. This is what this guy actually is. Well, you can see, you know, leakage outside the plant. But I don't think we expect to see a Chernobyl-type situation there. And if you look up the definition of a terrorist, that's what he's doing is the description of what a terrorist actually is. Well, you can see, you know, leakage outside the plant. But I don't... You can see leakage? Like, Buddy's done everything he did... did the interviewer done everything he can to make Lake look like a human, someone that drinks water and breathes fucking air like me. I think we expect to see a Chernobyl-type situation there. Okay, Blake, thanks so much for joining us. It's Lake Barrett, a nuclear engineer and former deputy director of the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management. So that's the creature was in charge of the radioactive waste management. He was a guy who was in charge of Three Mile Island. His crimes are terrifying. He's the opposite of what a country would do, isn't he? You don't hire, why would you hire monsters, actual real life monsters on, and put them in charge of the most dangerous stuff in human history, bear nothing, and give them free reign then to be a monster? Why would you do that? What kind of stupid, idiotic, moronic person thought that was a fucking good idea? So, I apologize. It's a despicable creature is what he actually is. He should be prosecuted and then executed and then dissected to make sure other humans like that don't exist. This is not right, but this is what happens when we do not have a workable disposable, disposal program. And the reason you don't have it is because you have disgusting parasites like that leading those divisions. It's like he was in charge of the radiation waste management. Him. 
He's the reason you don't have solutions. This is not right, but this is what happens when we do not have a workable disposable, disposal program. We were once the international leader, but now we are the least among the major nuclear countries. And this hurts us when we try to market American products and know-how overseas. Not only is it ethically wrong, but it's also very expensive. Someone has to pay the billions of dollars to protect, build, and maintain the ever-increasing number of canister storage systems. And that is the American taxpayers who have to pay. Because DOE is not meeting its legal contractual obligations, the taxpayers are automatically paying, paying damages through the Department of Justice Judgment Fund, which has no congressional oversight, and there is no congressional appropriations controls on those payments. These rapidly growing costs are now estimated at $51 billion, and I expect they're going to soon rise quite a bit again. These are our generation's waste, and our grandchildren are the ones who are going to have to pay for it, even though they took no part in their making nor receive any benefits for them. New advanced nuclear technologies, such as new reprocessing approaches, may be able to somewhat assist in the future in the geologic disposal. I'm an optimist about some of that happening, but they are not a substitute. We still are going to need geologic disposal in an integrated plan in the future. Geologic disposal is, was not stopped by a technical problem. It was a social political problem that we must solve together. Importantly, not solving our nuclear waste problem is going to hinder, 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 hinder the development of new needed future reactors because it degrades the public trust and confidence and it, it, it questions our environmental stewardship commitment, which we have and we need to fulfill. I firmly believe there are reasonable paths forward that can create a workable federal host state relationship that can support integrated spent fuel management that our country desperately needs. Some specific suggestions are that we can go forward with a second repository program, which is under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act now, with congressional support. All parties should be working together to develop a new, independent, dedicated waste management organization to implement this necessary program, and that should be outside of the Department of Energy. This organization should be held accountable and empowered for performance, including creating and managing workable host state relationships that can truly function in our United States of America system. I personally believe a federal host state partnership arrangement in the form of a public service corporation is the most likely successful construct. It, it is time for the federal government to step up in a thoughtful, forward-looking, bipartisan manner. We need to take responsibility for decisions we made eight decades ago to produce nuclear fuel and four decades ago to develop a geologic repository system. On a personal note, I mentioned 55 years ago as a young engineer, I participated in the last nuclear refueling of the United States uh, submarine, the USS Nautilus. We took the spent fuel out, we sent that to Idaho, and the waste from that, it was reprocessed in Idaho, and the waste from that fuel today sit on the Snake River at, over the Snake River Aquifer in temporary canisters. <laughs> Did you hear what he just said? It sits at Snake River site right over the aquifers. You know what an aquifer is? It supplies drinking water and water to farms for tens of millions of people. And the nuclear waste sits right over it. <laughs> That's the strangest statement I've ever heard. Because we've covered that before, right? I mean, that's the most gangster thing I've heard in years to suggest that that was a good thing. Having nuclear waste over the aquifer of Snake River was somehow had redeeming qualities. <laughs> These are monsters. There's, there's no other way to describe them. But Lake, Lake Barrett, he takes the cake. When it comes to monsters, nobody's quite evil as Lake Barrett, that's for sure. That was 55 years ago. I don't 55 years sitting over the aquifers, hemorrhaging into the aquifers. I don't want to see my great-great-grandchildren having to deal with the same problem again. Oh, that's even more terrifying that he's actually got great-grandchildren. That was 55 shit. years ago. I don't want to see my great-great-grandchildren having to deal with the same problem again. So we need to get together. Uh, I'm very thankful for this committee and its good work in this area, but I look forward to what you can help our country <laughs> solve God. this problem and enable the federal, federal government to discharge its responsibilities. They've had the monitor, they had the authority 
They had the equipment. They had everything they could dream of, the manpower, you name it, to deal with it for 80 years. And everybody they put in power were the were Lake Barrett's type people. Or watch his face from Los Alamos National Laboratory sitting alongside of him, grinning that whole time. Like it's, it's unbelievable that people like this can actually Thank you. exist. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Stetson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, good morning, Chairman good morning, Duncan. Oops. Turn your microphone on, moron. How about that? Is that better? Not stupid. You can do it. There we go. Okay. The technology. Not my better suit. Uh, good morning. So if you can't operate a microphone, what the fuck are you doing talking about nuclear? Technology, not my greatest. He, he actually just said that. Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member DeGette, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your service and the opportunity to testify at today's meeting. My name is Dan Stetson, and I'm here in my role as volunteer chair of the Songs Community Engagement Panel. I was invited as a representative of the communities around Songs to share what I have learned from listening to the community for more than 10 years. I've also worked with Spent Fuel Solutions, an advocacy coalition that grew out of the communities around Songs. For the people around Songs, a top concern is the spent fuel both its safe on-site storage and its prompt off-site relocation. Unfortunately, it's no secret that the U.S. spent fuel management program is a failure. And it should be no surprise that the trust of the affected communities has been shattered. We are deeply, deeply frustrated. This failure is costly in many ways. First, we had a good faith deal with the government. We paid in advance for the spent fuel disposal. In return, the DOE agreed to start picking it up in 1998. That has never happened. Second, this failure is very expensive. The on-site storage of spent fuel has already cost taxpayers more than $10 billion and is growing at a rate of more than $2 million per day. And all U.S. taxpayers are saddled with these costs even if they never received one kilowatt of energy provided from nuclear power. Third is generational ec uh, equity. It's just not fair to burden our children and future generations with this problem. Fourth, the communities around Songs never agreed to be hosting spent fuel for the long term. Additionally, Songs sits on land owned by the Navy. They want it back and they want it back without the spent fuel to support their mission to train the Marines. Finally, if we are to leverage next generation reactors, we must still address the back end of the fuel cycle. This is not a technical problem. We know how to dispose of the spent fuel. The problem is where, and this is obviously a political challenge. Again, he says it's not a technical problem, but he couldn't even work his microphone and it's a technical, he's reading a script basically given to him by Lake Barrett to his left, or to our left. It's surreal. It's surreal. Fixing the problem means fixing the federal law. Last spring, I was joined by two dozen stakeholders from across the country to discuss how to amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and create a program that includes both near-term interim storage and permanent disposal. We produced six policy principles, and these are in order of priority. Number one, a single-purpose federal organization to assume the spent fuel program from the DOE. Number two, reliable funding. Three, pursuit of multiple permanent deep geological repositories, or DGRs. Four, revisiting the linkage between consolidated interim storage, or monitored retrieval storage, and permanent disposal in DGRs. Five, expanding the application of federal Title II and liability for spent fuel to include private consolidated interim storage. And number six, transportation planning, including public information and emergency preparedness. Let me emphasize that consolidated interim storage is monumentally important to the communities around Songs. 
because it can deliver off-site storage literally decades before DGRs. Finally, I think it's important to highlight a few points regarding consent-based siting, Yucca Mountain, and reprocessing. International best practices tell us that a consent-based approach is the most reliable process for siting spent fuel disposable facilities. This is going to require building on an enduring trust, a mutually beneficial relationship between potential host communities, tribes, and the implementing organization. This is a partnership that must be built over time, adapting to the needs of each individual candidate community as well as state acceptance. With respect to Yucca Mountain and in the spirit of consent-based siting, federal law should not predetermine DGR sites. On reprocessing, we must remember that independent of our decisions on reprocessing, we're still going to need a place to store the spent fuel. At the Ocean Institute, where I worked for 23 years, our motto was experience as a teacher. We needed to learn from our mistakes. Uh, in closing, I'm highly optimistic and encouraged. I'm encouraged that DOE is working on consolidated interim storage. I'm encouraged that Finland will open the world's first deep geological repository later this year. And I'm greatly encouraged that this, sub this congressional subcommittee is talking about the spent fuel problem, and I am highly optimistic that you will soon be working on solutions. Oh my goodness, I should have warned everybody to get their puke bags out, I forgot about him. I watched an hour and 40 minutes yesterday of this rat, and then I watched the rest this morning before we went live, and I, and I remember saying to myself, what was he doing there when he has no experience? He's supposed to be a watchdog at Song, right? Instead, he's firmly entrenched in the nuclear industry, isn't he? Thank you. Mr. Sesson, thank you. Uh, Mr. White, you're recognized for five minutes. My microphone on. Mr. Stetson, did you cut your mic off? I think, there you go. All right. Very good. Good morning, Subcommittee Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member DeGette, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today on this important topic. My name is Greg White. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, known as NARUC, on whose behalf I testify today. NARUC's members are the state public utility commissioners in each of the 50 states in the District of Columbia that are responsible for ensuring that utility ratepayers receive reliable, safe, and affordable energy utility services. In other words, our members are responsible for the ratepayers who have faithfully paid for every aspect of the failed federal civilian nuclear waste disposal program. The nation's ratepayers have paid tens of billions of dollars toward the federal nuclear waste program envisioned in the 1982 Nuclear Waste Policy Act with virtually nothing to show for it. In, spec in, in fact, there currently is no federal nuclear waste disposal program to speak of. NARUC and its member commissions have dedicated a tremendous amount of time, resources, and effort over the past 42 years to ensure that electricity consumers receive the nuclear waste management and disposal services they have paid for. We were at the table when the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was developed and passed. State regulators agreed that users of electricity generated at the nation's nuclear power plants should pay for the nuclear waste program. We still support that concept. However, please note that the only component of the Federal Nuclear Waste Disposal Program that happened on time and as intended was the collection of the fee from the ratepayers for the program. And incredibly, NARUC actually had to sue the federal government to stop the continued collection of the nuclear waste disposal fee from ratepayers after the program was abruptly shut down in violation of the law and without a plan B. We had to do our jobs. The ratepayers should not have to pay for nothing. Now the nation's taxpayers are footing the bill to the tune of some $2 million per day in damages paid out to the nuclear utilities for the federal failure. Nehru hopes that the renewed interest in advanced nuclear technologies will spark genuine commitment on the part of the federal government to finally resolve the nation's nuclear waste disposal program. 
Many states and state commissioners are excited at the prospect of advanced nuclear technologies that can provide reliable, emissions-free electricity generation. Historically, the excitement and therefore the focus of nuclear generating technologies has always been on its vast potential. In contrast, the focus on the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle, disposal of spent nuclear fuel, has been completely inadequate. The need for and success of a federal nuclear waste program is necessarily of keen interest and should be prioritized to properly serve the needs of the nation. To move forward with a successful U.S. nuclear waste program, Nehru believes that, one, efforts should be made to fund and oversee the completion of the licensing review for the Yucca Mountain Repository Project. Two, the Nuclear Waste Fund must be managed responsibly and used only for its intended purpose. Three, if progress is made on licensing of a permanent repository, it should be much easier than to cite consolidated interim storage. Four, Congress should consider assigning management of used fuel management to a single purpose organization, although I will remind everyone that that was what Akerwim was intended to do. If implemented in the near term, these steps create a solid foundation on which to build a viable nuclear management program, spent fuel nuclear management program. Thank you for the opportunity to express these views. I'd be very pleased to take any questions at this time. Mr. White and other panelists, thank you for your testimony. We'll now move into the question and answer portion of today's hearing. We'll alternate between sides and I'll begin my questioning and recognize myself for five minutes. So <clears throat> let me start off by saying the law of the land. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, as amended in 87, established federal legal responsibility for the ultimate disposal of spent fuel. You all indicate that the failure to carry out this responsibility has deprived ratepayers of a program and cost taxpayers millions of dollars every day, as Mr. White noted. Spent fuel recycling can work. It can work well as part of an integrated fuel system, but we always need a permanent repository, especially for our legacy and defense waste like that at Savannah Riverside, Idaho, Hanford, other places because they can't be reprocessed. So I'm going to ask you all, reprocessing or recycling technologies offer exciting promise, but will they eliminate the need for a permanent repository? Mr. Dr. Wagner? No, they will not. Mr. Barrett? No, they will not. Mr. Stetson? No, they will not. Mr. White? No, they will not. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Barrett, it's important to note that there have been tremendous technical achievements resulting from the work to license Yucca Mountain. Would you agree? Yes, sir. Um, how do we protect that progress and build upon those achievements? We must reach some accord with the state of Nevada and, and go forward in a win-win manner. Uh, our last couple decades has been either I win, you lose, and that is not served this country well. So we have got to mend the fence there that's very difficult to do after the 87 Amendment. But I believe that can be accomplished. Uh, currently spent fuel is stored and safely managed on sites across the country. What are there? Uh, 120 sites in 39 states, plus or minus. Um, a comprehensive system would further strengthen the nuclear industry. Dr. Wagner, do you believe spent nuclear fuel and the lack of a permanent repository should be an impediment to deploying new reactors? Uh, I, I believe it shouldn't be, but it is. It is, correct. Um, as technology, technology, technologies advance, our regulatory policy should adjust to reflect these advancements. I was pleased to see that you all support reprocessing as an option to explore. Dr. Wagner, uh, we update our federal policy. It shouldn't be, but it fuel reprocessing. Well, so right now with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, a once through fuel cycle was envisioned, which meant there's there's no there's no mechanism actually to provide incentives for recycling uh, spent nuclear fuel. So that's where we need to start in terms of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act structuring and to provide that mechanism. So we've got all this money sitting in the nuclear waste fund. Actually, I think there's just an IOU in that fund now. I think the money's been spent, but the federal government has an obligation. As I mentioned in my opening statement, South Carolinians have paid about uh, $3 billion counting rates that they pay in their utility. Like there's an IOU sitting 
instead of money because he spent all the money. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bills plus interest over time. Um, so, wouldn't that couldn't we use that money to help fund some of these reprocessing um, projects? No. So, so that's probably more of a question for for you all than me. Um, but my understanding is that we cannot. Uh, for one thing, that money has to be appropriated uh, out of the waste fund, and it has not been for such purposes. <laughs> We're paying what? Two million, two million dollars a, a day, uh, in just penalties and interest. Um, I remember the challenges of mocks, so I understand that you know good money thrown after bad. I'm not for interim storage. I believe we've got a permanent repository at Yucca Mountain. We spent a lot of money on. Uh, we have a waste fund uh, to actually pay for the construction and management of it. I've been there. Ingress, egress is completed. We need a vault and we need to start storing waste there. But does reprocessing or recycling present a unique opportunity for advanced reactor fuel? It absolutely does. Uh, there are different fuel forms that are that are more well suited to recycling. Also, a lot of the advanced reactors are intending to use what we call high assay LEU fuel. So it's a higher enriched fuel, which actually contributes positively to the economics of recycling. Again, it doesn't because it's much more difficult to reprocess it. And then the emissions from the reprocessing are insidious. Every facet of it is is a threat to humanity, eight million species. And for this guy to suggest that particular facet, <clears throat> I, I don't understand how the worst of the worst are the people that are being showed to the... But these are the worst of the worst they could have chose. There's a lot of scumbags out there, is what I mean by that. <laughs> There's endless amount of them scumbags. And the ones that they chose to sit there are the, the biggest traitors to humanity in history. We've, we've never seen anything compared to these people. The only way to describe them is terrorists. But on a whole different scale, to each of them make Pol Pot and Mao look like a schoolyard bully because of the harm from the emissions. It's completely dishonest, every facet of their conversation up to now. It's unbelievable. Yeah, thank you for that. So I visited Savannah River site in Hanford. I see the process of taking the highly uh, radioactive waste and vitrifying it or for um, edification of the crowd and TV, that means turning it into glass. That glass is molten, it's poured in stainless steel containers. Those containers still sit at Savannah River. So those Savannah River site containers that he's talking about with glass, with glass in it. Here's how that actually works is if I put it in steel or if I put it in cement or if I put it in titanium or if I put it in lead, it doesn't matter. It's going to break it down through what's known as a Wigner effect. But the glass, the idea was you can put liquid inside of a glass and then it wouldn't leak out, right? But it's going to break down quicker than lead, steel, or titanium. It's actually cheap. But the whole process that they used to do it, how many billions of dollars was that? And it's, it's completely flawed. It'll break down quicker than lead, steel, iron, cement would. From the neutron bombardments, the beta rays, the gamma shines, the x-rays, effect upon the material itself. Riverside and Hanford, waiting for a permanent repository. We've got that in Yucca Mountain. I personally love to see Yucca Mountain as a, um, an ongoing process because I understand that we have legacy waste. Regardless of reprocess and recycling of spent fuel, which I don't consider waste, I consider a national asset as a fuel source, we do have legacy waste, and, and the end result of reprocessing will have some waste that will have to be stored somewhere. Glad to see what Finland's doing. We ought to take note. This nation has come up with a solution. We've got to figure out how to get that solution to be the final um, outcome for the nation. Uh, I'm out of time. I'll now go to ranking member to get for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I guess I would just, uh, to first of all, thank you all for your 
really insightful and honest testimony. It's very much appreciated. And it's interesting she used that word honest testimony. But there was literally nothing, not a single honest statement made so far. Like nothing whatsoever. Appreciate it on both sides of the aisle here as we grapple with this. And both sides lied perpetually for the last... Uh, almost last hour. It's a difficult issue. And one of my great frustrations with Yucca Mountain it was was these shifting political winds. Um, yeah, but Yucca Mountain is out of the book, so why are we talking about it? Why well, are you wasting so much time talking about Yucca Mountain? This is the oldest trick in the book, right? Say, oh, no, we had a solution but they wouldn't let us do it. But it wasn't a solution. That's why it was litigated for $20 billion. But both with the Nevada issue, but also in Congress, where they were in the process of constructing the site, doing the, doing the testing. Then Congress would pass a bill that tried to truncate the testing and just send waste there. Then, then the next Congress, we would just try to decertify Yucca Mountain, and it just went back and forth like that, and I think it's a shame, and I think all of you will agree that, that um, there are a lot of hurdles to reopening Yucca, not the least of which is the, the continuing political opposition in Nevada, but also we would have to start up the whole testing process again. And so, so, um, so in the meantime, we're looking at all of these other uh, efforts, and I, and I think that, that, uh, that we should do that. But, but we should keep every option on the table, because if we're going to hope to move forward, um, then, then we're going to need to do that. Chairman Duncan and I, you heard, we wrote the Atomic Energy Advancement Act. We're hoping to get that through the Senate and get it signed into law in this Congress. But we didn't talk about the spent fuel um, issues. So we're going to have to do that as this Congress progresses and into the next Congress. Mr. Wagner, you were talking a little bit to the chairman about the fuel from these advanced reactors. I'm wondering if there are unique challenges to storing spent fuel that's been enriched to a higher level, and what, we, what can we do to improve our policies to deal with these advanced fuels? Well, that's a great, that's a really, you got to the idea is to cover, right, all of this stuff. There is no way to store the current fuel they got once they put it through a chain reaction. And so the mixed oxide fuel, let me put it this way. The fuel that comes, once it goes, once you start the chain reaction, you take the fuel out of the containment, it's two billion times more toxic an industrial poison, two billion times more toxic. So a single atom in your body, your body attacks it for the rest of your life with white blood cells, or until it kills you, it'll eventually kill you. But when you take it now and reprocess it, because it's already gone through a chain reaction, and you put it through a chain reaction again, again, when that particular fuel comes out, the emissions from that Everything is a hot particle. Everything. And it's prolific. The energy it has is why they're doing it in that particular process. But it's a br it's, the fuel cycle is about being able to breed plutonium because the fuel now is perpetually producing atoms and they reclaim those atoms that they're like the plutonium and the uranium-235, the fission atoms, ones that will split. They're reclaiming that because these things are perpetually producing it, which is the worst thing can happen to a planet. One of my biggest fears is we'll discover a planet with a civilization and 8 million people, 8 million species, rather, oceans and lakes, and we'll put nuclear there and destroy it over 100 years. We'll, we'll end that civilization, same as we're doing here, because that's what we're doing here. The radioactive fallout from 80 years now has set us on a path to no return, and Fukushima was the tipping point. 
Like Fukushima is a mass of is a mass of event. Let me explain that to you. So they they were they were pumping that model over there, which was the tsunami model, which is NOAA. But NOAA actually had a dispersal model for the Pacific Ocean, which is this one here, was hit away. And then they would pounce on you if you bought into that narrative and say, hey, stupid, it's a tsunami model. But me and my trusty sidekick launched research expeditions from Vancouver, British Columbia to Alaska for four to five months a year, year after year after year. Year after year after year, I traveled the coastline. And what I discovered on these research expeditions was that the perpetual radioactive fallout, this was just 19.5 days of it, had exterminated the species. The species to your left are actually exterminated due to radioactive fallout from Japan. Which is one of the reasons why you see that particular pole that way tonight. Is recycling nuclear fuel, and anybody been on my site at all would know that. They wouldn't have to ask that question. But just for those who've never been here, is recycling nuclear fuel most efficient way to indelibly permanently poison our air, our water, the animals, the birds, the insects, the humans, and everything else? And the reason we quantify that, or the way we quantify is that is we went out there on the ocean for four to five months a year, for six years without coming home, staying on the ocean, doing species counts in ab absurdly adverse conditions. And I just meandered through the 27,000 islands and the species are actually gone. They're exterminated. I went back year after year and that wonderful, incredible, unimaginable paradise, tropical paradise, is now extinct. The species didn't recover. They didn't come back. And this is not a game. This is something you better deal with. You have ran out of time. You need to put the foot on the gas and deal with this disgusting nuclear industry and this perpetual damage because the species didn't come back. Like the species didn't come back. Try wrapping your mind around. The ocean sea is supposed to be a soup of life where a glass of water has a billion creatures. 75 to 100 million of them are the phytoplankton, the basis of the food chain, the basis of the oxygen and the carbon sequestering chain. And so it would have all the larvae and eggs and small fries uh, also per glass of water of all these species. So it was a soup of life in a glass of water. And so if you plowed in a healthy beach, a healthy system like there, then the species down deeper and on both sides would fill in the gap. But you got radioactive fallout, it, it sterilized the coast. It sterilized the ocean because the soup of life didn't try to regain a foothold. I went back for six years to quantify that study. And I was attacked and demonized and vilified and smeared, and I still am today. I'm lit if you look me up, I'm literally the worst person on earth for going out on the ocean and researching the species because we had a major event in the media was out there saying we didn't. Congress, the Senate, those witnesses are saying this never happened. They're these people saying that that never happened. They're doing the same thing. They're setting you on a course for no return. Is nuclear worth trading off for those species? Was that worth it? Was it worth exterminating all those species? And I know because for six years, I went to the most loneliest place on this friggin' planet where there's no species, there's no insects. There's 30,000 insects missing. Don't forget, in the first year in Japan, they had an extra 865,000 extra cancers. And cancer is just one of the many, many illnesses and diseases from radiation poisoning. And eating it, consuming it, breathing it is 
being poisoned. You're, that's being poisoned. You don't see these get up because it's so nice and safe. And you can't protect somebody in these suits. The suits need to be at least 6, 10 feet thick lead to protect you from the gammas, the alphas, the neutrons, the betas. It's so disheartening to have these ranking members that are just degenerates. They know exactly what they're doing. Everything is scripted. Everybody's reading from a scripter. It's like clockwork. The whole thing is extremely organized. So I, I wouldn't say there are any unique challenges associated with storing and transporting these higher rich fuels. It's, it's a difference between about 5 weight percent U-235 and 20 weight percent, still considered low enriched uranium. That's why it has sort of this funny name, high assay LEU or HALU. Again, right? I don't expect any less from the directors of Los Alamos National Laboratory didn't allow like, his cohorts. But the high SA fuel, like, if you got a, a cup of it sitting on a table and you're, uh, you're in the house next door and you walk through the house and out, you probably got a lethal dose. If you took a, a small cup, like a cup, say this small, a little small cup, and filled it up with the fuel in the tanks at Fukushima, which is nowhere near as toxic as the high SA fuel, and put it in a McDonald's restaurant, a small cup of it, every 20 minutes, everybody in those restaurants would drop dead. And you would do that for millions of years. From the gamma shine, the neutron bombardment, the better rays, the X-rays. Um, so I don't see any any new challenges there. Some of the new fuel, uh, advanced reactors do have different fuel forms for which we don't currently have systems to commercially designed uh, to. Not some of it, but all of it. The high SA, right? The, the enriched plutonium mixed oxide fuel is not the high SA that he's talking about. If that's going to be for the fabled or their, their, their dream weapon against humanity and the 8 million species, small modular reactors. Like, they're not going to exist. You had 507 gigawatts of renewables last year. Do you really think it's only going to be 507 gigawatts in 2024? It's probably going to be 750. And then the next year, it'll be, it'll be 1,000 gigawatts. Nuclear is on its back, kicking and screaming because its nose is on the way out. But its its plan is to take everybody and all the species with it. That's what small modular reactors are. The plan to make sure you exterminate everybody because you can't escape the radioactive fallout created by creating the small modular reactors fuel, the high SA fuel. Um, so I don't see any, any new challenges there. Some of the new fuel, uh, advanced reactors do have different fuel forms for which we don't currently have systems to commercially oh, designed fuel. Uh, to store that, those materials. But I believe that is all very manageable as well. We would well, Again, you believe and you have no evidence to back up those beliefs. The evidence clearly show this will be around, this will be robots will be cleaning up the planet long after all the insects and birds and animals and humans are gone. We just have to design new uh, storage That's and absurd. transportation cast systems to accommodate those materials. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll giggity, we'll, we'll, we'll put it in casts. And whilst we're waiting to build some casts, we'll just put it in one ton bags. Okay. Um, now, also in your testimony, you talk about that the Idaho National Lab is working on the processes that would generate HALU. Is that how you say it? HALU. HALU, okay. Yeah. From, from downbending high enriched uranium. So can you talk? She's never read that before. Is she that? Talk about that process to be able to develop it for advanced reactors. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, this gives me a nice opportunity as well to say that we don't commercially recycle uh, spent nuclear fuel right. in the United States. <laughs> I told you that earlier, didn't I? Right? I, to I told you that earlier. They don't commercially reprocess it. And that the hot boxes 
how many accidents have they had at the hot boxes Los Alamos National Laboratories? And that the ones that are committing the accidents get the biggest bonuses. Like they get bon they give away bonuses like twenty five million dollars to a company is nothing. Because nobody wants to do it, right? And so if you're willing to hire the homeless and the destitute and the victims of society and immigrants don't speak the language and put them to work on this stupid industry, you're going to get big bonuses. But at Idaho National this Laboratory and, and in other places, including Savannah River, we've been recycling uh, spent nuclear fuel for years. Yes, uh, earlier have. was yeah. mentioned the Navy, the nuclear Navy. We reprocessed uh, Navy nuclear fuel through the early 90s. Okay. And you got, and like the Soviet Union got 18,000 dumps in the Arctic. And they got, they got like cargo ships of Soviet fuel from submarines scuttled. They got nuclear submarines that they filled up with fuel and brought up and sank. Russia's got 160 nuclear subs ran up on beaches in northern Russia abandoned. The Americans don't even know how to two decommission theirs, let alone Britain or anybody else. The nuclear subs. A lot of those reactors were built with no way to decommission them, with no access. If you open the doors up, you're exposing it to air, then you'll cause a detonation. What a dishonest creature this guy actually is. Uh, part of the reason for doing that is that's actually high enriched uranium, so very valuable material um, that, uh, that can be used again. Uh, even. But he just said they don't have... It's not legal to process. There's only a couple of spots at the Lake Los Alamos and one other spot that is tying with the idea. It's a special license, but they don't legally do it because it's idiotic. Even sort of more valuable than, say, low enriched uranium uh, spent nuclear fuel. So at the lab, we reprocess or recycle the EBR2, Experimental Breeder Reactor 2. Uh, spent fuel that was high enriched uranium. We use a technique called pyroprocessing. Um, it's an electrochemical process where we separate the uranium from so the other French. materials and then we are down blending that remaining uranium, which is still high enriched uranium, down to below 20 weight percent, mm -hmm. which then makes it low enriched uranium or HALU. Uh, and we are making that material available to advanced reactor developers to support their initial cores. And how many meltdowns did he have at Los Alamos National Laboratory that he didn't tell us about, I wonder? Like, when you look, if you look up Los Alamos National Laboratory accidents, and you're going to spend four or five days, you're going to find stuff that will terrify you. For a specific example, we were working with Oklo to uh, allocate uh, up to five metric tons of that material to support the first core for their demonstration reactor. Thank you. So they're, they're tiny reactor, they're going to need uh, 5,000 tons. Thank you. I just... Uh, to, to, to make the fuel to, for a single, it's absurd. It's like 3%. Um, I just want to ask you, Mr. Stetson, I appreciate the community panel perspective, and I just wonder if you want, if you want to expand your previous testimony about why it's so important to have the community panel perspective when you're talking about the long-term disposal of nuclear waste. Certainly happy to do that. Um, I th why is he sitting there? He's supposed to be a watchdog, an anti-nuclear. He's not supposed to be there to promote nuclear, which is what he's doing. The community really feels that uh, the important uh, process to go through is consolidated uh, interim storage is a consent-based process, and really the whole purpose is to build trust. Uh, trust in, uh, number one, to have trust, you have to have competence in the organization that is uh, implementing it. Number two, you really have to feel that they, you're working in the best interest of the community. And number three, you really have to feel that there's an open uh, dialogue back and forth to respond to concerns of the community. Thank you very much. I yield back. Generally, time's expired. And I'll recognize the chair of the full committee, Chair Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start with you, Dr. Wagner. One of the goals of our nuclear legislation this Congress has been to unleash American nuclear innovation. And we've done this by laying the groundwork for a stronger American fuel supply, 
by reducing fees and increasing efficiency in licensing to assist the deployment of new technologies. Harnessing innovation really is the key to strong nuclear future. So Dr. Wagner, you talk about the realities of today's nuclear landscape versus the 80s. What do today's technologies, advanced reactors and reprocessing, offer to advanced spent fuel management? So today's, uh, right now, we have worked over the last several decades to advance those recycling technologies to improve uh, the characteristics that are still coming out of them. As was mentioned earlier, even with recycling, we will still have some long-lived uh, radioactive waste that needs geologic disposal. But what we've been able to do in the last couple of decades is develop technologies that reduces that amount and reduces the characteristics of the material that would ultimately need a, a, a repository. Now, also today, we are getting very close to deploying advanced reactors with different fuel forms that, again, is, was That's simply not true. They're, they're not close to deploying advanced reactors at all. They, they don't even have an application into the regulatory agencies. Like, they don't have an application into the regulatory agency. Like, the insanity of that statement is insane. The International Atomic Energy Agency in 2011 admitted there's no such thing as a safe level of radiation, that the standards are based on benefits, not safety. It, so they're taking anthropogenic man-made radiation and saying that it has benefits to your health, which is an absurd and absolutely criminal statement. In other words, that their rules and regulations are based on natural stuff, not anthropogenic man-made stuff. After Fukushima, the world's food chain could be compromised. Think, think about that statement. The world's food chain could be compromised. The world's food chain could be compromised. Japan's uh, radioactive children will be fine. Thyroid glands is emitting 35 uh, millisieverts, which is 35,000 microsieverts, and suggesting that anything under 100... Microsievers is not dangerous. Well, think of a microsiever as a thousand uh, millisievers. So you got thirty-five thousand millisievers. Think of each millisiever as seven hundred and fifty atoms, anthropogenic man-made hot atoms. So just one of them in your body can trigger an autoimmune catastrophic event. Your body attacks it every second for the rest of your life. Because it's pulsing energy in your body almost at the speed of light every second, killing chromosomes and DNA and, and, and cells in that. Your body has to attack that, and, not, and the damage it creates every second with the detonation. It has to repair all of that and attack the source to stop it from doing the detonation. So your body is in panic mode, producing massive white blood cells, which are going to displace your red blood cells. And your red blood cells are carrying oxygen and nutrition. So... 35,000, so let me do the math for you. I'll bring up the math here. I, I just think it's so important that you have some kind of foundation if you're not too familiar with the subject. And so 35,000, 35 microsieverts is 35,000. To multiply it by 750, which is lowballing the physical atoms per microsiever. So think of a microsiever 750 atoms. It's significantly more than that. So that's 26,000 explosions going on in their body every second. 26,000 explosions, and that's wrecking endless chromosome DNA and cells every second. Your body has to attack every single one of them with white blood cells. It's like having a cut on your finger. When your body attacks with white blood cells for six or seven days until it repairs it, then your red blood cell count comes back up. And so, in your white blood cell, for every white blood cell, you dis you're displacing the red blood cell, right? 26,000 explosions a second. And that's just for the, the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is producing nothing but radioactive hormones, which is not what the thyroid gland is supposed to do. And so these hormones are going to disrupt every facet of your body. And as if you're developing like a child or a young adult, 
or a bird or an animal or a mammal or some small creatures. It's catastrophic. This is catastrophic numbers. And this is what you expect out of people like Lake Barrett, right? To make those types of suggestions. I'm going to cover a few more. We'll go back to that. Six in ten Fukushima children tested have diabetes. The head of the Tokyo area medical clinic, we're expecting diabetes in children from Fukushima. We're expecting diabetes. So six in ten children with diabetes. And children with over 11 atoms per kilogram, 11, and Beckel is a pulse of energy from an atom, an anthropogenic man-made atom. That's the best way to describe it rather than the isotope. Is think of a a man-made atom that pulses energy that's not normal, pulsing energy almost at the speed of light every second, which is not created by the solar system. We'll start to see heart problems, but at 50 atoms per kilogram, they'll see permanent holes in their hearts, and adults will see permanent lesions to their organ. Now, remember, this is a country where the food was banned in 14 prefectures by 55 countries for more than a decade, and they replaced the people who put those bans to effect with the pro-nuclear community who lifted those restrictions. But does it mean that they had resolved that issues? No. No, they didn't. mentioned are more favorable for recycling than our current low-enriched uranium uh, oxide fuel. Thank you. You indicate that Russia and China are using their recycling technologies to cement their civilian nuclear re relationships concerning the management of spent fuel. What lessons should this hold for U.S. policymakers, and how does recycling enhance U.S. competitiveness? So, for one, uh, demonstrating leadership in what we're going to do on the back end is, is something that uh, is just part of global U.S. leadership for nuclear, uh, which we have not had since, since basically stalling the, the Yucca Mountain uh, repository project. So there's that. Russia and China, and particularly Russia, has been offering fuel take back as well to demonstrate that um, that the, con the countries that they're working with would not be saddled with the long term uh, storage disposal issues of the of the fuel that their power reactors generate. Okay, thank you. Why would they have to take the fuel back? <laughs> because it's splitting atoms into the ecosystem. Like you have to, and then they're just going to use it to reclaim plutonium for nuclear weapons. It's unbelievable. The whole story is unbelievable. It's it's literally everything they're talking about defies rationale that the world could have these conversations and not understand the significance. Mr. White, Mr. Barrett, from the testimony, it seems clear the American people have been let down. Ratepayers have spent over forty billion with nothing to show. Taxpayers have been picking up the bill for a failed management for another $50 billion. The citizens of Nye County, Nevada, which would host the Yucca Mountain permanent repository, have been deprived of licensing answers they wanted to justify for their support for the site. And meanwhile, the office has been dismantled that was focused on spent fuel management. So to both of you, Mr. White, Mr. Barrett, to rebuild trust in the spent nuclear fuel program and to restart the licensing process, do you, you need a credible organization that manages the program? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, we do, and we don't have it right now. Thank you, Mr. White. Will ratepayers support restarting the fee if there's not a credible spent fuel program? No, we will not. Okay. Mr. Barrett, while we may need long-term management reforms as a first step to rebuilding, does it make sense to reestablish the office at DOE the law requires to focus on spent fuel management? Yes, I believe it should be immediately reestablished to plan to transition it out of DOE eventually. Okay. Um, would you like to expand on that at all, either of you? Um, Yes, ma'am. I mean, I, we, we have to have a credible implementing organization to incorporate advanced technologies into the system. But we need to have a long-term disposal system. In my personal opinion, within the Department of Energy, it is not capable, uh, under the restrictions that, in reality, in political world here, uh, to be able to do the job that this country needs them to do.
I think it would be much more success if we had it outside into a dedicated organization that is a partnership type of organization, as the Blue Urban Commission on America's Nuclear Future recommended. Uh, and I hope very much that there can be an arrangement that eventually they can use what we've learned from Yucca Mountain uh, and possibly make an arrangement with the state of Nevada. The federal government needs Nevada, and Nevada needs the federal government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. White, is there anything you want to add? Yes. Uh, just uh, we, do need a, we do need a credible program. The Department of Energy uh, is a huge bureaucracy. There's a lot of uh, competition within the departments uh, or within the agencies within the department. We need a single focus organization. If we could do that with Ocarwim, with this Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management, to separate it, that would be good, but we've uh, been unable to do that. So the next best choice is to find a, an outside organization that can do that. Single purpose, highly focused on its mission. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. I now recognize the ranking member, Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to focus on the issue of spent fuel at decommissioned reactors, and this is a problem across the country, but as I mentioned in my opening statement, we have Oyster Creek, uh, that site is not far from my congressional district. Um, so let me ask Mr. Stetson uh, initially. You effectively serve as the voice of the community on San Ana Anof Anofre. Anofre. I looked <laughs> it up. Yeah. I looked it up. He's like, he's like some obscure Egyptian saint or something. I don't know. I've never <laughs> heard of him. But whatever. Um, on San Onofre's community engagement panel. And I'm sure you hear constantly from concerned and frustrated community residents. So let me just ask you, could you talk about the impacts that storing spent fuel on site has on the communities with decommissioned reactors? So that's a great one. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Storing nuclear fuel on sites and what impact that has on the community. The fuel is splitting the atoms into the ecosystem on a rate that is terrifying, it is catastrophic to everything with replicating cells. And so the community is going to be full of cancers, for starters. It's going to be full of heart problems, full of liver problems. It's going to be full of lung problems, respiratory problems, pituitary, thyroid, adrenaline problems, which creates absurd amount of other problems. It's going to compromise the immune system of every single species and every human in those communities and for within hundreds of miles. And don't forget that each of these communities, the typical nuclear plant is surrounded by farms. And so the food is an unbelievable way to get it into the internal of the victims who don't understand they're being poisoned. You can't perceive it. Uh, certainly, and uh, prim uh, number one is cost. It's very expensive to have it there. Uh, there's uh, and certainly safety. Like the number one thing is it's hemorrhaging. There's no containment. It's hemorrhaging radiation by splitting atoms into the communities 24 hours a day. It's a continuous plume. It's an invisible snowstorm or radioactive fallout. What? Uh, so we know why he's there, because he is the control opposition. And he's worse. He's at, in some ways, he's, like, he's worse than Lake Barrett, if that's even possible. The, um, the long-term safety for the spent fuel is a concern. We believe that it's stored there safely currently, but for the long term, it really needs it can't be stored safely because it's in fuel pools and they're boiling off 120,000 liters of high-level radioactivity into the environment all day, every day with a continuous radioactive fallout plumes worldwide, ultimately. Like, that's what makes nuclear so evil is the fuel is still splitting the same atoms it would for a million homes. And every couple of years, you're putting all this more fuel, so each year... The reactors are expelling more radiation to the ecosystem. And a lot of fuel doesn't really start outputting heavy radiation until a few years later, like a thousand days later. It needs to be moved, and that weighs on the, uh, on the public. And as I mentioned before, the Navy really wants the, uh, the land back for, uh, to train Marines. So all of those things. 
into an, like you can't clean up the site, so you can take them back to a nuclear wasteland. Again, he's instead of being checks and balances for Song Nuclear Plant as a citizen, he's firmly entrenched as a pro nuclear, disguised as an advocate, an anti nuclear activist. He's actually an advocate of the nuclear industry. But really, the, the local community is concerned uh, for the short term and for the long term over the safety of the spent fuel there, and they really want it out. Yeah. Like the only person that should be out is him and Lake Barrett. It's really I agree. I mean, of course, it makes it impossible to redevelop as well. But I think the concern is more about the safety than the future use of the property, frankly. Um, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of creating interim storage sites because I think that's much more likely than, you know, Yucca Mountain. So, Mr. Stetson, could you talk about how the Biden administration's actions setting up a pathway for a consent-based siting process uh, will be essential to getting waste out of the communities as quickly as possible, referencing Cer interim sites. Certainly. I, I think that it's on an excellent path. I mean, most recently, uh, they have distributed, I believe, $26 million, uh, $2 million uh, each to 13 different communities, universities, and the like to start the discussion about hosting spent fuel in there, not necessarily to have it there, but to, to start the discussion. So they gave... $2 million in 13 communities and universities to have a conversation, <laughs> to put it in the community, rather than somewhere far away where there's no issues and there's no, it could be done right away. So they're obviously not trying to come up with a solution when they're doing that, and they're causing a devoid, right, by distributing money here but not there guaranteeing any kind of referendum to follow And that's apart. really the first step that the uh, that the administration is taking. First of a number of steps to uh, to determine where we might be able to first establish consent-based siting. And I think that's really the, a very important step to get the community involved, to listen to them, and to listen to their concerns, and to adapt accordingly. All right. Well, thank you. Let me go to Mr. Barrett. Um, you talked about... Um, your experience working on spent fuel at DOE and that consent-based siting gets the buy-in of impact of state and local governments and tribes and maybe is the most promising way forward. Uh, can you talk about the importance of these consent-based processes and getting the buy-in and how that makes proposed solutions? Again, you know, interim, I'm assuming some kind of interim a storage site and and speak about how to ensure that those solutions hold up long term because you know politics change different people come into office if you would yes sir um, I think it's very critical that we have the principles of consent based siting in siting any of our nuclear facilities going forward so that is so consent based siting this is where the community consents to being irradiated it's critical, he says. Like, my goodness. Lake, first off, Lake Barrett shouldn't be there. It wasn't critical to have the community's input for Three Mile Island. It wasn't critical to have the community's input for Fukushima, was it? But now it's critical to have input. But what... The input is going to be based on their narrative, which is pure propaganda. It's a fundamental basics. Uh, I think to, in, to have that, you have to have a credible organization. You have to have trust and confidence in that organization, whomever it is. And it's not just a transfer of problem from one community to another community. Uh, the, I believe for consent-based siting for interim storage, it's critical that the, any receiving state knows that that is going to truly be temporary, meaning it's not going to stay there forever, like it's kind of been stuck now. So I think a, a critical part is there has to be a credible geologic dispo disposal system to back up interim storage somewhere, because you're just transferring the canisters from one, one community to another community. And why would a state want to accept that without assurance that the government or its agent is going to perform in the future? 
So I think consent-based siting is a mechanism that we can use to build the trust and confidence in the interim storage, but also connected with the, with the disposal in a consent-based approach for disposal as well. So it works in both places. And they have to go in tandem or they're going to fail. No, I agree. And I, you know, not to be so cynical, but having been here a few years, you know, Yucca Mount, we talked about so much. Then we talked about interim in New Mexico and other places. And it was always a problem because there, was no, so there wasn't local support. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member. I now go to Mr. Latta for five minutes. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for holding today's hearing. This is a topic that uh, I've been interested in, not only interested in, but something that we've got to really uh, think about in this country because as uh, the witnesses have, uh, in their testimony have stated, about uh, on, on the nuclear side and where we are with uh, our reactors and uh, with the power that's being generated and we're talking about carbon-free out there that it's absolutely essential where we're going with on the nuclear side. And the carbon-free narrative is such a sad, such a pathetic attempt to distract you. And, and I got a great way of explaining it. Just bear with me one moment. And the uh, Senate was asked, uh, a Senate committee was asked about who was in charge of the carbon. Here we go. What percentage, what percentage of our atmosphere was carbon? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Panelists, let me just go right down the vine real fast. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2? Take your best guess. You don't have to be accurate. All down the line. Repeat that question. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2, carbon dioxide? Wild guess. It's okay. I'll bite 5%. 5 percent. 5 I'll just follow you. Then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go seven. That's my favorite number. I'll see there five and um, suggest that we know that transportation causes 49% of CO2. So that's why we're all working on. So they actually don't know, but yet they're the ones in charge. Okay. Energy transition. All right. So what number do you think it is? Eh, five. Five? Like 5%? My goodness. How about you? I didn't hear you, Mr. Oh, Dreher. Seven. Seven. Did you have one, uh, Mr. Boyd? So we got a five, seven. Uh, <laughs> price is right. Eight. I'm going to get the high end. All right. Again, this is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. They're taking random guesses about something they're in charge of. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I don't mean to I put you on ice. I ask a lot of people that because all we hear is climate change, climate change, CO2, CO2. I heard a couple of you on the panel saying you're looking to change your vehicles to electric, even though we don't have the electric grid. And me as a farmer, I wouldn't be real happy about running out and replacing $300,000, $500,000, million dollar pieces of equipment because someone wants, someone wants it to be electric. The answer is 0.04%. Not 1%, not a half of a percent. It's 0.04%, and it's gone up from 0 0.03 over the last couple decades. This is what we're being all contorted into doing is this tiny change in CO2. If we, go, if we get below 0 0.02, plant life starts dying off. So we're just above sustaining life at 0 0.04, and they're claiming up to 8%, but they're the ones that are in charge, and we're even bragging about it. And so that narrative, by the way, the only thing that can cause climate change is nuclear. Nuclear pulses energy almost at the speed of light every second. Carbon makes insects and birds and babies and trees and plants. You can't have any species or anything to eat if you have no carbon. And uh, as, as already been mentioned about Yucca Mountain, I think all of us have been out there. And I say it's probably... Why are we talking about Yucca Mountain again for? The most expensive large hole I've ever been in the United States that uh, has been uh, put, oh. put out there. But we, in the Oh, I'm sure you'll find a use for it. You're not just going to walk away. I'm sure you've got other uses. 
You can use it as to store archives of your lies. Nothing's happened. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, I started talking about, with, especially with the French, is uh, what they've been doing when on, uh, with that spent nuclear fuel. And uh, I think that the uh, ranking uh, the member of the subcommittee had mentioned that she's already been there, and I think it's, it's important. But if I, if I could uh, just uh, go to uh, Dr. Wagner, um, Again, with and in your testimony, you know, you, when you state that in 1976, President Ford uh, deferred plans for a commercial nuclear fuel recycling because of uns uh, uncertainties associated with the technical feasibility and proliferation concerns. And then uh, President Carter, after that, announced he would indefinitely defer on it. One of the things I asked at one of our hearings, it was last year when we were talking about what we could do about uh, maybe following France's lead on this. And, I, and this was, well, it's very expensive, but now we're talking about something that happened in 1976, so 48 years ago, to where we are today. Um, you know, what, what's the feasibility of being able to go forward and start saying, you know what, we can go. And, and also, one last thing, when I was at a facility last year, they, they told me that they believe that, that we've got enough uh, spent rods out there that could produce fuel for 100 years in this country. You got enough rods out there to produce fuel for a hundred years. Well, first off, you have to remodify every single reactor to burn mixed oxide fuel, which is an absurd process. And the maintenance every sixteen months is absurd. It's like twelve thousand maintenance uh, ob uh, projects need to be carried out. And that the emissions from the fuel when you take it out of the reactor. Are catastrophic to the future. You like if you turned all your reactors into mix oxide reactors, plutonium mix oxide fueled reactors, you can't have any species or humans on the planet because it the emissions from the fuel will wipe out everything. Like if it was easy or if it was possible, they would be doing it, wouldn't they? The only people that are doing it is for weapons. That's what it's for. It's for weapons. So, uh, you know, from where we, you know, when we were being talked about that in 1976 to where we are today, and of course, we're, you know, they say, well, it's maybe we're too far behind. But can we and should we in this country look at recycling those rods and, and, uh, and for that spent fuel? So I, I think we can and I think we should. Um, you know, if you think about the, the timeline, when we had a prohibition for recycling, it was shortly after that that the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was drafted. So that was kind of the backdrop of it. And I would argue that recycling or not against recycling was baked into the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. As was mentioned several times, each of the utilities has, has signed a standard contract with the Department of Energy to take their spent fuel away from them. Um, they, didn't, they have not been able to meet that obligation and therefore they've been sued by the utilities and so on, which has been discussed. But that, that kind of construct provides no financial or otherwise incentive for recycling. So this really becomes a policy question um, and how we would, we, we need to revise the Nuclear Waste Policy Act in a number of different ways, um, providing access to the, to the waste fund, for example. It, outside of appropriations. There's a number of different ways that I think we need to modify the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, but this would be one of them as well, is to provide some opening, some mechanism that then a private sector can decide whether it economically makes sense or not, but right now there's really no, no incentive there. For the United States to move forward on this, has anybody ever even done any calculation what the cost would be? Because if we'd, start, you know, it's always like if you, you're a day behind if you didn't get started today. So, what you know? What is there a kind of any definitive study out there that might say this is how much it would cost for us to go out there and start recycling these rods? So there's a lot of studies, uh, and uh, and they have different variations. It's a large number uh, in terms of what it would cost, but it also depends. The size of the number depends a lot on how much of that material we would recycle. Would we focus on advanced reactors with high SALEU, or would we try to do it all, or would we try to do some portion of it? And so, you know, to give you an answer, it's highly variable, but it's a very large number. Um, and so that's where we are now, and there's really, in some ways, no point to go further until we understand, can there be a policy that would support 
uh, doing that in the first place. One other point I'd like to, to make is that if we're just declining or stable in nuclear energy in this country, it really makes no sense to invest in the infrastructure that it would take to recycle. So therefore, there's really been no impetus to change. However, now as we look at potentially tripling our nuclear uh, capacity by 2050, that would warrant a different look and that would warrant uh, investment in such technologies, in my opinion. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has just expired and I yield back. Chairman yields back. Mr. Peters, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The San Onofre Generating Station, as we mentioned before, is just uh, north of my district uh, in San Diego and sits on a, well, the most beautiful stretch of the San Diego, California coast, um, within 100 feet of the Pacific Ocean and near dense population centers, near an active uh, military base and near multiple fault lines, not the best place for nuclear storage. I think we would all agree. Um, as as Mr. Stetson said, uh, our constituents are, are anxious to see it moved. Uh, we hope to advance the development of both interim uh, inner storage and a permanent storage site as soon as possible, and have long supported federal efforts to do so. The lack of interim and permanent storage facilities poses an immediate and significant threat to uh, my constituents and other communities around the country, like um, the chairman himself referenced. Uh, if we're going to continue to continue encouraging the development of domestic next generation nuclear technologies to meet an extremely growing load, a load that's uh, for a demand for, um, for electricity that's growing very quickly. Uh, we're going to need to um, to deal with this issue. And I, I would just say too, I know there's not a lot of enthusiasm among states to accept any amount of spent nuclear fuel. Um, uh, it's clear to me that we are on this path toward um, consent based uh, siting. I've expressed my my skepticism about that in this um, in this room before, um, but that's the path we're on. But let me just uh, talk a little bit with Mr. Stetson. Uh, I think you addressed this a little bit, but in terms of the risks, uh, uh, the health risks of having this wh where it is, can you just um, give us a little sense of, of how you assess those right now and then maybe um, how those risks would compare if they were moved to uh, interim storage or permanent repository like Yucca Mountain or someplace else? Well, in terms of risks, uh, we believe that the, uh, I think in general, um, there's consensus that the spent fuel stored at San Onofre is currently safe. Mm -hmm. uh, time about the risk to the population. Time about the risk to the population. So, uh, you know, if I would argue. Let me go ahead, I'm sorry. You didn't get started today. So, give you an answer. To, it's highly very possible, and I've long supported federal efforts. Yeah, my apologies. I forgot to chop it. There we go. We'll get there. Yeah, to right there. I'll chop it right there so I don't make that mistake again. To do so, the lack of interim and permanent storage facilities poses an to need to repackage it. Right. So in order to do that, you're going to have to remove it from the area where it's currently stalled. Uh, you're going to need to open it, and you're going to need to repackage it. In order to do that, you're going to need a hot cell. And a hot cell is a very expensive proposition. So uh, long term, I think it's something that's, that's a... The hot cell is like a hot box. It's where it has gloves and... Uh, has like thick lead glass, probably this thick, yeah? And you have manipulators and everything else, but it has these gloves where you can physically reach in there with these special gloves from outside. And so that thick glass doesn't shield your arms because <laughs> your arms are going in there. And so they hire people who don't know any better, basic education, and they put them in this and then they just get rid of them as they get a big dose. These are murder machines. This guy is a weasel. I, I can guarantee you he's connected close to Lake Barrett. He's very, very connected. You need to reap it's unbelievable. potential risk uh, and certainly something that we want to move it out of there as soon as possible. You and I completely agree on that. I'm I'm not as rosy uh, on the idea of uh, a consent-based siting as I mentioned before. And I asked Mr. White, how was it Yucca? How was Yucca Mountain chosen as a long-term storage site, and how many facilities like it exist in the United States from a geological perspective? 
Well, there are no facilities like, uh, I, I'm sorry, there are no other facilities that are being considered at this point. Um, as Mr. Barrett noted, uh, it was a congressional designation uh, and then further in 2002 when the Secretary of Energy designated Yucca Mountain to be the national repository. Uh, we, we believe that the science that was done there was very, very valuable mm -hmm. and should not be thrown out. In other words, there's value to learning from what happened at Yucca Mountain. Uh, Nehruk takes the position that the license review should consider even if the repository were determined to be non-licensable at Yucca Mountain, there's tremendous value to learning from that yeah. experience. If we throw that out, we're starting back at scratch, and that I, doesn't make sense. I completely agree, and I think that's what Ranking Member Deget was talking about with stopping the, the inquiry. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, I, um, you know, I, I, I was on, in local government, and I know the resistance to building a condo project. Uh, you know, it's, this is a nuclear waste siting facility. I went to Yucca Mountain. If I recall, it's a thousand feet above the water table, a thousand feet below the ground, and there's nothing around it. Um, and I think while consent-based ideas are admirable, you have to start with the geology. I mean, ultimately, it's got to be a safe place. And um, if someone in, in Mr. Fluger's uh, district was was decided that they wanted to welcome it for some payment of money we'd still really be concerned about what the geology was whether that supported it and we've done a lot of work to identify Yucca Mountain as a place where it would be ac acceptable so it's not going away um, I think uh, ultimately after we play out this consent based process which I've supported and I've I voted for money for um, despite, despite my skepticism because I want to be a team player and I, I want to resolve this issue um, I think we're going to come back to Yucca Mountain and, uh, because I think it's the place that makes the most sense. And sometimes from a national perspective, security, scientific, safety, um, that's the role of the federal government. Uh, it's, to, it's to go beyond. Um. So it's quite interesting. Why do they keep going back to Yucca Mountain? Like, why is that invoked over by every single person there, even though they admitted earlier the Yucca Mountain was off limits. It was, it was denied. But the real real reason it's denied is because it's in an earthquake zone, and it can only hold so much fuel, even if it was a perfect scenario, which they try to supplement with air conditioners for millions of years. It's, it not it only makes sense if they had no intention of putting it there in the first place. Then every conversation makes sense. But as why not acknowledge somewhere else? Like there, there is WIP, right, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project. They now call it the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. But it was originally just an experiment. And because nobody was paying attention, they just went live with it and called it a repository, which melted down in 2014. And they spent around $6 billion. And they said it was a truck fire. So they spent almost $6 billion to clean up a truck fire where there's 55 caverns that are the size of football fields were abandoned because a truck caught fire. Because that's the official story, right? I covered it in 2014. And uh, New Mexico, um, I can't remember the city, KRQE or something, took my video, chopped it up, and posted a chunk of my video and called me a conspiracy theory theorist. Well, all I was doing was, was reporting on the accident and the, the acknowledged emissions used in their clips, and then they call me a conspiracy theorist. It's heartbreaking. Uh, local objections, um, which in this case I think uh, we, we can meet. Um, but I certainly appreciate everyone's interest here. I like the idea of an independent organization. It seems to be a consensus on that. And would love to work with the chairman and the members of this subcommittee to, to see that happen, if that would be helpful as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having the hearing. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from California. I was on that trip with you to Yucca Mountain. I remember Congressman Mark Sanford standing there and saying, if we can't put the nuclear waste here, we're not going to put it anywhere. Which is the words that he regurgitated too, right? And so it's quite interesting that they all use those same narratives f right for that presentation, isn't it? Everybody keeps coming back there. There's an agenda, right, to keep people fixated on Yucca Mountain, where they already litigated, was litigated. They spent over $20 billion of the funds they raised to store it, 
was spent on litigation, defending litigation. Twenty billion. And so there's no other places in the entire United States that they can put nuclear waste only Yucca Mountain. Which nobody is going to allow to happen. Which means it's going to be allowed to vent into the environment for long past. It's, I'm just literally stunned that somebody would say something like that. Nuclear is just a big money pit, right? That's what nuclear actually is. And uh, so your points are very valid. I'll now go to Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. What points? Literally, what points? You can mount is somehow now a point, even though they acknowledged earlier that this is completely off limit. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the panel for being here. And thanks to some of my colleagues for not showing up, so it gets me on questioning a little earlier than planned. <laughs> hey, that's just fact, okay? Um, uh, we appreciate the... And uh, so your points are very I valid. Hear that I'll now go to Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. I gotta hear that statement again. He's nice and serious. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the panel for being here. And thanks to some of my colleagues for not showing up, so it gets me on the questioning a little earlier than planned. <laughs> hey, that What are they laughing about? They even started off as saying it's one of the most serious subjects, and some of his colleagues hasn't showed up. And everybody has a big yuck, yuck, yuck about it. When that's their job is to show up. It's just, it really is something, isn't it? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the panel for being here. And thanks to some of my colleagues for not showing up, so it gets me on the questioning a little earlier than planned. <laughs> hey, that's just fact, okay? Um, we appreciate the panel and a special welcome to one of our former Michigan Public Service Commissioners, Mr. White. Thank you for being here. My district has two nuclear plants on either coast, um, the coast being Lake Michigan and Lake Erie. Uh, and another just... Lake Michigan and Lake Erie's are not coast, they're, they're fresh water. The most important resource that America has, and that's where they got their nuclear react, some of their nuclear reactors, poisoning the biggest reservoir they got in America, and which they share with Canada. It's unbelievable that he made that statement. That is on the contempt it's platable, right? It's, oh my goodness. It's north of my district, Palisades, uh, that is in the process of being, I'm glad, brought back uh, online in some way, shape, or form. Nuclear power will be a major player in Michigan's energy mix for many years to come. For that reason, we must figure out a long-term solution for nuclear waste. Michiganders have contributed about $2 billion to the Nuclear Waste Fund to remove our spent fuel. That price is only going to keep going up. I appreciate that the chairman holding the hearing today to discuss this important issue. Mr. White, you testified before this sub uh, subcommittee on May 15, 2015, back when you were a member of the Michigan Public Service Commission. In your testimony, you said, and I quote, it's clear that the U.S. still lacks a nuclear waste program and after taking billions into the nuclear waste fund, the government has, and quote again, absolutely nothing to show for this vast collection of ratepayers' money. Uh, can you briefly tell me what has changed since you made those remarks nine years ago? Unfortunately, nothing. I was afraid you'd say that. Um, again, Mr. White, in your testimony today, you state that the Congress should consider assigning management for use fuel management to a new organization outside of the Department of Energy. Why is the DOE not up to the task, and how would this new organization work differently? Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for the question. And uh, fe feasibly, the Department of Energy should be able to tackle this. But as I mentioned in my uh, earlier remarks, 
um, there's, there's a lot of competition within the department for the dollars. And despite the fact that the Nuclear Waste Fund is a dedicated fund intended solely for the purpose of characterizing and developing a, a waste repository, the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management still had to compete for dollars, funding dollars, through the appropriations process. Our, our view is that if you have an organization that is outside of that process, that has access to those funds uh, and is dedicated to the mission of the repository, that you're going to get a better result than one that is in competition with other agencies within the department. And ratepayer interests will be protected? You believe we, we believe that they would because once again there would not be or the fund would be available to the repository as needed and we okay. do have some ideas as to how that would work okay okay thank you uh, mr. Barrett I, I support the completion of licensing Yucca Mountain if Yucca Mountain was completed today would it be sufficient to store all of our nation's spent fuel it would be technically sufficient to do so it is limited by law it only can take half of it until a second repository starts. Okay. Uh, Mr. Barrett, your testimony calls on Congress to begin working on a second repository. Yes, sir. As you've just stated. Why, why should we start that now? And So he, he was the reason to have a second repository started. And... Uh, his crimes should be prosecuted. They're very prosecutable. I'm, I'm just in, still in shock from the lawyers, the constant bombardment of lawyers from these people. It's, and then the, how freely they laughed when he, when he first came on board for his five minutes. I, I just... I, I can't understand a country like America has no checks and balances and that the checks and balances are the worst thing that ever happened, are the worst thing that could happen to the country or these people. They're, they're literally the worst What do we thing. need to do to avoid the stalemate we find ourselves in with Yucca? Horrifying. This nation needs a disposal capability under any circumstances regarding new nuclear uh, coming forward and advances in, in reprocessing. Uh, we need a geologic disposal facility. Yucca Mountain is politically blocked. It's been politically blocked for 14 years. I hope it can be unblocked, but it's not. All right, so we should start looking for another repository. The original act had two repositories. So let's start that process in a consent-based ba consent siting process. I believe that it's necessary for, ever to, for success for interim storage consent-based siting to have a responsible, capable, meaningful, realistic disposal facility in the process of being created. Without that, I can't see any state accepting interim storage for everybody else's waste from around the country. Politics still way out there. Yes, sir. Politics is very important. We, this is not a technical problem. This is a social political problem. Yeah. We can do it. What do we need to do? Again, right, suggesting this is not a technical problem? When it's a, if it wasn't a technical problem, they would be doing it, right? This is a picture I asked EI to make of a nuclear meltdown site. It, sometimes it would reject it, right? In fact, the majority of times it would reject it. And I would put other words in and then slowly manipulate to do that job, but it generally wouldn't want to do the job. It, it would do it for a coal plant, an oil plant, or a gas plant, but it wouldn't do it for a nuclear plant. This is a social political problem. Yeah. We can do it. Oh my goodness. This is a social political problem. If it was a social political problem, we would have already done it. I don't need to remind you what they, they enacted against the entire population a couple of years ago. 
made them do something they didn't want to do. So to suggest that it was a political, uh, social, economic problem, is first off, Lake Burbage should be in jail for the rest of his life. Why isn't somebody arresting this man? Why isn't somebody stopping this man from being manipulating and destroying the future of your country? He is there to destroy your country. That's what he's doing, right? With the lies and social engineering that his legacies are already... You know, they didn't clean up Three Mile Island. The, let me show you something about Lake Barrett and Three Mile Island, for instance. That's important and pertinent for the story. Because I've done so many presentations on Three Mile Island, on Chernobyl, on Sellafield, on Mayak, on Fukushima and Fukushima and Fukushima. bit slacker today, my apologies. Here we go. Three Mile Island. Well, let me go back. We'll get there, it's important, so bear with me. Three Mile Island, of course, well, one of the things I'm looking for, and of course, you know how it is when you really want to find something, that's when you don't find it, right? Just bear with me. Kind of important. So, one more try. Three mile island study is what we want. We got three mile on and plume. Let's show that also. Oh, there it is. Testing, that's the one we're looking for. Here we go. Three mile island. My goodness. Testing of the evaporators begin. The story. I'll put it on the bigger screen for you. Uh, 1989. Now, Lake Bard was in charge, right? Three Mile Island nuclear power plant workers prepare Wednesday to begin testing equipment used to boil off 2.3 million gallons of radioactive water in the nation's worst commercial nuclear accident, but Santa Susana in 1959 was the worst nuclear accident, it released 460 times more radiation in Three Mile Island, and they hide it by saying the worst commercial nuclear reactor, because it was a breeder reactor at Santa Susana, it's still melting down on the old rocket dime test site, right? So here they are, when everybody stopped looking, boiling off 2.3 million gallons of radioactive water. And, bear with me. And they use tritium in this story. Imagine using tritium they haven't been able to filter any, everything before that or after it, and you still can't do it today. But at Three Mile Island, the only isotope in the water was tritium. This was high-level nuclear water we're talking about. It was poured over the melted reactor core. And the releases effect on the average person within 50 miles of Three Mile Island 
will be less than the amount of radiation received from a year of watching color television. And you know who created that study? Lake Barrett. Yes, we can do it. I know we can do it in this country. Equated two million people getting poisoned by radioactive fallout watching color television for an extra year. The, The word evil doesn't do it justice. It doesn't come close to it. It doesn't even scratch the surface of Lake Barrett. Truly one of the worst humans we've ever seen on the planet. And he sits there with his... His henchmen okay. on both sides. Thanks for re- reiterating that, and I yield back. Chairman yields back. I now recognize Ms. Matsui for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, we can all agree that the status quo, where spent fuel is stored indefinitely at current and former power plants, is not a serious long-term solution for nuclear waste. Not only this is this not a long-term solution, it is the most inefficient and costly way to store spent fuel. It's simply unfair to the communities, as we've heard before, where this waste is stored. Mr. Stetson, how much does it cost to store the spent fuel at the former San Onofre nuclear plant? Thank you for the question. There's two types of storage units there. There's the horizontal, which are the Arriva, and there's the vertical, which are the Holtec. And to, for the infrastructure to build those was... So Arriva is the French. Which they went bankrupt in France, right? But the American-Canadian divisions are still out there, magically. And Holtec is Chris Singh. Who has, who's the janitor, the president, the CEO, the director general, and he's, he's not even American. He's from, I think, Pakistan or India, India, and he's all about profit. And his, his job, one of his, his original take was he would get a contract to decommission a nuclear plant. And so say they got $2 billion there to decommission it. Any money left over was his profit. So what do you think he's going to do? And clearly hates the Americans. And now he's made so much money, so much influence. He's, he's a physicist, but he's unhinged. So basically they gave the contract to the lowest contractor to clean up the nuclear disease factories. And guess what's going to happen? They're going to take every shortcut conceivable. He's really, he's, this guy is unbelievable. He come across, remember when we originally introduced himself as just a, a very meek man, is actually a shrewd monster like his... $295 million. It's currently costing about $20 million a year to maintain those facilities and should, due to uh, climate change, uh, rising water tables, things like that, if they are required to move that to higher ground, it would cost probably in today's dollars over $175 million. Okay. Um, in my district, it costs $6.2 million every year to store the spent fuel at Rancho Seco. And as my colleagues have noted, this can add up to a billion dollars per year for the federal government. DOE currently estimates that it will cost American taxpayers $51 billion in total. But, Mr. Baird, you write in your testimony that $51 billion is likely an underestimate. In fact, if we don't change current policy, taxpayers will continue paying out hundreds of millions of dollars every year indefinitely. Is that right? It's going to increase, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, for those looking to reduce federal spending, removing the spent fuel from these sites, including from Rancho Seco in my district, will save the American taxpayer tens of billions of dollars. In fact, the Blue Ribbon Commission and the 2021 GAO report on commercial spent nuclear fuel both concluded that just moving spent fuel to a consolidated interim storage site could save taxpayers billions of dollars. And it's not just about saving money. There's been a lot of excitement about the next generation of advanced reactors. But many communities interested in hosting a new nuclear plant may encounter opposition if they're stuck with the waste forever. Mr. Barrett, in your testimony, you write that the future of nuclear power 
depends on public trust that we will be environmentally responsible in our actions. Are you concerned that the current impasse on waste will hinder the construction of future power plants? Yes, ma'am. I think it's a very important factor uh, for us going forward. We must have national trust and confidence that we will have a disposable path forward, regardless of the advances in technologies, for this material. We don't have it now. And why should a community trust the government in the future when we <laughs> haven't done so well? I actually got a picture of Lake Barrett in his prime. There he is. That's Lake as a young boy. Or is that his father? I can't really tell. He looks so similar at that age. Yes, and Mr. Stetson, given your uh, experience with San Onofre, would you expect the current policy failure on nuclear waste to affect communities' interest in hosting a new nuclear plant? Absolutely. As Mr. Barrett said, it really, the trust has been shattered. Unless you have the trust of the local community, they're going to put up barriers and do everything they can to, uh, to block any future facilities in their location. Okay. Which is what they want, right? Because then they get to burn all kinds of money. They get to burn all kinds of money. My goodness. Uh, but Lake seems to be leading the charge. Lake is the big shot. It's like Rod Adams, right? Rod Adams is a is a capital investor. He goes around investing in nuclear companies fusion and everything else. Now Rod used to work on a submarine, nuclear submarine for 25 years and he's one of the lowest forms of life you'll ever come across. He, he, he actually makes like Barrett look like a pretty good guy. And Rod Adams worked at a nuclear power plant. He used to run a blog. He's retired now. Now he's a capital investor. He just goes around throwing money at startups. But remember, he was an employee, he had a nuclear plant, and now he's a capital investor. How, how does that work, I wonder? He didn't win the lottery or anything like that. And he used to get all kinds of useful idiots on his blogs, which I got a big collection of. And they would all talk about bananas and potato chips and walking in sunshine and climbing mountains. And so obviously it was targeted at very young people to manipulate them. But it, it, it was quite the spectacle. And Rod would show up at all these. He would have been there today if he was still active. And he would have been there with his little piece of what he would call a fuel rod, right? And he says, see, look, I can hold on to this. It can't hurt me. But obviously, it's not gone through a chain reaction. And the pellet is not coated, zirconian at that time. But that was his tactics, that was his incredible tactics. Hello, Ohio. Hello, Mr. Dana. Ohio. <laughs> Hello, scumbag. Yeah, we know who you are, scumbag. Chicago Division. Yeah, that's what my T-shirt says. What are you lying about now? That's what my T-shirt says. What are you lying about now, Mr. That's, Dana? That's what my T-shirt says. What are you lying says. about now? What are you talking about? Be quiet. Be what? What are you lying about now? You're lying. How's Reactor 4 at Fukushima? Is that a lie? Ah, oh, stupid question. Is that, uh, I, got, I got a picture, I got a, I, I got a picture. I thought, I thought you had Stinkfoot coming. I thought, I thought you had Stinkfoot coming after me. I thought you had Stinkfoot. Hey, calm down, Charlie. Calm, calm, calm down, Charlie. Calm, calm down, Charlie. How many people were in the fuel pool at Fukushima Reactor 4? What are you talking about? Yeah, what are you talking about? Because you're claiming that they were in the fuel pool at Reactor 4. I'm not claiming anything. Thunderfoot is nuclear expert. He knows all about radiation. <laughs> he said you're the biggest dummy in the world. <laughs> Mr. Dana? Hey, how come the 14 prefectures in Fukushima were banned by 55 countries for a decade? Was that due to mites or something? Mr. Diner. Hey, Charlie. Oh, hey, hey, calm down, Charlie. Way about the early calm, calm, calm down, Charlie. I, uh, calm, yeah. calm down, Charlie. You filthy scammer. Calm down, Charlie. 
You're the scammer. Bastard. Why are you claiming Fukushima never melted down? Why are you claiming? Huh? What are what, you talking? What are you talking about? What yeah. are you? What are you calling in? You exaggerate a fact of Fukushima accident. <laughs> you, you, you run a stupid scam. What scam? Only idiot believe what you say. A stupid idiot. <laughs> But you're from the Tokyo need, Bureau. Your job, your job your, is to defend the government. Fake, fake expedition. <laughs> hey, <laughs> oh, thanks for reminding me, Charlie. I'll I'll show those expeditions here. Let me find them for you. That that'll bring a smile to everybody's lips. Yeah, that's calm down, Charlie. Charlie is known as a stalker. He's been stalking me for over ten years. But here, check this out. This is my research expeditions where I spend four to five months a year on the Pacific coastline from British Columbia, Vancouver to Alaska. And this is the boats. And uh, these uh, research expeditions are all up at my website, thenuclearproctologist.org. And let's be realistic now. I had left no stones unturned in my research expeditions. I've done this for six years. And I have a long history on the ocean when I was young. And so I'm quite aware of where to go and what to do. And I'm uh, very aware of what species to look for. The species to your left are now exterminated due to Fukushima radioactive fallout. This is not a hyperbole. This is not a conjecture. This is not an opinion. This is actually a fact, right? The species to your left are exterminated. This is an extinction event. And this is now not just trickled over into the Atlantic, where I'm currently carrying out research expeditions, which is very difficult because I have no funding. And so I just have a couple of people out there that donates to me here and there, and we fund the operation that way. But it's nowhere uh, enough to, to do the large research expeditions, but it's enough to keep this operation active every day. And just barely, but it's enough. We're very, very happy to have the opportunity every day to come out and challenge the nuclear industry's cover stories. And species to your left are now exterminated. This is not an opinion. They're not pretending that they're in Fukushima Reactor 4 for something to do. The, the radioactive plumes covered the entire planet, right? Let's go back to the story. But this is real. The story we're having tonight is real. There's real issues. Radiation and the emissions are not a game. And Japan poisoned its own community, its own country, nonstop. It was 865,000 extra cancers after the first year. So when you see these pictures, I put these pictures together to remind, fresh, give a fresh reminder this is an important story. Let's keep going here. Hey, um, Charlie's just thanks to consistent right? congressional direction and funding in FY21, 22, and 23, and 24, DOE has made significant progress in developing and implementing a roadmap for consent-based siting of consolidated interim storage. Mr. Barrett, you provided several recommendations in your testimony, including for DOE to continue in terms interim story siting program. In your opinion, should this committee support continued funding for these programs? Yes. Okay. And I should have chopped that off there the last time. Let's keep going. Hey, um, thanks to consistent congressional direction and funding in FY21, 22, and 23, and um, beyond the current interim storage program, DOE also needs to expand its efforts to develop a comprehensive waste management plan for the transportation, interim storage and disposal of spent fuel. And for this, DOE needs additional direction from Congress. Mr. Barrett, I think you might have answered this, but we can talk about it again. You also recommended DOE prepare an overall waste management strategy and start a consent-based siting program for a second repository. Is this something that you truly do advocate for, and do you believe that this will start the process in a direction that might move us off certain areas that we have been fighting about for a long time? And also, if we do this, do you believe that we can start 
you're, you start, you're talking about building trust. I think that's really something that we really need to do. And I think it's really necessary today because many people's opinion have changed about the importance of nuclear power for the future, which I think is, um, I think is a good start. And in order for this to happen, even with all the technological advances, the trust part is going to be very important. So do you believe that just moving forward on this will be helpful in this? Yes, we need to move forward, but what's missing in an integrated plan is the Department of Energy has no plans right now for the ge geologic disposal component, which is a critical, fundamental, foundational component that we do not have. They are doing consent-based siting for interim storage only. Okay. That is why I strongly urge this committee and the Department of Energy to start a process to work on geologic disposal, Yucca Mountain or not. We have, must have that as a, a foundational piece. And it's Yucca Mountain, not Yucca Mountain. He keeps calling it Yucca Mountain, but it's actually Yuc Yucca Mountain, right? But that's his subconscious. See, he's used to doing it outside of there, and he can't contain himself. Senile piece of shit. in our programs going forward. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I yield back. John Lee yields back. Uh, before you do, you had something you wanted to submit for the record. Was that part of an opening statement, or? Yes, it was, but I will be submitting later. Okay, without objection, so ordered. So i now go to Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, and I thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have to tell you, I understand there's already been a lot of discussion about uh, recycling of the nuclear waste, and I'm very supportive of recycling. I think that makes sense. I remember Ed Whitfield, who used to serve on this committee with us, was a big proponent of that, and they had a facility they wished we, he wanted us to invest in it back then, and, and I think a lot of us today recognize we probably should have um, in the recycling of nuclear waste. I'm also very supportive of uh, Yucca Mountain and going forward with that. Um, I know there are others who disagree, but that's where I stand. And I understand, gentlemen, and, and I'm going to go to Mr. White with the question, but I understand that, that there's a, a settlement that was made because they've been collecting the fees uh, and not doing anything with, with uh, the waste management and that uh, payments are to be made out of the Treasury Department to pay for the failure to uphold the waste management contracts that were previously entered into uh, in order to resolve this. Now, when Treasury goes to pay that money, do you think that the money should come out of the DOE nuclear waste fund, or should it come from somewhere else? It should not come out of the, of the nuclear waste fund because the nuclear waste fund is, uh, was created for the sole purpose, very specific purpose, of characterizing a potential repository and then developing and constructing a repository. So that would not fit within that. And, and we still need to be able to do that. And in fact, as we've heard from Mr. Barrett, we want to start working on a, on a second one, even though we haven't actually started using the first one. Is that correct? It is correct. All right. I appreciate that. I appreciate you all. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to yield my time to you or to any other member who might wish to have some. I appreciate time. the gentleman yielding. Uh, Mr. White, will you walk me through how the Nuclear Waste Fund works? I'm sorry? Will you walk me through how the Nuclear Waste Fund works? Yeah, so the, well, the Nuclear Waste Fund, again, it was, uh, is part of the standard contracts that the Department of Energy were required to sign with the nuclear utilities, the utilities that own nuclear power generation. There would be a one mil per kilowatt hour fee that would be baked into that uh, rate uh, approved by the Public Utility Commissions uh, so that that money could be collected from the nuclear utilities through their rate payers, through their customers, and then submitted to the federal government. Ratepayer money, not taxpayer money. So the fund was set up, ratepayers would pay for the management and disposal of spent nuclear fuel, and it's amassed, what, almost $50 billion? It's, it's roughly $50 billion. There's There's been uh, something north of $12 billion that was spent on the characterization of the current, of the Yucca Mountain facility. So overall, there's more, but the current Current balance is roughly $50 billion. Yeah, and as I understand, the program's been hampered by... Well, they've been stealing from it constantly, right? Just bear with me here. They've been stealing from those funds 
for an absurd amount of time. Well, since the inception of it. And that because there's a lot of interest each year, you can imagine how much interest is on $50 million, and they're going to have the best voice, right? So they're going to be making a huge interest on that. And it's just an endless slush fund for those in the nuclear industry to to misappropriate. The, the speaker himself, right, the guy, he's, remember, he's in charge of promoting nuclear for the next 30, 29 years. Our reliable funding. Congress has trouble accessing the fund to pay for spent fuel management. The problem is, under budget laws, spending on the repository program is considered discretionary spending and is subject to spending caps. So this has limited what Congress spends. If Congress were able to fix the funding problem, would some of the other problems with putting a repository program back together be reduced? I, I believe that the answer to that is yes. Yeah. We've heard a lot about, in my remaining time, about a second repository. That means more ratepayer fees collected into a fund. And we've seen failure by the federal government to spend that money appropriately. God, I just can't. Um, so to the panel, when I hear suggestions to form a new organization to manage waste, they included a requirement to have uh, access to the fund. Is it fair that access should not be hindered by current budget constraints? That's to everyone. Yes. Dr. Wagner, Mr. Barrett. Yes, it's going to, it has to work within a, a budget system. I believe the interest on the fund is certainly sufficient to start the process before yeah. the, we Mr. need to use the Mr. corpus. Stetson? I would concur. Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, full access of the corpus of the nuclear waste fund should be made available. Yeah. Um, Dr. Wagner, in the remaining 50 seconds here, what's the difference between the work that um, um, Curio is doing with, is it Olo or, um, or, or one of the other companies there at the site? What's the difference in the work they're doing? So there's a few different companies. I think you're referring probably to Curio and Oaklo. Okay. Yeah. Um, Curio is uh, is developing a, a their technology, and it relates more to uh, other people spent fuel or you know various utilities spent fuel, uh, with a strong focus on low enriched uranium uh, and, and taking the value of it. Um, Oaklo is more focused, and, and we're working with them as was re referenced, uh, is more focused on recycling their own fuel from their own reactors that they're, they're intending to deploy, potentially then expanding to other reactors, but their, their primary focus is on theirs, and which means then that they're focused on high SALEU, uh, they're, they're focused on their fuel technology, um, which uh, kind of pairs very well. Uh, to pyroprocessing, which is something that we've worked on at the laboratory for many years. I, I do want to mention that we, we continue to recycle fuel right now. Uh, I'd love to invite any of the members to come visit to actually see what it looks like. A number of you have mentioned visiting Yucca Mountain, visiting uh, spent fuel sites, uh, commercial utilities. Uh, Don't happy do to it. have you come visit. Don't and see go exactly. there. Don't go to Los Alamos National Laboratory for good. I, I don't, I disrespect your people, but I wouldn't even want you to go there and get poisoned by this sadistic little demon who probably runs the site like a dictator and has no one he answers to. It's unbelievable that you're talking about the most dangerous stuff on the planet, and this creature is in charge. That creature is in charge of that Los Alamos National Laboratory. How many employees are there? 3,800 or more? There's like 5,700 employees. It's, it's bigger than most cities, for goodness sakes. And he uh, decides on life and death for the uh, the people that work there by putting them in a danger zone or not. This, these people are without souls. They're, and they're on one of the biggest aquifers in that part of the country where they spent over $50 million trying to mitigate what they'd done in the 50s. I'm not yelling. Okay, maybe a little bit. Let's keep going. But it's horrifying... Like, look at Fukushima. Every time you see these pictures, think of Fukushima. There's no room for people anymore because they got to stand on the streets because everything is taken up by nuclear waste. Our reliable funding. Congress has trouble accessing the fund to pay for spent fuel management. The problem is, under budget laws, spending on the repository program is considered discretionary spending and is subject to spending caps. So this has limited what Congress spends. If Congress were able to fix the funding problem, would some of the other problems with putting a repository program back together be reduced? I, I believe that the answer to that is yes. Yeah. 
We've heard a lot about, in my remaining time, about a second repository. That means more ratepayer fees collected into a fund. And we've seen failure by the federal government to spend that money appropriately. God, I just can't. Um, so Look, uh, the, these people are so disconnected from their responsibilities because they got a huge responsibility, right? They're dictating the future of all the species. This is what is at stake here already and is compromised from 80 years of this same system that has no checks and balances. They actually have no checks and balances. Let me move it ahead to where, right there. There is no checks and balances for these people. They, they have ran amok. They have compromised the integrity of all the species and the future of humanity. And we're going to let the exact same people curb stomp whatever future we have out of us. Should recognize that we have really? a responsibility we to can't address the waste that, that already exists. Planet, really? Today, there is a lot of excitement around new advanced reactor designs. So, Dr. Wagner, will advanced reactors have? Like the new, there is no new small modular reactors. Why are we talking about it? It doesn't exist. That's their excuse why they would have to make high SA halo fuel, high, you know, military grade 15% fuel, because they might, maybe, not sure, we'll see. We don't have any applications into the regulatory agencies, but somewhere in the future, we might need that. So let's pollute whatever's left on the planet that's not completely destroyed with the emissions from the production of mixed oxide fuel. And you got the right ones there as witnesses to promote that ideology, that genocide, that omnicide machine. How the hell did we ever get this complacent? I'll never understand it. But for goodness sake, somebody stop these monsters. The same issues with waste as we have experienced with light water uh, reactors? <coughs> So they will have the same issues in terms of the socio-political challenges we've been talking about, about in terms of having a, a management and disposition program for that material. Thank you. And I know several witnesses have discussed uh, already the opportunity for reprocessing and recycling spent fuel as is currently done in France. But uh, again, to Dr. Wagner, I was pleased that your testimony mentioned that the United States has a history of commercial reprocessing, which occurred in West Valley, New York. The West Valley Project ultimately failed for a litany of reasons, and today that site is home to significant waste and in need of major remediation. It is estimated that the cost of that cleanup will be several billion dollars. And there has been a long-standing disagreement over who bears responsibility for that cost, uh, although I believe it has been adequately proven that the overwhelming majority of that waste came from defense-related activities, and therefore DOE should be responsible. Reprocessing capabilities could be a good Like legacy waste is unbelievably toxic in splitting atoms. And it's already done it for 50 or 60 years. And he treats it like it's cotton candy or something. It's good addition to our domestic nuclear industry, but I do not want it to be suggested that this would completely solve our waste challenges or what it, uh, what it, uh, or that it is what, uh, without risk. So while I'm certain uh, that, uh, that there's interest in better understanding the benefits and what it would take from Congress to jumpstart domestic reprocessing capabilities, I think we need to be clear about a couple of things. First, there must be a regulatory framework that adequately addresses the, the risk in such a commercial project, including who should have liability for future remediation activities. And second, we need to definitively address the legacy of our nation's last foray into reprocessing. So, Dr. Wagner, do you have any recommendations on how we should evaluate the risks and necessary incentives? The Price-Anderson Act uh, forgives the nuclear companies. So there's, the nuclear companies has no incentive 
By the way, it's not illegal to poison you either, right? Congress, they don't have the authority to make it illegal to poison you. So it's a redundant question because they can't do nothing about it. Only the Nuclear Regulatory Agency under that current administration has the authority to make those decisions. And as far as I know, if they, say if they make it illegal to poison you, the next administration will make it not illegal to poison you. And if it was illegal to poison you, you couldn't use it in your hospitals, could you? Your biggest murder production sites on the planet is radiation therapy. There's no such thing as radiation therapy. Your body attacks it with every white blood cell it can get for the rest of your life. It destroys the integrity of your health. And that the studies done on radioactive uh, chemo combinations showed that it was better not to take it because the quality of your life immediately denigrated to next to nothing. See, what they're doing is scripted. It's a three-hour script, and then everybody sits there and plays their five minutes. They read their page, and they know what the next guys read, and they can be deaf, but they knew what the guy before read because it's all there in the script, and here's their turn. They get a cue, and they read their five minutes. They ask their single question, and one of the four witnesses regurgitates the controlled opposition's narrative. If you went to Las Vegas and the gambling casinos worked that way and you went to court, you and you you would win, right? And if you took but there's no one to hold these people accountable. They hold themselves accountable. You you have now essentially like there would be five rows of traffic of one ton bags. If you took the bags at Fukushima, they would make a five road wide traffic lane right around the entire planet more than once. If they were in, if they were in uh, one ton pickup trucks, it's five rows of traffic, 30 million one ton bags they picked up in 3% of the land. You, do you really think what is gonna happen when they melt down in America doesn't need the same appropriate action? Lake Barrett stopped them from doing this. Why is he even allowed to appear in public? He should be in for the criminally insane or in jail as a terrorist. But this was the rendition that I cooked up of this would circle the whole planet and this is what it would look like. Five rows of traffic circling the entire planet. But let's just say it's just one row of traffic wide of one ton bags circling the planet. This rendition is still accurate. Of just Fukushima of 3% of the land. And it should have picked up around 30 trillion one ton bags of radiation, not 30 million. That is one of the most terrifying stories, too. It should have been 30 trillion of these bags in Japan because of their meltdown. Incentives to encourage the reprocessing and recycling of spent fuel. So, in terms of evaluating the risks, um, we, we do have NRC licensing related to these kinds of things. There is some updates there that, uh, as, I, as I put in my written testimony, would be appropriate. So, uh, that's the kind of risks I think about in that regard. Um, in terms of policy, I mentioned that we really have no policy mechanisms to promote it. So, I'd like to open that up and make that an option. But ultimately, it's, it's going to come down to either economics on the private side or federal policy if we decide to, to recycle. I will note that you know, many, many members have mentioned that France recycles today. They do that as a federal government policy. Um, they do not do that because it's economic to do so. They've made a policy to do that. So I just wanted to flag that. Thank you. And uh, do any of our other members of the panel have opinions as to how Congress should consider the uh, potential for reprocessing. I believe that Congress should should investigate um, and keep up with the advances in technology, as, as uh, Dr. Wagner has, has stated. Uh, but we also need to do this in an integrated manner, looking at the whole package, including in France, for example. They do have a disposal program that is advanced there uh, using their, their political system. Uh, we don't have that here. Uh, so you need to look at it in total. Mm -hmm. Mr. 
Stetson? Uh, only that if we pursue that, that we still need the back end to store it at some place after it's reprocessed. You're, it's illegal. They already acknowledged that earlier. It's, it's illegal. Right? So to put, you know, there's a huge chunk of this uh, committee, House committee, subcommittee, spent talking about Yucca, not Yucca, but Yucca Mountain. Small modular reactors, recycling. And recycling is illegal, so therefore small modular reactors should be illegal too because you got to have mixed oxide fuel to make them work. But the reality of it is they can't seem to make anything work. In 80 years, all they've done was created no future. That's what nuclear accomplishes. is they guaranteed there's no future. You don't need a meltdown either. The fuel pools are hemorrhaging radiation into the environment. A neutral on the stand itself. But you see it as a complementary piece, potentially. Potentially. Yes. And Mr. White. Yeah, Congressman Tonko, thank you for the question. Potentially. Well, potentially, if everybody put a fucking stick up their arse, they wouldn't sit down as much. We can save on seat cushions. Like... To go down the road that he's going down, it's if I had a brick wall here, I'd be running my head smack into it as hard as I can at this point. Question, because I, I really think that what What's needs to be important here is when you're comparing the economics of reprocessing, you're not simply comparing it to mining and enriching uranium or buying uranium off the market. To the extent that technologies, uh, reprocessing technologies, can reduce the volume of waste to be stored, it should be it should be uh, evaluated as part of the entire fuel cycle for nuclear power. And the economics, I think, are going to change very dramatically when you're comparing building successive repositories versus only having to build a single repository or fewer repositories in order to, to store a lower volume of, of waste. Okay, I appreciate that. And with that, uh, I say thank you to the panel. And uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Chairman yields back. I now go to Chair of the Health Subcommittee, Mr. Guthrie, for five minutes. Thank you. And he mentioned the Health Subcommittee, which is currently meeting. So I've been back and forth. So I apologize because I know this is very, very important. And and I don't know a scenario that we get the lower carbon that people are seeking without including nuclear in the mix. There's a, my understanding: nuclear is about 99 percent efficient. Wind and solar is about 30. Was, <laughs> My understanding, because the the scumbag nuclear industry got to them, right? Is it, it's not ninety nine point nine. It only uses about two percent of the fuel. The rest of it is too toxic to touch for a billion years, and still splitting atoms on its own. Even then, N nuclear is forever. There's no other chemicals that can compete with its toxicity. It's two billion times more toxic, more lethal than industrial poison. Like, try wrapping your mind around that. Two billion times more toxic than industrial poison. Two billion times more toxic than industrial poison. That's nuclear. Nuclear is the, is the most poisonous by two billion times element which is not natural to the solar system or the ecosystem, and there's nothing with replicating cells has a immune system to defend against it because it's two billion times more toxic than industrial poison. It's two billion times more toxic than anything else we got on the planet. What part about that escapes people? What part about that is it that they can't wrap their minds around? Because I really like to know, you can call in, <laughs> enlighten me, at 709 here in Canada, 589-4406. And, and enlighten me of why that's so hard to comprehend. It's two billion times. That's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's, America Nuclear Regulatory Commission's own site. It's two billion times more toxic than industrial poison. That's what nuclear wants to go through a chain reaction. I know, that's a lot of truth to suck in, so let's go back to the lawyers for a little bit more. Wind's about 35%, so you need, somebody said you need three times the windmills, 
to do the same thing that uh, that a nuclear. I said, well, three, but you can't stack windmills. So it's either you could have 100% if the wind's not blowing, it's not blowing. So you absolutely have to have base low power, and we have to become realistic about it. And this is a uh, uh, the right this is a, a way to go but it does need to make sense and there are there are issues that we have to deal with so dr wagner uh, what is um we talked about spent fuels and reprocessing where does it make economic sense to so apply reprocessing to spent rods so it it would make the most economic sense if we as as was mentioned earlier if we factored in the overall integrated cost for what it will take to ultimately dispose of the materials which we do not currently do today so if we were comparing it to not just mining and processing uranium but the the entire fuel cycle i can't say that that would still make it economically viable mm -hmm. um it would it would make it more favorable those analyses would have to be done just Let's just sit there for one second, because that's such an important, important lie that he he coolly just shifted through like it was a good thing. We got it all under control. It's not bad. Well, we all know better. Let me show you something. The nuclear fuel cycle. I probably can't find it today. The nuclear fuse cycle. <clears throat> it's, the whole story is insane. But that's okay. Bear with me. I'm almost there now. Because there's more to that story than... There we go. Uh, we'll get there. Carbon free, here we go. I guess that's it there. Yeah, gotcha. So this is important when you're talking about, he's talking about the whole process. Ignore that picture. No, don't actually. I'll explain that coming up. So they like to tell you that natural radiation is like sunshine. In fact, it's like walking in sunshine. It's like rocks. Have you heard that one before? Like bananas, potato chips. But it's actually not. Does that look like potato chips and bananas? They're, they're dressed to deal with that. Do you think that the ships are out there throwing it off to ships and barges? every day for 30 years because it's like a banana or walking in the sunshine or potato chips or flying on an airplane. Uh, Fukushima residents can visit their grave. That was seven years later. The victims could go back to the grave because it's not like a banana. It's not like a potato chip. They got 105,000 sites like that in 2016. And just for the record, bear with me, just for the record, just for the record, up to a half a million tons of sulfur from coal each year, 300,000 tons from oil, 200,000 tons from natural gas or waste, in contrast, a 100 megawatt nuclear plant releases no noxic gas except for, you guessed it, 30 million one ton bags alone. <coughs> and you can go read the story, actually. Let me find a story for you. Because I, kn I know how to find that really quick. Here you go. Paying the parcel. Plane passed a parcel with Fukushima 2016. It was 30 million one ton bags of radiation. 30 million. These people all would have died that same day in their paper suits, in their Tyvex, spraying regions to bind with the radiation. These people were considered disposable. They died that day. But the reprocessing of just the, the raw uranium coming out of the ground before it goes through a chain reaction, right? They got to get it out of the ground. 
It's the most resource-intensive industry in human history. The whole enrichment, milling, mining, the reprocessing, conversion, nuclear power, the whole cycle is terrifying. That all these mines have these, these are chemical ponds, not ponds, not water. These are chemicals, which are allowed, because there's no opposition, are legally allowed to leach or evaporate into the environment. That's what they do with it. It evaporates away. That's what it's all about. They're so toxic, you can't drink the water in these communities. The whole process, and then f putting rusty 45-gallon barrels in shallow pits in the ground with turps, or just stacking it up and walking away. When you look at all the silos, look at these silos. These dots are all silos. This is just a fraction of what the American had during the Cold War. Are human shields. They're using the communities as human shields so that if the Ruskies or the Soviets were to attack any of these, they would have to by proxy attack the close little community. And that would allow them to rally the country saying, Russia just attacked our little community. But because they're embedded in the communities all of these missile sites. Every facet of the nuclear industry is stick a big knife in your back and your loved ones and everybody in the future and every species. And they're the most toxic things we've ever seen in human history. There's over three million children after Chernobyl required health care. Many will die prematurely. The Fisher story is 28 people because the truth is too horrible to tell it. The faked reactor four, you like how carbon free is it to abandon your communities, your shops, your hospitals, your schools, all that infrastructure, your your hopes and dreams, your graveyards, and you're going dumping it in in the ocean nonstop. You're using the most desperate people to work there because nuclear scientists are not going there. Where these mines and these toxic ponds are too numerous to mention. If you owned this, would you call nuclear carbon free? If this was your abandoned shop in a nuclear wasteland, and notice the spider webs are deformed? At least they're spiders. When I'm doing the spider research around here and the west coast and the east coast and the west coast of Canada, they're gone. Because we normally check the spider webs to see which species are in that area. Nuclear is the scourge of humanity, period. And pretending that this is not an issue and, and sugarcoating it and doing the same thing they've been doing for 80 years. And today I'm out there to challenge that law, that constant perpetual law. On the next area that, uh, that kind of enables it to look more economically favorable is I'm here to challenge that, whatever the hell that is. It looks like a human, but it ain't don't have any attributes of a human, does it? They sat there the whole time, and they're lying in every, it's all screwed, that I guess. This new fuels for advanced reactors, high SALEU, there is a greater value. Because that's setting the stage for the rest of humanity, and the people that are orchestrating it, you can't have a future and these creatures in the picture. It just doesn't work that way. You and the content of those materials when they are discharged than our current reactors do. So that's another positive kind of indicator towards making recycling more economic. Third, I would say with the, with the global interest in nuclear power, we are seeing the prices of uranium uh, increase dramatically. I think we're at about a 15. The prices increased true uh, neat trick they stole everybody's pensions by falsely claiming there was a a um, uranium rally where stocks were going up and now it's time to buy they promoted that post fukushima it was it's we still cover it today all these years later and so what happened a couple of years ago was a sprout physical uranium trust showed up and sprout was whole thing was like a vaporware company in one way. They showed up and bought all the physical uranium in Canada 
off the market. They didn't physically take possession of it. They owned it. They kept it where it was. And they created this artificial demand for the miners, which slightly raised the price of uranium stocks that from $30 were, had bottomed out post Fukushima. It now started to rise up a bit because it appeared like there was a demand. And they said it was from a new industry, new new uh, renaissance at nuclear with small modular reactors. And that now the price was going to go up because all these reactors are coming online. That's been going now for 13 years, that same story. And there's no closer or no hope in the future. Right? Because they all, all the investors abandoned new scale because they... They went to hell with their Ponzi scheme. So like you artificially inflated the price of uranium and now they're using it, the same song and dance at the sub-house committee in order to quantify there's a, a demand. This is completely artificial, dishonest, and it's what we the rhetoric has convinced people to invest in those stocks and they always crash, they lose their life savings. And that's how nuclear has been surviving for the last 13 years. It, it's so used to getting away with all of its crimes, it takes it for granted, the current generations. But now you got the old sawhorses, the old dinosaurs at the head of the food chain setting policies for everybody else. And these are the most dishonest, disingenuous, and dangerous these are terrorists. That's the only way to describe Wagner and Barrett. Your 16 year high for the These cost of terrorists. uranium. If that continues, that will also affect the economics of recycling. Okay, this thank you. And uh, Mr. White, um, social Kentucky terrorism. currently doesn't have nuclear power. So uh, I tell you, my area, Bowling Green, was one of the fastest growing cities in the South region, is going to be limited eventually because TVA is taking fossil fuels. Well, just get geothermal instead. Mr. Guthrie, Mr. Kentucky, get geothermal. Why would you look at nuclear? Why would you put nuclear on a pedestal with its absurd legacy of destroying everybody's health, the species, the food, the air, and the water? When is it enough? When is it too much? Where is the limit? Where do you put your foot down when every other generation has failed to? You got no choice. We got to put our foot down. We have long since tipped the scale against us. It's time to gut up and deal with it. Some generation has to. It's our watch. Haven't we grown up enough? This time to do something? Off the marketplace, they say they won't, but I can tell you we know for a fact our economic development people are concerned about just power in terms of, and I think the whole country needs to be concerned about that. We haven't had that issue for a while, but if we don't permit new sources, we're going to be limited to what we have. And so as, if, if we move to, so as a, as a representative of the ratepayers, as, as Kentucky, if it moves to nuclear, what are some of the costs that, that you know the ratepayers going to have to absorb? What do they need to be aware of in an economic sense, just to get started? Well, we, we've said many times that the ratepayers have paid and paid and paid and paid. And, and where I'm coming from there is the ratepayers pay for the original design of the, of the waste storage at the, at the nuclear power plants when they're constructed, the spent fuel pools that are mm -hmm. there. As, as the program, as the federal program failed to remove the waste, those spent fuel pools had to be reconfigured mm -hmm. in order to be able to take more waste. When those pools became full, Though the waste had to be removed and to a dry cast storage, the ratepayers paid for each step of that way, while also continuing to pay into the nuclear waste fund. So the ratepayers have paid multiple times for essentially the same thing. Okay, so I represent Paradise, which is in, famous in a John Prine song, but it was literally is where a coal company or a coal plant was taken out of out of official out of business, and and so the question that do you think it. it so, Mr. White, or any of you, that using areas that have already have energy infrastructure, but have been taken out of out of out of business, is a is a good way to start in terms of nuclear power. That give you a head start if you want to move forward with that. I don't know, if Dr. Wagner or Mr. White, or want to talk about. Yeah, that. I, well, I'll just say yes, absolutely. There's been a number of studies looking at repowering those coal sites, um, either ones that have retired or will be retiring uh, with advanced nuclear. 
I think it makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. Uh, just a couple of those reasons would be one, you've already got the the transmission distribution uh, infrastructure there. Generally, you have some sort of heat sink uh, for that system that was previously there, and you've got a community and a piece of land there that uh, that is favorable. Okay, Mr. White, do you have a comment on yes, that? Yes, uh, you know, the, energy, the, the communities that host these facilities are generally comfortable with them. You know, they, they, are, they are good neighbors. The, the nuclear power plants are, and the other energy facilities, including coal plants, they're good neighbors. And, and the communities are comfortable with them. So it, it makes a lot of sense to take advantage of not only that familiarity with the, with the uh, energy systems and energy production, but also the infrastructure that already is there in place. And so you don't have to start from scratch on a, on a greenfield site. Thank you. My time has expired. I apologize. I'm going back to health meeting, but I yield back, and I appreciate the time you guys have here. Appreciate the gentleman's questions. He yields back. I will now go to Ms. Castor for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses, and I really appreciate the engagement of our, our colleagues. It's a good bipartisan hearing. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, provided some new incentives for, for nuclear energy, uh, incentives for advanced nuclear deployment, and also the HALU. Uh, I heard Mr. Barrett say that uh, unless we find a solution for man managing the spent fuel in a reasonable and sustainable way, uh, we're not going to be able to, to predict any trajectory for advanced nuclear. Uh, Dr. Wagner. Look, uh, first off, if you're going to quote Lake Barrett, then you're, you're definitely missing the bigger picture. Lake Barrett, was in charge of the fuel in the Nautilus submarine 55 years ago, and he, he doesn't know what to do with it even today, right? Because that's what he told you. That was his assertions earlier. I've never seen a video not get above 20 views, 20 view, live viewers. I've never seen a video end up with 33 likes after how many hours? Four hours or something? I've never seen my, today the view would never pass 20. I know I've only been doing the show for a little over a decade, but you think I get a few more fucking people on my show? Come on, you scumbags that are censoring me. I'm so fucking cruel. Excuse the language. Oops, let's get back on track here. Do you agree with that? I don't know that I would say we're not going to be able to predict any trajectory. Uh, we are seeing new nuclear power be built, uh, Vogel Units 3 and 4. as a Come on, man, you can't use that. Two reactors in 30 years, and we're seeing a fucking nuclear renaissance. That's a nuclear renaissance, is it? Moron? Really? Two reactors in 30 years. That's, and it, so it's taken off, man. It's like, no pretty good over here nuclear. They're kicking ass. God, man, don't do me like that, okay? Case as well as uh, repurposing a coal site in Kemmer, Wyoming, and other things. So we are seeing nuclear move forward despite not having a national. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, there's two reactors in 30 years, nuclear's moving forward. Look, Mom, on TV program for the for the waste but it certainly is an impediment it certainly uh <laughs> look like dear. doesn't he look like something out of a horror fucking movie <clears throat> look at this creature he's like a does he got a fucking face mask on or something i'm sorry adds a lot of uncertainty like to any utility any community anywhere. any energy investor that would want to move forward with such a project and I've been um, trying to, to picture what this means in the real world in, in my neck of the woods in, in Florida. We have a, a decommissioned nuclear power plant about 90 miles north of the Tampa Bay area at Crystal River. And they have, um, they're doing dry cast storage. I guess they recently have uh, segmented the, the portion of the former reactor and fuel. And it is, it is sitting there. Uh, it's it's hard for me to to uh, conceptualize that this 
this spent fuel would travel out of the dry cask that's there to an interim storage facility or all the way to Yucca Mountain from, from, from Florida. Uh, what is your view for the future of that spent fuel in the dry cask there? Well, so there, by the way, there are about 20 uh, different sites in the country that uh, no longer have power generation but have these kinds of facilities like Crystal River and various stages of, of decommissioning the original plant. Some stages where all that's left is the spent fuel. Um, so they are uh, primarily, not all, but primarily in what is referred to as dual purpose canisters. And so what you've got is an internal steel canister that the spent nuclear fuel assemblies are within and that is placed in a, in a larger, typically concrete overpack uh, for shielding purposes. And so that they could, those canisters would be pulled out, put into a transportation type of overpack uh, and transported. So those systems that are, that are at Crystal River and are at other places, um, most of them, not all of them, but most of them uh, actually are designed to be transported to uh, a final repository. Okay. Mr. Baird, do you agree with that? Before we hear from Lakey, Yucca Mountain, it's Y-U-C-C-A, Yucca Mountain, not Yucca Mountain, it's Yucca Mountain. So why are they all calling it Yucca Mountain? I find that very confusing. Not all of them, but the majority of them. It looks like Lake's uh, Barrett started to trend. And everybody else just jumped on board. Oh, you're going head first off a cliff. I'm going to me next. That is it. Would it be uh, safe to just transport? We have right spent fuel stored at 75 different sites in 33 different states, including 23 sites that are no longer operating. Yes, ma'am. It, it, this is not a technical problem. The technology is there to safely transport these materials to wherever its destination would be. How would it? What's the scenario by by rail? Th those those okay. large canisters that most of them are today. We have four thousand, I think, almost forty one hundred of them um, stored. Those most are are dual purpose, meaning they can be the canisters are pulled out, put in a special NRC, you know, certified. Nuclear Electric Commission certified CAS and be safely transported. The French do have thousands of these shipments, and we can't go using the French for credibility, man. Look what they've done to the French Polynesian Islands for starters. The dust from the Sahara Desert is still friggin' radioactive. <clears throat> man, oh man, oh man, what are you gonna do with these people? It's so hard to get along with. 865,000 cancers in the first year. That doesn't matter. No, there's no harm. Gee, goodness graces me. Hang on, bear with me. Let's just talk about Fukushima so you can kind of wrap your mind around it. Irreversible heart damage for children with 50 beckles a kilogram, 50 atoms a kilogram. You put 200 million atoms on the head of a needle, you can't see it. How the freak are you supposed to know when 50 are there? 50 atoms a kilogram in adults lead to irreversible lesions in the vital organs. Well, that sounds like a party to me. Cancer or illnesses of Fukushima radiation five to 10 years is a disaster that's affecting the entire population of Japan. Oh, and worldwide. I guess you didn't notice about the radioactive fallout covered the entire planet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here was a study, and I'll bring up a corresponding video to go with this in a second. I just got to figure out where the hell I'm to. There you are. I take, I'm so glad to see you, Dana. I thought I got lost. <clears throat> I'm sorry, let me get back on track here. We can do this. We only got like an hour and something left to get through. This rate, we're never going to get it done, but... Ah, we come this far, might as well go the rest of the way. <coughs> okay, here we go. Um, Pre-Fukushima is one to two 
out of every million children had thyroid tumors. But there's clear evidence rates have risen. Before the disaster in 2011, the rate of thyroid cancer was between one and two cases in every million children. Right, and then move ahead to 2012, a year after, was 335.8% of the Fukushima children had thyroid tumors, which was 13,646 out of 40,000. Uh, nearly one in every three kids tested. And that the tumors were two centimeters or less, but the adult's thyroid gland is only three by five centimeters. So two centimeters is still huge for an adult, but for a child it's massive because the child's thyroid gland is so small. But instead of one in a million, or one to two per million, you had 358,000 out of a million children with tumors the size of the thyroid gland, which means that's an irradiated thyroid gland that's producing radioactive hormones. And that's going to be even worse for the species. This is a pediatrician, Helen Callicott, one of the most famous anti-nuclear activists on the entire friggin' planet. And she's going to tell you it looks like this, not, or it looks like the building over there instead of reactor four to your right when she was asked about it. But it's very important, so just bear with me. Let me ask you this. Uh, you've said that uh, if the spent fuel pool in number four collapses, that you would evacuate your family from Boston. Do you think we would ever know the truth of what's going on there? And the reason I ask is because we've seen coverage in the uh, national news media here in the United States from ABC News and others that uh, take video cameras in, saying that they're being given exclusive access to number four in the removal of the fuel rods, which is said to have begun. Uh, and, and what we see in the, the video being shared here in America is pristine, a pristine interior building. It doesn't look like a building in which the top blew off in a hydrogen explosion. The Japanese are very tidy people and they have by robot control and by human beings removed the debris from the top of building four and it does look pristine. But the building actually looks, he's asking her, does the building on the right, is that the real building or the building to the left? Because they're both the official pictures. And Helen Callicott, and she's done this many, many interviews where she says it looks like the building to the left. Ernie Gunderson does the same thing, but in a different way. Um, the Unit 4 was, um, uh, was damaged twice. It was damaged by, by a, all of the earthquakes that occurred. And it was also uh, damaged by a series of explosions over um, the first week or two of the of the accident. So the, the the building is structurally weakened. Now Tokyo Electric's acknowledged that they went in in uh, in May and June of last year. This is more than a year ago, and put an enormous number of extra structural supports directly under the fuel pool to keep the bottom of the pool from breaking through. <coughs> now. The problem with the story is the fuel pools are at the top of the building. There's no top to the building. Right, so the buildings were like this. This was a nuclear meltdown. The fuel pools are at the top of the building. They're, they're obviously gone. And I put his picture up there where the fuel pools are too from his video, right? So they put this contraption on top of it and then claimed that they were in getting fuel out of, the, out of the pool, like the picture to your left over here. And Arnie Gunnison is out there selling people wolf tickets. A study that they originally put out was kind of like what you're seeing today, where the U.S. government funded study, the West Coast and Hawaii residents are Fukushima downwinders, but the affected radiation exposures are expected to be beneficial, which was Dr. Raymond Gelmedi from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico, who also done studies on beagle dogs and beagle puppies. This is important for the story we're doing tonight anyway, because it's about plutonium. And the dogs in Hegel, a single one or two size monodispersal inhalations, which is a fraction of what we're talking about around 
from eating this stuff regularly. The lungs, the skeleton, and the liver has received the highest alpha doses. Out of the 144 dogs, tumors of the lungs, the skeleton, and the liver, all three tumors typically showed up in the animals. And, and this is uh, an important facet of this story that I'll get to in a minute. The bone tumors in 93 dogs of the 144, the most common cause of death. The lung tumors found in 46 dogs were the second most common cause of death. And the liver tumors, which were found in 20 dogs, were the cause of death in only two dogs, occurred later than the tumors in the bones and the lungs. And that the tumors in these three organs often occurred in the same animal and were competing causes of death. So you're being attacked from multiple places in your body from a single inhalation. Imagine consuming it, bioaccumulating it. And then these are orders of magnitudes larger we're talking about after this. <clears throat> these tumors in dogs suggest a similar dose-related biological effects in humans could be the same accidentally exposed to uranium or plutonium-239. But it was discovered that the human kidney was 50 times less efficient than the animal kidney at removing plutonium, which means the human is 50 times more vulnerable than the dog. And every dog died in every experiment. We were allowed to live with their lives, and they had competing cancers from a single exposure. So what's going to happen to your loved ones, your children, your grandparents, your heroes in your lives, if you let them do this to them. If you let them to continue to do it. <coughs> by the way, the curium isotopes are the major byproduct in irradiated fuel rods. As an isotope, not iodine, not cesium-137 or something like that, but curium. And curium isotopes need lead shielding 20 times thicker than you do for plutonium. So let's go back to that, those apologists and see what else they're trying to do to you and your loved ones here. We've done many of these shipments for 50 years safely. So that is not a problem technically at all. Where to take it to is our problem. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. White, what, did, what would that mean for cost for consumers? Ultimately, there are enormous costs for keeping these on site, but there are enormous costs uh, for transporting it. What, what's your view on that? Sure. In, in, in the long run, uh, by having a solution, by having a federal repository, it, it will reduce the cost overall. We're, we're, we're basically, without having that program, we're just going to continue to incur costs indefinitely. Okay. Um, does any, do you want to add? What's your view on the safe transport out uh, and the cost issue for, for consumers? Yes, I would concur with everything that's been said. Also, uh, it's important to note that the Navy is currently moving spent fuel without any problems whatsoever. And with reference to uh, commercial spent fuel, uh, I believe the DOE is moving forward with what's called the Atlas Rail Car to, uh, to move it safely. So all of those things are underway. Thank you very much. I yield back. Well, underway and resolved are two different things, and especially when it comes to nuclear. When they say it's underway, it means we're looking at it. Telling a lie is the only way they survived. They couldn't survive as long as they did if they didn't perpetually tell lies. Let me give you an example. <coughs> The people to your right are going to pretend that they're in the building to your left. And I haven't played this in this show today, so let me play this clip. This is just a fraction of the media done this trick, where they're pretending they're in the fuel pools, which is what we're talking about, fuel pools and reactor cores, which are at the top of the buildings, that they're going to tell, and I only got a short extract, because I made this video probably eight, nine years ago or something. It's very short, and it's worth your time. Where I'm standing is on top of what used to be reactor building number four. The whole of this building was blown apart by a huge explosion. We are here inside reactor four at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that was severely crippled during the earthquake and tsunami of 2011. Of the decommissioning work 
taking place here in Reactor 4. At the end of our tour, we were checked for radiation exposure. In four hours, I received the equivalent of less than a chest x-ray. 1,500 highly radioactive fuel rods inside this pool. They've got to move them outside of this reactor. Our cases are what? So you got ABC Cecilia Vega, who's currently in the press club at the White House with CBS and PB, B, PBC, is it PBS or something? You got Rupert Winfield Hayes, who not only pretended he was in Reactor 4 fuel pool, he also pretended he was in Reactor 3 fuel pool. We covered that. You got CBS Seth Dorn, which is a senator's son. A senator's son. Pretending they're in the fuel pool at Fukushima. And get this other creature, Anna Corinne with CNN. Doing, this is just a fraction of the media that pretended they were in the building. All the media pretended that they were in the building. But these actually went there, never went there, but went to a, because you have 70 reactors in the United States. 70 reactors, exact models, exact identical twin models. And so they just went to one of their plants with no issues with the plant uh, nuclear industry. Yeah, just come on down here, make your propaganda video. That's what we do. We are propaganda. That's the nuclear industry. Okay. Gentlemen, yields back. I now go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Baldison, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'll start with Mr. White. Mr. White, just last month, PJM Independent Market Monitor released a report estimating between 43 and 58 gigawatts of capacity are at risk of retirement by 2030. I believe it's important that we as a committee express concerns about policies such as EPA Section 111 rule that drive existing reliable generation off the grid. But I also believe it's important we look at all available reliable sources, including nuclear, that can be that can provide reliable energy for generations to come. But not in terms of improving the reliability of the grid and embracing advanced nuclear technologies. Why is solving the spent nuclear fuel problem once and for all so important? Well, you, you, you pretty much uh, answered the question in, in, in the way the question was posed. Um, we, we are facing a tremendous uh, increase in demand, electricity demand in this country. Uh, and as we are transitioning from uh, the traditional fossil fuel uh, over to other technologies, having uh, a baseload quality uh, generation that you get from nuclear is critical to that. It is emissions free. Um, it's not inexpensive. It's not emission free. It's very expensive. It's and then there is no small modular reactors. They're selling you wolf tickets. Generally yields back. I now go to the jump. Generally yields back. I now go to the jump. But. Uh, certainly, the the technology is 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 able to solve a lot of our problems in terms of maintaining reliability. And so Geothermal does the same thing. Compressed air storage does the same thing. Sand batteries does the same thing, where you heat the sand up. The same thing with volcanic rock, where you heat that up. And there's enough of it out there. You don't need to deal with lithium batteries. Is the worst way you can do stored energy, by the way. Compressed air, <coughs> where you dig mine shafts, you're doing it in, in a number of places, successfully in large capacities, where they're using compressed air, like mine shafts or physical containment, but just mine shafts at low pressure, because you put such a big volume there, you can drive your generators, see? They can be geared for anything. And um, then there's the water batteries. We have two major reservoirs built, and you just top it up. And you don't need to go to hell with it. You just need it for six to eight hours a day, right, for peak power. And the compressed air technologies, they have windmills at this, all they do is compress air, and you just dig mine shafts as deep as you want and compress air down there. And the heat from the compression can be saved in sand and then released up to 600 degrees or something and then released when you want to unpack the compress here to expand quickly and drive your generators. This technology is absolute technology. You can build it yourself. Anybody can. <clears throat> um, 
Just one second here now. Just one second there. There's Dr. Mengele, I mean, uh, Barrett, Lake Barrett, with your pretty blue eyes. But uh, certainly the, the technology is, is, is able to solve a lot of our problems in terms of maintaining reliability and security on the grid. Geothermal okay, could do thank it you. better. I'll do a follow-up with you also, sir. <clears throat> The problem would be solved if Congress and the executive branch implemented the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which is what, but there should be a way to develop bipartisan support for some practical reforms to restart this program, as I understand this committee has done in the past. You indicated, Mr. White, that your association has been at the table from the beginning and that you continue to believe that the ratepayers have a role to play for the management of used fuel from which they benefited. We've talked about this through the hearing. What more would you want this subcommittee to take away? What is needed for getting the program to work? Um, you know, a, a, one of the most important things from our perspective, obviously, is that the, the funds that have been dedicated to this be specifically dedicated to the program. Uh, it's, it's currently accruing more than a billion dollars a year in interest, and we believe that that's uh, funds that could be used to start up various um, efforts without needing to go back and restart the nuclear waste fund. It's our view that uh, that fund, there should be progress made towards the permanent repository before we even have a conversation about starting up the nuclear waste fund. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is to Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett, thank you for being here today. Um, the law establishes federal responsibility for the ultimate disposal of spent fuel. Even though the program is essentially dormant, federal responsibility remains the law. Mr. Barrett, could the Department of Energy undertake action today to address its responsibilities, such as working out agreements with the host state as envisioned in the law? And then I'll fo and follow up with that. And if the Department of Energy were serious about this, would this be something it could start doing to implement the law? Yes, the Secretary of Energy could take the initiative to engage with any host and work this, and Nevada would be the first place I hope she would speak to. I testified that, in fact, here five years ago in this committee, urging the Secretary to move forward with this. She is not. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wagner, I can't leave you out, and we have some time. Um, I'd like to discuss how we can enhance our commercial recycling capabilities. You note that changes to the existing regulatory framework for commercial recycling facilities may be needed, including updating Part 70. Can you expand on what changes you think would be beneficial to license nuclear fuel recycling so America can become a global leader in this space? So um, actually, I'm not terribly familiar with the details on that, um, so I'm not the best person to probably answer that question. But there are differences that need to be clarified between Part 70 and Part 50 in terms of licensing these facilities. Um, and then uh, much has already been written on that, but I can share that with you. Would the gentleman yield the balance of his time for a quick question? Yes, I yield my balance of my time. Thank you. Um, Mr. White. Can the money from the nuclear waste fund be used for transportation of the spent fuel from the commercial sites to a repository? I, I believe that that's part of the management, yes. Okay. That was just a clarification for me. Um, gentleman um, yields back, and I'll now recognize uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Fletcher, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we've been discussing throughout this morning, the United States uses nuclear fuel to power our economy and our national defense. Nuclear spent fuel policy has been a longstanding issue that Congress has failed to address adequately. I think that that has been made clear again this morning. Um, and even though Congress formally established the nation's nuclear waste policy with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which established the DOE program and objectives identified later at and objectives and later identified Yucca Mountain um, as the site for further study for the first national repository for spent nuclear fuel. Um, 
as we've discussed throughout the morning, uh, the progress on uh, the progress on Yucca Mountain has been stalled for more than a decade, and spent fuel continues to pile up at reactors across the country. It's now stored, as we've heard this morning, um, in 33 different states at 75 different sites, many of which are no longer operating. And recent court challenges uh, to the siting of interim storage facilities have made this ad hoc system for waste storage even more uncertain. Uh, a recent GAO report has recommended that Congress amend the NWPA to authorize new consent-based siting process and direct DOE to develop and implement an integrated waste management strategy. So I look forward to uh, discussing and hearing from you all how we can best update uh, the NWPA today. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your testimony so far because we've covered a lot of these topics. But I do want to um, follow up on a couple of things. And Mr. Barrett, in particular, in your testimony, um, you described the U.S. nuclear spent fuel waste program as non-functional and incapable of appropriately supporting the nation's crucial needs. Um, do you agree with the GAO's conclusion that additional siting authority is needed for interim storage? And what other authorizations are needed by DOE to update the NWPA? It's like you're camping, right? And your buddy brings his two outdoors dogs along with him, but they're not very house trained, right? You know, if you lay your stake down, it's gone. There's no way to get it back. That's what Lake Barrett is. He, he's one of those camp dogs. And they drag him out. I'm sure he makes a big chunk of change to show up here and do his Dr. Evil stuff. He's very good at it. He's completely without a conscience. He's been doing it so long, you know, say post Chernobyl or post Three Mile Island. Who knows what he was up to before that? I'm frightened to think because in 1955, he was dealing with the fuel from <clears throat> from one of the earliest submarine nuclear the first nuclear submarine they had. He's been around since the first nuclear sub dealing with the fuel. So you can imagine his level of evil. Right? He's a Jerry Thomas. He's a Rod Adams in overdrive. <clears throat> yeah, it's just... I, my mind gets blown by the perpetual evil. It's, they're so coordinated. And they know how bad this stuff is, and it doesn't mean nothing to them. It's like you throw them an extra $20,000. The system has to change. The uh, Department of Energy needs to do different things with host, state, host states. Consent-based siting is a good part of that and the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. Uh, as far as specific uh, statute change, uh, a lot can be done under the existing statute with congressional support. So, but there has to be a willingness of the Department of Energy or the Congress to get them or get some new organization to basically do their job as it relates to disposal. Well, and uh, Mr. Stetson. So he's saying there's no disposal scenario, which we are we know. But why do you need a disposal for? Because the fuel is still splitting atoms into the ecosystem. So it's in a reactor and it's splitting a lot of atoms to boil enough water for a million homes and businesses, right? It's a lot of water. So imagine how many atoms it takes to boil a cup of water. It's, the numbers are insane. But they're very deadly to humans and insects and birds and mammals and animals. But they're in a containment, Dana. That's true. You got me. Well, some of it can be burped out through the tourists, don't Right. There are ways they release a lot of it naturally into the environment legally that the population has no concept. They also have incinerators in every nuclear site, by the way, so you don't want to live within 100 miles of those disease factories, and they're typically surrounded by farms, which is even more nightmarish, because the fuel is in a pool, and it's still splitting the same atoms it was to power a million homes. Two years later, you're going to put another chunk of nuclear waste in that pool that's still splitting atoms. And this will go on for millions of years if you leave it. <clears throat> and what happens is every couple of years you're putting a lot more fuel, 16 months or something, putting more fuel into the pools that is now splitting atoms. So 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years later, those fuel pools are death machines. 
the amount of radiation being split by the, you know atoms splitting because you have all this fuel there and you're boiling off all this water and each liter is completely utterly saturated with isotopes anthropogenic man-made very harmful isotopes and emitters and gammas and betas and alphas and neutrons and you got a thousand fuel pools doing this fucking trick each day to your entire biosphere and oceans and fresh water supply and your communities and, and your wonderful ecosystem. Couldn't Fukushima was the tipping point. She went, oops, the reality goes, oops. And so you see all these supercell hurricanes, supercell cyclones, supercell typhoons. Well, you didn't see them pre-Fukushima. You see them post-Fukushima. Those forest fires you're seeing post-Fukushima, everywhere burning completely out of control is because you killed a lot of the bacteria and the fungus in the forest. And so the litter and the foliage doesn't break down. A few years later, you get a big lightning strike and these big, huge chunks that didn't normally exist because they would have broke down before you killed the ecosystem with fallout with full body x-rays and everything else to everything. Right? And so because you kill the ecosystem, you're creating these forest fires, but you're also creating, the reason forest fires are so crazy is because you have dry ground. And what does dry ground not do? It doesn't soak up water. So when you have rain, instead of being soaked up with all the biota in order to, you know, like if you're cooking, if you're cooking, um, if you're boiling uh, noodles and the water runs out, do you add a bit more water or do you just say, well, no, you know, I had it too high. It's still not ready. So, But yeah, you add more water, right? And that's what the ecosystem needs. It needs that bit of water for the whole biota to break down all that matter. And when you got rid of that, then you allowed the earth not to soak up water anymore. For starters, so the water, you have these flash floods all over the world showing up at the same time. And the die-offs of the whales and the seals and the mammals and the animals, my goodness. And we'll jump back on the video, but I want you to think about that, what we're talking about here, what's at stake. Is you had 10,000 gray whales, now they're going to spin it every way but ignore it. But if you go through my videos, you'll see clearly this was caused by the breaking of the food chain and that they tried to ignore but could no longer ignore. And I'm starting to admit it. You had 7,000 humpback whales, 10,000 gray whales, all showing up emaciated. You got all the sperm whales all over the world showing up where they shouldn't be, emaciated. You got the... Uh, a thousand covert beak whales that showed up in different stages of decomposition in the United Kingdom area where they don't belong. They're deep water divers. They don't hang out close to the continental shelves. Showing up emaciated in different stages of decomposition. So there was a die off over a long period of time. And if you find a thousand, it means 10,000 died in that same period. You see all the killer whales not having babies that survived for many years after Fukushima and all the whales showing up, killer whales, which has the biggest diversity of food, eats 360 species or something. It eats whatever it wants. It's a killer whale showing up emaciated. That's because they have leukemia because they're bathed in so much radiation in the oceans. It's not just the Pacific Ocean anymore. The stuff was circled the entire planet at in about 40 days and the plumes have never never went away so this model is plutonium 239 dispersal based on 20 days <coughs> 20 days of radioactive fallout Twenty days of radioactive fallout. Some bear with me. Okay. Yeah, the hoodwinking is really something. It's really spectacular. They're so used to 
doing whatever they like, they jeopardize the future of humanity, and now we're in real trouble. Fukushima plants 16,000 workers quit. These weren't workers. These were the homeless and the destitute and the victims of society. The immigrants don't speak the language. These, these weren't superheroes. This, this was a, a toxic nuclear wasteland, right? Inhaling just one hot particle can cause a cancer. So remember that, one hot particle, and these are all hot particles. So it's not just us, though. Whatever's happened to us is a thousand times more applicable to the birds and the insects and the mammals and the animals. We're at the top of the food chain, well, some of us. Boris Johnson swigging a can of peach juice, and therefore now everybody, he removed the restrictions for baby food and cereal. Two and a half years before we removed the restrictions of Fukushima food for the rest of the population. He removed it first for babies. Because you know about how a sick baby burdens down the family, right? And the loved ones and the aunts and the grandparents, they all try to help out. You tie the family up in miseries. Trying to do the best he can for their loved ones. Worst case scenario was abandoned Tokyo because it's not like a banana, not like a potato chip. It's not like walking in the sunshine. Think about this statement from the Japan Times column due to Fukushima meltdown because the radioactive fallout is actually real. So when you think about how bad was it worldwide, think about how bad it was Japan. As the public possibly worldwide sickens over time, public worldwide sickens over time, and that the heroes they're working there are not nuclear scientists. They're not nuclear academics. They're not working for <laughs> nuclear companies. They're the vulnerable, the most vulnerable of society that nobody seems to think matters because at that particular day, it's not their loved ones. It's not their friends. It's not their family. But don't make no mistake, it will be someday. In the first year in Japan, it was 200 or eight, 865,000 extra cancers in the first year. 865,000 extra cancers. Now, cancer, not everybody got health care. Not everybody was diagnosed. Uh, cancer is not the only thing from anthropogenic man-made radiation. Goodness, no. The system has to change. The uh, Department of Energy needs to do different things yeah, with host, state, host get states. Consent-based hey, siting get is a good part of that in the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. And, and uh, as far as specific uh, statute change, uh, a lot can be done under the existing statute with congressional support. So, but there has to be a willingness like, of there's a good excuse the Department right of Energy there or the to Congress to get them or get some new organization after the to trial, basically do of course. their job. That has an incentive not to be that fucking well, evil and, anymore. And Mr. Stetson, okay, I don't know sorry. if you want to weigh in on that, sorry. but I also uh, no, I notice, notice that in your testimony you mentioned successful policy that's developing in other uh, nations, including you, to... Finland and Canada. So maybe you could weigh Wait, in on what? that question and also what you think we should be looking at from other countries' successful programs including Finland and Canada. So maybe you could oh, weigh in on that question and also what you think we should be looking at from other Hang countries' on. successful programs um, when we're considering updating. The sure, happy to do that. Thank you for the question. I think uh, Finland is a great example of uh, how consent-based siting, how that process works. Uh, they've been very... So he, he does a pretty good imitation of Rod Adams. i got to give him credit. He couldn't even figure out how to work the microphone, but yet technically he's very proficient, right? The heralds will come and fix everything, Dana. Because that's, that's what that nuclear picture there, I wanted a nuclear hero at a nuclear accident site. And this is what it gave me. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'll take it. Not bad, uh, not bad at all. I guess it's learning off me, right? Uh, very good at working. The company in particular is named Posiva, and they have been uh, very good in terms of uh, working themselves into the, 
the basic fabric of the community. Many of the citizens there are work in the industry or their neighbors work in the industry, so they trust it. Uh, and ultimately, they're very involved. The community's been engaged. They answer their questions when they're <laughs> asked of them. They've ad they adapt. And the bottom line is that they are proud to have this facility in their neighborhood. Okay. Um, if I could add to yeah. that, Finland does not have states. It's a country of five million people. And if we had that here, we would be have a fully operating system right now today. But we he don't. scares mommy. Well, that's that true. That's about the size me. of um, Harris County, Mr. Chairman, uh, which you just visited this week. So certainly um, understand the challenges there. You need in depleted our, rating um, for that. Much larger system uh, with Can't many competing and challenging interests, and that's Warthog. one of the things I want to follow up on. Because Can't have a ten warthog ammunition if you don't have nuclear, Dana, and reprocess and gives you the best nuclear weapons. How many of them did he just give to Ukraine again? I know they're trying to dispose of 35 million rounds because they got better depleted uranium rounds to put in these things. All they shoot is dirty bombs, right? That's what that's that's all they're good for, dirty bombs. You protest all you want. Misery is the only thing they're really good at. Like, for the average person, nuclear escapes them, right? You know, I, I get that. But it doesn't escape what these people are up to. Also, in your testimony, um, Mr. Stetson, you recommended kind of revisiting the linkage between the consolidated interim storage and permanent disposal. So can you expand on that a little bit, on the interplay between each other and why both are, are necessary in the 30 seconds we have left? Uh, certainly. Well, I think we all agree that we need something long-term uh, permanent, but that's going to be many, many decades away. And you're going to need something for five million years, long term. <laughs> bloop, 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 bloop. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here we go. For the communities <laughs> such as those around Southern California and Songs, um, they just can't wait that long. They really need it out of there much sooner than many, many decades. Um, okay. Well, I don't know if anyone else wants to take 10 seconds to respond to that. and Otherwise, I will yield back. I guess I'll just add, add a couple of points. One is, uh, you know, we're having a lot of these conversations that have been have been going on for over a decade. The Blue Ribbon Commission report for America's Nuclear Future was uh, put out more than 10 years ago, and it addresses a lot of these things that we're talking about. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that. The other thing is, we do I'm actually need to yield back uh, to my chairman. Okay. So um, hopefully, someone else will let you finish that uh, additional thought. Charlie Thank you yields so much. back. I'll now go to Mr. Palmer for five minutes. So Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Minutes. Wagner, um, your testimony mentions recycling spent fuel, and that it could play a role in U.S. competitiveness with Russia and China. Um, uh, it could reduce our reliance on foreign sources for fuel. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> they don't have any reactors that can run on mixed oxide fuel first in America. They're talking about something theoretically 25 to 40 years down the road if it ever comes to fruition at all. No, they just come in and, and say, oh, you better do this, you better give it. Sky is going to fall if you don't give us this right now. you got to give it to us right now. Our life stops. And it's true, right? Yeah, so... Um... Life, but the part where life is going to stop because they've never... They have no incentive for some reason. They have no intentions of doing something decent, right? It's Which is the ugliest, insanest route we can take. What's the most dangerous thing we can do? Well, let's do that. Lake? Lake? Oh, sure, Mr. Wagner. 
the ability to, to recycle material is actually something, for example, that France supplies to, uh, to different countries, uh, including the UK and Japan. And so it is a, it, France it is does a, other countries a feature that, that some countries are very interested in, in having available to sure. them. So that's one example of, of how that would be a competitive advantage. Yeah, but it also would reduce our reliance on foreign sources for uh, the materials that we need to operate our, our n nuclear fleet. So that's a second example of where that's an advantage. Depending on on the details of how it's recycled and what and, and what the subsequent material um, is used in what kind of reactors, uh, it can reduce our reliance or, or, or increase our utilization of the, the uranium by anywhere from 30 percent to to nearly 90 percent. Um, when the, the associate laboratory director of the Idaho National Laboratory testified, I think it was back in April, uh, I asked him how long we could fuel our nuclear fleet with recycled uh, fuel and his response that we could provide electricity for all the, the entire United States for well over 100 years. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this because it's not, it's not only, only Astonishing that we could supply electricity for that long time, but that would substantially reduce uh, the storage uh -huh. requirements for spent fuel. It doesn't. Like 97% uh, of it is still waste. And it's gone through a chain reaction. They're, they're trying to reclaim the hot particles, the plutonium, uranium 235s, for military applications. That's the, like that's one of the bigger parts of the picture, because that's how they, they can't make the weapons without it, and they're having all kinds of problems. And they don't want to be for it. They don't want to come out and and say this is what we're doing. We need it for weapons. They're not going to do that, and to cook up some crazy f freaking story. And you know it's crazy because Lake Barrett is involved, right? So right right away that means it's going to be. Uh, correct. So that's Dr. Jess G. and he's our Associate Laboratory Director for Nuclear Science and Technology. And he went through a series of calculations based on the existing spent nuclear fuel <laughs> and um, in the amount of energy we're currently using and came up with the, with the conclusion that we could uh, power at least current energy needs of this, of this country for 100 years. And that's a pretty staggering amount of power. Now, that would require a lot of infrastructure and, and, and things to do that, but yes. I'm going to get to that awesome. in just a minute because there's one other point I want to make on, on recycling. Uh, France has shown that you can recover 96 percent of, of the remaining fuel. And no, I you think can't. The, in our um, 96 repositories, the fuel rods retain about 90 percent of their energy capacity. You can recover 96 percent of that. You can't. Like, when you put it through the chain reaction and do it through a cycle for 14, 18, 20 months, you're only using about 3% of the capacity, which means you've got to recycle it endlessly. But every time you do, you increase the toxicity of its isotopes. So once it goes through a chain reaction the first time, it's 2 billion times more toxic than industrial poison. And that's why we ban the food from 14 prefectures by 55 countries for a decade in Japan because there was so much radioactive fallout. And that's why you've seen all of these depictions <laughs> tonight because that's the reason. Fukushima is the reason you don't want nuclear and, and bores. But Fukushima is the reason you really don't want nuclear. Fukushima has made our lives just... We poisoned everything. And then you got Lake Barrett. Uh, looking good today, Lake. But there are other things that you could do with the remainder uh, in terms of uh, recycling for isotopes that could be used for a variety of purposes. Uh, for instance, in medicine. Uh, can you <laughs> comment on, on any? Hang on here. That that's that's wrong, man. You can't say stuff like that. That's that's a no no around here. Everybody knows you don't talk about nuclear medicine so called well, let me show you why though. It's called let's call up the therapy. 
Get a little eye opener here. <clears throat> Page and radiation therapy. Oh, why not? Let's let's just like I'm going to run you through a bunch of studies and um, just very quickly to set you up for the rest of the show. They got for us tonight. Introducing the radiation injury, another silent epidemic. Radiation injuries. You go to the hospital and you get a radiation injury to the visual pathways, you know, your eyeballs, right? To the heart. Oh, that sounds like fun. Cardiac injuries following treatment for breast cancer. Radiation induced. Don't forget, radiation induced kidney injuries. You're going to solve one problem and your life falls apart. Blood spinal cord barrier disruption, central nervous system radiation injuries, radiation induced lung injuries, radiation induced bowel injuries, severe radiation injury, lower gastrointestinal tracts, radiation induced kidney injuries, breast cancer litigation. Some of those stories are just unbelievable. Heartless. I don't know how to describe nuclear as heartless. Central nervous system radiation injuries, injuries to the cranial nerves, following, of all things, proton beam radiation therapy. How can you call being pounded with man-made anthropogenic high-level radiation that everything on the planet is afraid of, appropriately so because you have no autoimmune trigger to defend it against it, but a proton beam so say you got a tumor here, you might kill that tumor, but now you got a tumor everywhere else. Forever. Properties protects the lungs from radiation induced injuries. Radiation injuries to the head and the neck. The assessment of radiation induced brain injury, brain narcosis. I can show you videos, a testimony from radiation injuries that are just gut wrenching. Radiation-induced regional lung injuries, or small bowel radiation injuries. Oh, don't forget about radiation breast injuries, radiation-induced gastrointestinal syndromes, radiation-induced brain necrosis. The list is so long. I'm looking for my favorite. Oh, there it is. Radiation-induced rectal injuries. Ugh. Spinal cord recovery from radiation injuries to the hearts and the branches and the valves and the stems with radiation-induced bowel injuries. It comes at you, it destroys your whole ecosystem and your body because it's not natural. It's not from the solar system, it's not stardust. The other beneficial uh, So when he talks about uh, discoveries medical, or, or uses for products that could, that could be developed. Yes, there are a number of isotopes that are available if you're already kind of in the process of recycling. In fact, we purchase uh, some of those isotopes from Russia today. <laughs> they got an embargo against everything else except for their beloved nuclear. Uh, see, that's too much. This was streamed yesterday, by the way. <laughs> that warms my heart to see him... Other beneficial uh, I'll do that again. Uh, discoveries or, or uses for products that could that could be developed. Yes, there are a number of. There are other beneficial, beneficial, impaired wound healing after radiation and therapy. Radiation associated cancer risk among children children treated several decades after radiation therapy. Serious damage. Radiation-induced chronic arterial injuries, radiation, surgical treatment for intestinal radiation injuries. So radiation injures you more than it helps you. I think it's a 3% survival rate in North America and um, two point, no, yeah, no, in Australia and 2.3% in America. Isotopes that are available if you're already kind of in the process of recycling. In fact, we purchase right here, uh, right? some of those isotopes from Russia today um, that, uh, that come out of those processes that, that they're executing. And so, yes, there are a number of isotopes <laughs> that that is a desirable <laughs> way to do it. I would... <laughs> it's good. 
He knows that's exactly what they're doing is executing on what this stuff. Say that I don't believe the economics would drive you to recycling nuclear fuel for those isotopes, but if you had a nuclear fuel recycling infrastructure, then it's really incremental cost to recover and those that additional gets me isotopes. To my favorite part of this, and that is what makes France so interesting, is that the standardization of design for their reactors, and that's what we do with our nuclear submarine fleet, our nuclear uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, if we were to go really focused on, on small modular nuclear reactors, standard <laughs> design, built in fact. But there is no small modular nuclear reactors. So why, why are you talking about something that doesn't exist? Why are you talking about something that don't exist? Like small modular reactors. They don't exist. All nuclear is doing is this, is destroying everything. That's what nuclear does. That's all they seem to be any good at is destroying Free tested everything. in factory, uh, advanced capabilities for recycling. That they would be an exist. enormous advantage for There's us no on the energy side. There's no license into the regulatory also, agency. There's no licenses into the regulatory agency. Why are they all talking about small modular reactors? Why is all the focus on something that don't exist Instead of geothermal, why are, do they need to hog the entire uh, pig pen, I wonder? Uh, uh, in terms of the economics of recycling spent fuel, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. He'll agree with anything. There's nothing you can ask him will he agree with, he won't agree with, unless it's bad nuclear, anti-nuclear. Everything else, he's game on. Well, that's the direction I think we need to go, Mr. Chairman, is, and, and I think there's a lot of bipartisan agreement on this that, that, that we need to, to take a really aggressive stance on, on um, going to small modular reactors. Uh, they have zero emissions once they're set up and operational. But they don't exist. They've got no license into the regulatory agency. Why, why would you talk about this? It's, it's a complete fiction. So, like, they're not planning on coming up with solutions. They just want um, immunity from any of the previous crimes. And they want to be put on a pedestal. They want all kinds of money thrown to them for something. They already have $50 billion sitting there. Some of the stuff they spent, and they got an IOU sitting there. Why? Why do they have to make the planet toxic? Why don't they come up with a solution? Why does it have to be in a community a c with consent base, which means a referendum per se, when they won't, if, if it was so clean and green, they would put it in their own backyards, gardens. And so the idea is that they don't want a solution. Everything is splitting atoms into the environment. They'll operate for 60 to 80 years, depending on, on what we build, uh, it's almost plug and play in terms of our uh, uh, where you can put them. It's simply not true. You can't build them, put them on trucks. There's no factories out there. There's no supply network. There's no designs into the regulatory agencies. Why would you put all your apples in a basket for something that doesn't exist? Everybody there is framing the narrative exactly the same way. He's taking it bluntly boldly out into the front and just being unreasonable and suggesting that they need to look at small modular reactors when they don't even exist. And, and then the other advantage here that we've just discussed is how we dispose of spent fuel. With well, that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yells. How do you dispose of the spent fuel pool, fuel, which they, they don't have any to know how it's going to react. They don't have any to make any assumptions off. They don't have a product. Same as New Scale small modular reactor was on the stock market taking money from investors, but it didn't even have a product or an application even into the regulatory agency for a license. And it's just full on, just who cares, right? Let's just, here's my story, now give me what I want. Okay, here, here, here you go, ha, have a nice day. And we'll put out a, a few hour video and we'll explain it all the way and we'll do it again for the next time.
back, I'll now go to Ms. Custer, uh, who is retiring from Congress, I heard, and uh, has been a valuable member of this committee. So uh, thank you for your service. You're recognized for five minutes. Well, dear, you can imagine she's getting a big payday on the way out the gate, so this should be a doozy. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for your kind words, and thank you to Ranking Member get for this important hearing. As we heard from the testimony today, the United States must address our long-term nuclear storage challenge, both to safely store spent nuclear fuel, fuel from retired and currently operating nuclear generators and to enable the deployment of next generation nuclear power plants, as my colleague just mentioned. In New Hampshire, spent nuclear fuel from the Seabrook nuclear power plant sits in dry storage near the facility. Not all dry of storage it. facilities ensure that no radiation or radioactive materials are released from spent fuel, protecting people and the environment in our beautiful state. While the spent fuel in New Hampshire is being safely and securely stored for the time being, we need a long-term solution for the spent fuel from Seabrook and sites all across the country, as you've discussed today. The safest way to store spent nuclear fuel, as I understand it, is deep geologic repositories, or DGBs. These facilities place spent nuclear fuel in robust, leak-tight containers buried hundreds of feet below the ground in a stable geologic environment. DGBs are built with multiple layers of protection to keep the waste secure. As we've seen in the United Absolute States, betrayal, building DB DGBs presents many challenges. Well, the first and, biggest one is you don't have one. There's neither one that exists. They, they don't actually have one. They can't make any of these assertions, these dangerous assertions. They can't put the future of everybody and humanity on their heels, right? You know what I mean? Because they're disarming the humanity from having a future by taking up these policies of reactors that don't exist and won't exist because last year there was 507 gigawatts of renewables, for goodness sakes. That's going to at least be 50% more next year and then maybe double the year after and the only reason things slowing it down is they increased the artificial inf inflation from the staged Ukrainian pl uh, uranium war. I'm sorry, Ukraine and Russia war, which is not a war, it's a drone war. Where they chase people down to conscripts, they jack off the streets with drones. It's easy to dodge a bullet, typically. It's a 50-50 chance of miss getting missed. But how do you dodge a drone, a little drone with a bomb on it, that when it gets close to you, blows up? How do you dodge that? How do you call that a war? I put out a video when that started, right? And I said that Zelensky should surrender before Russia comes in there and flattens the country. And what did Russia do? What the help of Zelensky flatten the country? And NATO? What the hell, NATO? NATO should have been disbanded when the Soviet Union was. That's what they were built for. Instead, look up NATO, it says 30 militaries. Keep the waste secure. As we've seen in the United States, building DB GGBs presents many challenges, and the communities where they're located must be properly consulted, as you know, and brought in on long-term storage projects. Consent-based siting for DGBs is a tall task, but we know it can be done. This coming year, Finland plans to open the first DGB at Onkalo. Um, this is for Mr. Stetson or for anyone else that would like to respond. Could you please speak to what lessons the U.S. should learn from Finland's experience building the Onkalo storage facility, if you're familiar with it? It's a hole in the ground with a bunch of cement. And we're going to put it there and leave it there in a few years, 100 years at most, it'll melt down. Eventually it'll burn a hole back in the earth. Keep the waste secure. As we've seen in the United States, building DB GGBs presents many challenges. And the communities where they're located must be properly consulted. The consent approach, right? Because if they go somewhere else rather than your farmland and put it where there's nobody, there's nobody's going to complain. 
and so they do that with everything else, but they're not going to do it with nuclear for some reason. Uh, thank you. As I mentioned earlier, I think uh, Finland's a great example of consent-based siting, how that whole process worked, and how they were able to develop trust within the local community by working with the community to, number one, address their concerns to, and to listen to them, to really build with them. And and tell them it was like a banana and a potato chip and walking in the sunshine. And really, to, as much as anything, to be a partner in the whole plane. process so that the citizens there like, continue and want to be proud and really want... Want to be proud of having a nuclear under their ocean right helpful. next to Long oh, Thanks to the DBG, Finland can confidently build new nuclear facilities with the knowledge that there's a long-term solution for spent nuclear fuel. That's fuel. a low blow, and, uh, man. All these decades later, and then that now quantifies more nuclear. My goodness. More of this. Endless bags, millions and millions and millions and millions of bags of radiation. That's what Japan. That would go a long way toward addressing concerns Scumbag around Japan. our changing climate and, and carbon pollution. Um, again, Mr. Stetson already... And carbon pollution, we already debunked that earlier. There's currently 0.04% of the atmosphere is carbon. If it gets below 0.02, plant life dies off. There's barely enough there to sustain Earth because of the perpetual um, emissions from... 80 years of nuclear waste. Into that would go a long system. way toward addressing concerns around our changing climate and, and carbon pollution. Um, again, Mr. Stetson or anyone else who would like to respond, can you speak to how this long-term certainty for spent nuclear fuel will help Finland achieve its clean power goals? Uh, certainly. Uh, I think Mr. Barrett wanted to uh, or Mr. Barrett, chime wanted in there first. Oh, Finland is a, is, is a different situation we have. The science and technology in Finland and what we do in the United States is virtually identical. We work with the Finns for decades and they worked with us. So the, the technology of it is, is fairly straightforward and fairly simple. The, the, the siting of the facility is where the challenge is for us, and it's easy for them, very cohesive society, very monolithic, and, and not a problem, okay? Here, it is much more of a challenge. We were open and transparent and tried to bring in the Nevada uh, situation. Mm -hmm. We were very successful at the local level with Nye County. It was not, would not work with the state of Nevada because they were still vehemently upset about the 87 Amendment, and we could never make that bridge. So, so if we go forward another repository, I think we could. But we have this trust and confidence that is the federal government going to do what it says it's going to do? Yeah. Uh, if we can solve that, we're there, okay? And we can accommodate all the advanced technologies that, that may be coming forward, which can be great. It will assist, it will help, can reduce the costs, can help us with energy. But we've got to fundamentally address this long-term problem to support the new nuclear energy that we need in this country desperately. And, and we What's have to interesting, um, and you can see it on our committee, but you can certainly see it in c Congress as a whole, there is a pretty profound shift among uh, members who previously may have been more anti-nuclear, uh, but given the carbon-free aspect of nuclear energy and some of these technical advancements with the smaller facilities may be leaning more toward a, an approach and thinking that if we can solve some of the issues around storage, we will get closer to this um, clean power goals. So I think, I think we should take advantage of that shift. Yes, ma'am, we, sh we should. There's much, there's much better environment today than it was in the past, but we still have to address this issue. The trust issue, sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you, and thank you to our chair, and I will yield back. Chairman Lee, it's time to expire, and uh, now I'll go to Mr. Fluger for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, witnesses being here. A lot of the questions um, have been answered. I, I want to just kind of start more broadly on establishing a couple of uh, facts that, according to, uh, you know, not only your testimony, but just your experience in this industry. Um, number one, I mean, how much more nuclear power are we going to need? How much more nuclear power we're going to need? Oh, you're going to love that one. 
How much more dis misery machine disease factories do we need? I wonder. Thirty million. <laughs> Because it's interesting, right? This represents one out of 150,000 sites of Fukushima. That's what that would represent. It's not a real picture. I got tons of real pictures, but for my own amusement, I got these pictures today. 30 million one ton bags of radiation. 30 million. 30 million. This is only a fraction, obviously, right, in that representation. That's the future of humanity. There is none. This country in the next 10 years, and I'm going to just start down the line. And well, I'll cite a couple of things. Any idea of survey of existing nuclear utility is an estimate about another 100 gigawatts by 2050. The Department of Energy <laughs> has recently published a study suggesting somewhere on the order of 200 gigawatts additional by 2050. <laughs> For reference, we currently have about between 95 and 100 gigawatts. Okay, so we're doubling, <laughs> maybe doubling or tripling. Maybe tripling, yeah. Mr. Baird. Yes, I, I, I fully agree to meet our international commitments that we've made. Uh, yes, it has to. Uh, 200 gigawatts. Just let's talk about that for one second here. Because I just can't let that one go, right? <clears throat> let me bring up the calculator. Because why not? I haven't cracked 20 viewers in five hours or something. 200 gigawatts. Divided by... Point eight nine per reactor. That's the average. It's two hundred twenty-four. So we're talking about twenty fifty. So let's divide it by twenty-nine years. Or sorry, this is twenty-six. So twenty-four years. Divide it by twenty-four. A little slow today. Well, is they got to get nine reactors a year up and running right now to pull it off. But it doesn't work that way either because you want them finished. You want them finished by 2050, right? So in order to get them finished by 2050, just let me do that one more time. So 224 reactors to get 200 gigawatts. And you got, you got to have them all up and running or you got to start building them all by at least 10 years before you want the last one to come in and join the grid, right? Which means you got to have them all started uh, in the first 14 years. Okay. So let's divide that by 14 years. And that means you got to get 16 reactors up and running each year to pull off a... Now, first off, it takes four to five years to train the average the worker, which is the bulk of the workers, to do the jobs on the sites. So you look, you you need a big thing. Now you need you, like for sixteen reactors, you need the best of everything: the best cement, the best wiring, the best piping, the best insulators, the best, the best, and everything is triply inspected. <laughs> let's let's multiply that. But a typical price of a reactor, say seventeen billion dollars. Seventeen billion dollars equals. So they got to dump two hundred and seventy-two billion dollars a year. Each year. To pull it off. In fourteen years. And it's going to cost times 14 is 3.8 trillion. Well, totally doable. <laughs> uh, 
and 3.8 trillion divided by 4 million megawatt for geothermal. Did I, I said 4,000, did I? Oh. How did I ever screw that one up? Well, I did, that's all that matters. Let me do a recap on it. 272. It's worth it, just bear with me. Or, I'm sorry, 3.8 trillion. I screwed that up. I just want to see the number. 3.8 trillion. So that's million, billion, trillion. 3.8 trillion. Divide that by 4 million. I get it right this time. That's megawatts of geothermal. Divide that by a thousand to get gigawatts. I, I probably made a mistake there, I think. 950, no, that's obviously wrong. So it'd probably be 95,000 megawatts or gigawatts. That doesn't sound right either. I screwed up today, did I? I'm not really qualified to get, quantify get right the back. amount, but I, I know as we move more towards an electrical system where we're using electrical cars and all of these, we're certainly going to need additional sources of energy. And, and as I've noted earlier, we are, we are projecting record demand, uh, and not, not a little bit. We're, we're talking about significant increases in electricity demand in this country. The characteristics of nuclear power being reliable and emissions-free should put it at the top. Dispatchable power, we talk about the, uh, on this subcommittee quite a bit. Um, and I'll just go back down the line. D do you think that in order to get to that doubling or tripling and whatever the estimates are, it sounds like everybody's in agreement that we're going to need a lot more. Um, are we going to have to have a permanent repository in order to then start building that capacity out? We've talked a lot about community trust and public trust. And, and I think until you have that kind of a program underway with, with clear uh, advancements going on, you're going to be having challenges in community trust. Mm -hmm. I would concur in that you need both the interim and the long term. Okay. Mr. Barrett? Yes, we need a program. We may not have to have a, an operating repository to start building. We should not wait that long. Okay. But we need to have a legitimate program that's going to solve this problem that people can trust. Uh, I concur with that. Okay. I, I, I uh, represent the Permian Basin. The Andrews Interim Storage uh, Facility is, is part of that. So I've been involved in that, talked with uh, some of you over the, the last couple of years. Um, in this consent-based model, uh, actually, you know, agree with what Mr. Peters said earlier, um, that uh, that's, we have to have that consent-based model, especially when it's relating to the movement. Um, and uh, on the flip side of that, you know, we, we had a facility, and it's um, very interested in any further comments on, you know, what's it going to take to gain that public trust back? Um, and if Yucca Mountain is not it, then where is it? Well, and, and that, that's a, a key point. Anywhere you want to put you know, it. Building any kind of... Like, any, anywhere you want to put it. Why does Yucca Mountain... Why is Yucca Mountain the only place? Right? Why, why is Yucca Mountain the only solution? Because that's what they all done. This is consistent. <laughs> it's like... Why are they so fixated on Yucca Mountain, I wonder? Of energy infrastructure is a challenge is a these days. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what that technology is, whether it's just a substation or whatever. You're going to have challenges with that. And uh, as a result, we need to make sure that the law is clear. Um, there was a, a decision recently, I think it was in the Fifth Circuit Court, that uh, deemed that uh, a consent-based repository, a interim storage facility could not move forward. That is contradictory to where this country needs to go, and so it should be examined. 
Well, I think two things. Number one, it has to be safe wherever it's stored. And number two, there has to be a short and long-term value proposition for the community that's going to be hosting it. Um, otherwise, Why does it need to be in the community? Why do you need to put nuclear waste in a community? What's up? What's up? Why is it? It's of no value, really, to them to uh, to step up and and uh, and host it. And I, and I would say, why not put it somewhere where there's no conflict with humans or fresh water or the ecosystem? And they got lots of places to do it. You have the authority. Why does it have to be Yucca Mountain or nothing? What do you mean nothing? The sol you know, you got to come up with a solution. They're obligated, right? So saying no, the only solution is Utah Mountain, but Utah Mountain's been closed down for 14 years because of earthquake zones. Why is it? It's of no value, really, to them to uh, to step up and and uh, and host it. Disgusting. And I, and I would say a critical part of that is the federal government has to have a credible geological disposal program. Um, the secretary needs to step out or somebody needs to step out and do something and engage and find a place, which we don't have. There's not a lot to add to that. We need Again, right? They're doing this game where you want to let us have your commitment, so we're not doing anything. Here's $50 billion. No, we're not doing nothing unless it's your commitment. Yeah, but here's $50 billion. Get the job done, stupid. I won't tell you... Yucca Mountain was the only solution. It's, it's on, it's, it's a, I feel like you fell off a cliff and you woke up in another freaking planet where everybody is an idiot, an actual idiot. We need a credible, durable program for this, which we don't currently have. You got 5,000 academics working for you at Los Alamos National Laboratory. You can't put a couple of them on the fucking job? It just strikes me as uh, part of our energy strategy, which I'm not sure that we actually have a national energy security strategy, um, that, that we would discuss these things, that we would restore the public trust, that we would come up with these. That's your job, moron. That's why you're there, isn't it? To come up with solutions. Well, we ain't got you come out and <laughs> I don't know what to do. Do you know what to do? You got five minutes. You know what to do? You got five minutes. Uh, solutions what in order to get to that doubling or tripling uh, of capacity. So, I'm sure um, they're all nice people. Mr. Chairman, I'll give 20 seconds back to the uh, committee. Yield back. Appreciate the gentleman yielding back. I'll now go to Mr. Gordon. Mr. Sarbanes for five minutes. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Um, He's up this is my 18th year here. and. Yeah. Among all the topics that I've had the opportunity to get educated on, this has been one of the most challenging, interesting, and one that has evolved substantially uh, over that period of time. So whenever I'm in these hearings on this topic... Who'd you get, who'd you get a loan to suit off, I wonder? We'll see lots of that. Well, we won't, but the future will see lots of that <laughs> at nuclear sites worldwide, except there won't be any insects. I'm trying to be as um, educated as I possibly can, so thanks for the information that you're, uh, you're bringing forward. Um, I'm certainly, like my colleagues, invested in a solution to this challenge of st storing the spent nuclear fuel. Um, it's a reality. We're going to have to face it, given the significant role that I think there's an emerging consensus around now that nuclear power. Uh, like the reason you need to store it is because it's splitting atoms. So they don't. They 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 are pretending they don't know, or they actually don't know. And Lake Barrett ain't going to be telling them. And Wagner from Los Alamos National Laboratory ain't going to be telling them. This is everybody's future right here, a lot. Picking up one-ton bags of radiation. Uh, is going to play and is These playing guys. in our domestic energy 
uh, production portfolio. Um, and I know that many of my colleagues with reactors in their districts and states are concerned about the safety, portfolio. obviously the long-term impact of storing nuclear waste at these facilities. Is it hemorrhages into the ecosystem? That's the long-term effect, right? At some point, the aliens will come down and say, hey, this is a pretty good spot. We've got to clean it up. We don't have to worry about the stupid humans and animals. They're gone. Let's clean her up and we'll settle down here. As we're looking for permanent solutions. Uh, Mr. Stetson, in your testimony... 80 years and no permanent solution. The song and dance is frightening to me. 80 years and no pollution or no solution. Hey, um, I know you shared that you had participated in stakeholder uh, discussions to determine policy priorities that would create a more durable and integrated spent fuel program. But you've been at it for 80 years. Lake Barrett fuel the first nuclear submarine you have. And he's sitting there in front of you trying to act like a human. My mind is absolutely boggled that it got to this stage. Based on that discussion, I, I know you'll probably be repeating yourself a little bit, uh, and based on your own experiences, what are the kinds of resources that are going to be needed to support the communities surrounding these nuclear reactors that um, currently act as interim holders of spent nuclear waste? What does that resource picture actually look like in your judgment? <laughs> Uh, number one, I think that uh, a safety net uh, revolving around the safe uh, storage of the spent fuel. Uh, also, uh, I think it really needs to have a, a robust communication system so that the general community really understands what's there and so that they can really have uh, an intelligent understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's not the kind of fear of the unknown. They've got enough information to process. That's correct. I, I think it's very important to let the data speak and yep. that you have experts, such as the gentleman here, uh, putting out the information so that there's something that they can trust and depend on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we're all focused on a path forward um, that reassures communities where the spent nuclear waste is temporarily being held ensures an effective strategy with community input for selecting the long-term waste storage sites and guarantees safety in transporting and storing spent nuclear waste for such long-term disposal those are sort of kind of framework dimensions of well what you got to do is stop getting all these amateurs and get people in there that wants to come up with solutions right you got all the, like everybody there except for Lake and his cohorts, are experts. Everybody or everybody else is not. So you got Lake Bird's an expert. Um, Weber's a... We got four, this is four experts sitting there for, t for witnesses. And these are the industry, the deep state industry. And their entire legacy is destruction. Nothing but incredible harm to the ecosystem and to the humans. And a legacy that's gonna be long, long past us. This legacy is not going away. Nuclear waste is not going away. They'll be long gone, but the nuclear waste will be here thousands of years down the road because you couldn't get past the uh, we, uh We move ahead. Um, we know from the history, we've heard a lot about it here today, that finding a long-term site um, that everyone can agree on is a challenge. Um, obviously, um, I think it's commendable that the Biden administration and DOE um, have advanced these recommendations on a consent-based siting process for spent fuel storage and disposal facilities, um, which is a process where, as you know, communities can decide after each phase in the process whether they're willing to move on to the next phase. Um, so, Mr. Setson, again, 
What assurances can Congress and the Department of Energy provide to support a community that is proposed as a long-term site and encourage it to continue through the consent-based siting process? I mean, it is a process. There is a kind of um, hand-holding dimension, I guess, to it in some ways as people move from one stage to the next. What's that look like, again, in practical terms from your standpoint? Well, I think that they have to be assured that the process is going to continue to move forward, that it just doesn't continue to stall and uh, continue with more and more meetings and hearings with right. really no right. real progress moving forward. They really need to see something happen. And they also need to see some demonstrated competence uh, in that there's actually something ha is happening and that the government performs uh, and, and continues to step up and every time is able to, to deliver. Right. Very good points. I think certainty is always welcome um, in any community on any uh, tough issues so they can kind of see what what it looks like and trust which is I think the second thing you're basically mm. alluding to which comes from good information expertise and data and other things that can be brought into the into the equation thank you for thank you very much everything but the facts the only thing they're interested in is everything but the facts right I I think it's stunning that here you are almost 80 years down the road and you got no choice to sit there and suck it up, let them come there and do whatever they want yesterday and walk away with nobody to counter them, no, no conversations, no debates. No debate whatsoever allowed and everybody has to do the song and dance and who's running the show in the background? Because they're not sitting there, right? Aren't you sick of nuclear yet? Why are you waiting for nuclear fallout to kill you? Is the Very much I yield back. Chairman yields back per committee rules. Members that waved on will be at the end, so I'll now go to Mr. Cardenas for five minutes. Next, five minutes. Thank you very five much. <coughs> minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a very, very important issue, and uh, some people will have come and gone out of Congress, and still we haven't made progress. I'll be leaving soon myself, so I'll be one of those, it sounds like. Um, today, our nation has 93 operating commercial nuclear reactors. I just asked my staff, how many of those are privately owned and how much of those are owned by the government? The majority Do of any of you have an idea? They're, they're all privately uh, held, and actually with Vogel Unit 4 coming online, we now have 94. And all of these privately, privately owned uh, uh, nuclear reactor facilities, they generate... Because... You know, if something goes wrong, then they blame it on them instead of the nuclear industry. They don't want to take the blame. Something will go Great. wrong. Great uh, income for those privately owned companies? It's all subsidies. Yes, there's a number of different utility models, but yes. Okay. Um, it it's seemed. He wasn't asking for a yes or no. He was asking for an example. They're like, oh, they're not going to give us examples. How much of their profits did he spend on them 30 million one-ton bags of radi for radiation is the question I got. It's really answer. interesting that we have a... Uh, yeah, maybe, ahead, maybe you know, for example, we should question TVA. So maybe sure. I'll, I'll yield over here. Tennessee Valley Authority, go ahead. Well, TVA is, is not private. That's government. But, I mean, the majority of them are private. Yes. There's 93. The majority are private. Yeah, the majority yeah. of, by far. But yes, private sorry. or publicly owned, the, the nuclear waste is an issue... <laughs> For the country. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to get that on the record because I'm not sure how often that's pointed out to the public <laughs> and the taxpayers because it sounds like um, <laughs> we're trying to figure out a public-private partnership at the end of the day as to me? how nice to yeah. deal with this very volatile byproduct of these nuclear reactors. Oh, I um, spoke too soon. Is, um, I got some funny looks. Any, anybody disagree with that? No, no, we, we, we have to here. have a process. And now the, 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 the private, most of the ownership of the material is private, but there's a contract with the government oh, exactly. to, take the, to take the waste for its ultimate disposition. Exactly. And they've and when, aid has been pointed and out. When was that contract initiated? When about? About 1983. 1983. Um, and it seems that that came about because it was becoming an evolving, non-answered solution 
for the people of the country, right? This country debated all through up to 10 years before 1982 is what our path forward. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 82 set the path forward that the waste generators, which are mostly private, mm -hmm. would pay for the disposal. The federal government, DOE specifically, would have a special organization to use those dedicated funds from the ratepayers to solve the ultimate disposal. So it was a government is responsible to deliver to the nation. And that has broken down politically for the last 14 years. Yeah, I think at the root of that breakdown is this radioactive byproduct from these reactors lasts about how long its potential negative effects, if it is, if it leaks, if it, if it gets out into our water streams, et cetera. Thousands of years, but we have the technology to <laughs> temporarily store it safely and no, to eventually don't. dispose of it safely. That technology exists. What's broken down is where are we going to do that? It, absolutely. And that's why we have a democracy. I think communities across America said, literally, not in my backyard. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that's one of the root fundamental issues here. And so what, what, are, the, what are the cause and effects to, uh, um, Mr. Barrett, what are the cause and effects, potential cause effects, health-wise, to uh, communities and or individuals that could be exposed should there be an accidental leak, should it not be 100% contained? The risk to the people who live by any of these facilities, be they the current ones or be they ones in the future, is very, very low. They, these are all- No, no, no I'm, I'm asking what, what the byproduct of the cause and effect to, to, the, to the people if there was an accident, a leak, if it were to get into their water stream, how would it affect the environment that ultimately could it have a negative health effect on the people? There's no credit, in my opinion, there's no credible situation that could cause that. Now, a, a meteorite could come out of the sky and blow something up, and yes, there could be, but the consequences. First off, all I got to do is lose external power. So a tornado or a Jericho or a hurricane, and these hurricanes post Fukushima are 900 miles void. You lose external power or you flood the site and... You know, it's running on external power. But uh, these are all reactors. They're running at very high temperatures because they're trying to keep up the percentage. And so these reactors are very brittle from the neutron bombardment. So they're at 1,000, 2,000 pounds per square inch. And if you're pushing them hard as they get become more brittle from the interaction with the neutrons, the gammas, the better raised uh, alpha burst, then you end up with eventually an event. Let me keep going here. The nuclear biological aspect on the pub on the public is minuscule. Of course, that's simply not true. All nuclear reactors are hemorrhaging antipogenic isotopes from the fuel pools. All of them. Right. All nuclear power plants are hemorrhaging radiation because when you take the fuel out of the reactor core and put it in a pool, there's no containment, it's still splitting the atoms. That's what nuclear waste is bad because it's still splitting atoms. And so for Lake Barrett, Lake Barrett, it's just, there's Lake, this Lake when he's uh, not at work. But he's literally a dragon. Yeah, he looks like a dragon too, I know. But he's actually a dragon. On all of these situations. Okay, you call it minuscule. But what is the health effect if somebody comes into contact or a community is, is exposed to this radioactive material? The, the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest consequence is going to be a psychological one, as we saw from the accidents at Three Mile Island or in Fukushima. The true impacts were, from radiological were very minimal and, and virtually non-existent. The psychological impact of those things were huge. So the, the, Ameri the impact of some accident, assuming there was a major accident, uh, would be basically psychological, in my opinion. It, so it sounds like you're leaning on if it... Now, that's really offensive to say that it's psychological, right? That's, 
surreal that somebody would say something like that. All the dogs died in all the studies. What's psychological about that, I wonder? <clears throat> so that study that we're just looking at of all the dogs died, because we covered that earlier, was done by Loveless Respiratory Research Institute, which said that Fukushima would, effects would be beneficial. But there is no beneficial anthropogenic man-made radiation. Child's risk of cancer from radiation, 10 to 100 times higher than an adult, is actually 100 to 1,000 times higher because they're, they're uh, developing, right? So their stem cells are very active and they become radiated from the betas, the strontiums, the uranium, plutoniums in their bones. But the gamma radiates their bones too, see? Six in ten Fukushima children with diabetes. Forty-five percent of the kids in Fukushima had thyroid exposures, up to fifty thousand microsievers, eight hundred sixty-five thousand extra cancers. The food was banned by fifty-five countries, fourteen prefectures for over a decade. So to suggest what they were suggesting dishonestly, tree fell in the woods and nobody heard it. Right. Then it didn't fall. What do you mean that on those incidents there are no verifiable cause and effects to the, whether it be human species, other species, from those accidents? And see, that's a great, that's a really great point. Where's the evidence that there's a cause and effect? So all he says, uh, Lake Barrett in reply, is he, in my opinion, there's no effects. It's psychological. That's what he says, right? But there's no one dare to challenge that narrative. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> Must be five hours now or something. Hang on, hang on though. Let's challenge some of those, some of those assertions because I'll be remiss if I don't. And I'll be ashamed of myself if I don't because I happen to be capable of challenging those assertions. And the only thing is how far down the, the rabbit hole do you really want to go, right? So I got a better way. Hang on. Oh, I can do Chernobyl Fuller. I'm not going to do that today. There we go. This is short, if there's such a thing as short when it comes to me. Because it takes information to... Like, I think of everybody as a, as an operating system. Without, you're the, the guts of an operating system, but you don't have the operating system... As for the new people when they're coming by. And so what I like to do is give them the picture so they have an operating system. And then they can extrapolate on their own. The influences of post-Chernobyl followed on birth defects and abortion rates in Austria. Did they do uh, human sex uh, human sex ratio studies at birth in Europe after Chernobyl? They're looking for more males and females, which will quantify everybody got poisoned by Chernobyl in Europe, where they actually closed 9,400 farms in Ireland, Scotland, United Kingdom for decades post-Chernobyl. Prenatal loss of 400 male fetuses in the Czech Republic. And they like to say, oh, everything's in the 35-mile exclusion zone. Everything else is acceptable. Tourists go there all the time. Yeah, there's lots of stupid people. You get tourists for anything. Secondary sex ratio and trans and if you got more males and females in the human populations with what they've done, then you're going to see the same thing in the animal kingdom, but but it's much much more pronounced, right? Much more blatant, and because that's what they're talking about. And there's less babies when there's more males, so when that happens to the species, which it does, much more pronounced. 
you're on a downward spoil for an extinction event. Non-thyroid cancers in northern Ukraine, congenital malformations registry in Belarus. They got orphanages after orphanage after orphanages in Chernobyl and Belarus of deformed children that have been abandoned. Nuclear industry won't even give them a radio so they can have something to pass time with. Father from Chernobyl and overall cancer incidences in Finland, you know, where they got the repository that everybody was excited about. Down syndrome time clustering in Belarus post Chernobyl, because that's the first thing to look at is Down syndrome and autism for your children. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen at all. But of course, according to Lake Barrett, everything I'm talking about, uh, everything you're seeing right now is not true. Only, only his opinion is true. Everything I'm showing you is not real. All these studies don't exist. Taxpayers didn't pay for all these studies for Lake Barrett to come in and be inconvenienced by. So let's keep all these studies so Lake Barrett is not inconvenienced, right? Or he's a general slaughter to his right from Los Alamos National Laboratory. These are the most despicable human creatures I've ever encountered, like people like Lake Bird. The, the, the vast evidence of international scientific evaluation of Three Mile Island uh, and also Fukushima is minimal. Now, Three Mile Island was, was really nothing. So they're saying any harm from Three Mile Island and Fukushima was minimal, but yet Fukushima, Chernobyl is a paper towel compared to Fukushima, and Chernobyl ain't no paper towel. They're brutal. Lake Barrett and his cronies, and the people that sat there in silence or orchestrated and allowed it to happen, have no redeeming qualities whatsoever, do they? compared to Fukushima, but those, the biological impacts on the environment and the human, human lives are, 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 are undetectable. My time's expired. I'll give you an opportunity to answer on the He's saying it's undetectable. Undetectable. Dirty, rotten scoundrel. Your parents should be dug up and put on trial for not drowning Lake Barrett in a bucket of vomit when he was fucking born. Not just cancer, how low doses of radiation causes heart diseases and strokes. The very lowest levels of radiation are harmful to life. And we have to rethink our exposure levels from nuclear plants. Celebrated physician, Fukushima has humanity on the brink of a possible worldwide nuclear holocaust and that the world as we know it has changed, and that the effects on our health are incomprehensible. Touche, old chap. Neptunium-239 dispersal covered the entire planet because the ag reactors actually melted fucking down. And their inventories and the fuel pools that used to be at the top of these 190-foot monsters, these 65-meter monsters, these 19-story monsters, is long gone. And the official story is, no, it's, it's all sitting right there. France didn't say that. France said Japan lost control. Get out of the country. Now run. Don't look back. Just run. Top cancer doctor, nuclear radiation, most carcinogenic thing that exists. That's why 55 countries ban Fukushima food in 14 prefectures for more than a decade. All right? Okay? Uh-huh. How low doses of radiation causes heart diseases and strokes. Bird. Extreme increase in mortality caused by cardiac diseases post Fukushima. The death rates might give some people the creeps, excluding Lake Bird, of course, the, the demonic demon. You know, an extra 12,600 heart attacks, deaths by heart attacks, I should say, in a single month post Fukushima. That's an abnormality that you can't explain away unless you point a nuclear leak. Disinformation by nuclear proponents try to confuse the public about the effects of external or internal radiation. I think that's Lake Byrd. Well, that do... I do dear clear that sounds like Lake Byrd.
Thin compared to Fukushima, but those the biological impacts on the environment and the human human lives wow. are, are, are are undetectable. My time's expired. I'll give you an opportunity. You can't say it's undetectable. I just showed the difference. Take it back, Lake. You know, scumbag. Opportunity to answer on the record. Yeah, he's a he's a record. All of you gentlemen uh, with some written questions. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired, and I'll go to Ms. Uh, Dr. Schreier for five minutes. The next thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Minutes. Uh, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Just 16 miles down the Columbia River from my district is uh -huh. one of the largest and most expensive environmental. 585 square mile nuclear wasteland. Right on the Columbia River that feeds about 20,000, 28,000 farms downstream is a nightmare where they just dump their nuclear waste because they want to, they pollute the entire planet so they wouldn't have a nuclear war and pollute the entire planet. And I'll clean up projects worldwide, the Hanford site. Which they expect to be another 700 plus billion dollars to clean This up. site was critical to our national security during World War II Come and on. the Cold War. The Hanford site has now. She's reading a script, eh? I've been undergoing cleanup and. You notice that about the nuclear industry, nobody got any passion, that there's, there's nobody with any pizzazz that people can relate to or anything like that. They're all just there with their script. People remediation for Dirk. over 30 years. Dirk. Just last month, the low activity waste facility fired up its second uh, melter, smelter, to begin treating the waste via. What was it, 18 years to build that? And you can never go inside again once, once you uh, fire that bad boy up. And they're going to have nuclear waste pumped up from the 177 tanks. Because it's all about those 177 tanks. That's what she's talking about. But the reality of it was, they dumped 1.4 million of the tanks into the soils in the dirty, dirty 40s and 50s in the rush for the Manhattan Project. The vitrification, which converts nuclear and chemical waste into solid glass for permanent state safe storage. Well, you can't permanently save storage yet. It's going to, the Wigner effect will break down no matter what material you use. And it's just cheaper, see? It's not like, see, the, the problem was you can't take, you can't take a metal and then put the nuclear waste in there and seal the top because the process of sealing the top with metal is difficult, right? And it's just going to heat up the nuclear waste and you might have a detonation or anywhere like that. But they're pumping this up from a, from the tanks underground is the official story. And then it mixes with glass, and now it's solid, but it doesn't stay solid. It doesn't stay contained. You can, you can mix it with all kinds of aggregates, but there's no shielding effect whatsoever with glass is what I'm trying to say. Uh, this progress is imperative uh, and urgent as underground tanks first uh, stored. But you got a you got 1.4 million tanks dumped into the soil, so why not get that back first? Because that was the whole drop. Well, there's 177 tanks, and if we can get rid of that, we're on our way. They're cleaning it up to site. Scam, literally scam after scam. Everywhere you look in the nuclear industry. In the 1950s and 60s, are now leaking. Every direction. Adding to more than a million ga Bless gallons of hazardous heart. waste that Washington oh, Ecology estimates is already in the soil uh, across the Hanford site. Under current standards, the cleanup and remediation is not expected to be completed until at least the 20s. If it would chuck, could chuck, 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 could chuck. Now, I, I really like her. She's she's one of the. The, the in interesting ones. She's going to go tell, she got like 10 seconds left of her five minutes, and then she's going to ask somebody for their opinion. They're going to go, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. She, okay, I render my time. I get my time back. Watch this. 70s. I'll get out of the way. And delays in funding and cleanup uh -huh. uh, put the Columbia River and the entire region at risk. 
Uh, Mr. Barrett, th this question's for you. Uh, I'm optimistic about the cleanup moving forward, although I have deep concerns about the decades-long timeline. Uh, Congress appropriated historic levels of funding in last year's budget for Hanford bringing more than $3 billion to DOE's Hanford efforts. DOE, EPA, and the Washington State Department of Ecology are engaged in talks to discuss a whole, holistic, realistic solutions moving forward. I know that um, your experience is more in commercial spent fuel and not weapons grade nuclear waste, but based on your experience uh, at DOE and with the NRC, what steps can be taken to further improve and hasten waste management in a, in a risk-informed and also urgent way, especially given the threat of already leaking tanks not far from the Columbia River? <laughs> now watch how much time, watch how much time he has for his response. Because she ate up almost the entire five minutes with a speech that was typed up by somebody she didn't know any of this. She never dreamt this up. Well, I think DOE has a very active uh, program in the Environmental Management Group that is addressing those issues. It's a long, 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 uh, long path long ahead, time. but much has been accomplished. I think as far as the near-term safety and environmental protection activities being taken are quite good. Uh, eventually, there's going to need to be a place to take the waste when it's when the glass is made, where is it going to go? That's an important part for the future, but that's some time away. So uh, just in follow-up for that, uh, that was going to be my next question is about permanent storage and progress way. on that, but also you know, with regard to 2070 as the earliest possible date for completion, is there anything that could At Hanford. speed this up? 2070 is not on the schedule. It's a 300 a year. Hanford is 300 years. 300 and whatever. Right? It's 300 years. That's what they expect the cleanup to take till at least 300 years. And just in the next number of couple of decades, they need $700 billion to deal with some urgent issues, as they like to put it. Um in how you handle different types of waste? I've been out of the government for 20 years now, so I, I don't have the details that I can really address that. Uh, as to how much more money would accelerate that, probably more money would accelerate it, but Hanford is a... You would actually bankrupt America trying to clean up Hanford. A very big, expensive place already. Uh, understandable and true. Um, thank you. Uh, moving on to you, Dr. Wagner, I, I was very interested in y your testimony about the Idaho uh, National Lab, which has undergone its own cleanup efforts uh, with the Department of Energy for its own defense waste. Um, so if you'd like to comment on any of that, you, you are welcome to. But I, I know you're no stranger to delays and long timelines. Uh, as your lab has faced the same. And can, can you tell me any negative impacts from these delayed timelines and from your lab's partnership with Department of Energy, uh, what steps can, can environmental management do to avoid setbacks and increased costs and lengthier timelines? So there's a lot in that. Um, I would say that, uh, first of all, our site is a Department of Energy site. Um, and, uh, and it's actually a lot of success stories. And I, I'd like to say, too, it's very different than Hanford. Uh, we don't have the scale of, of the waste in, uh, that, uh, that is on the Hanford site by any stretch. Uh, but a partnership between the Department of Energy and the state of Idaho um, has resulted in substantial progress in cleaning up the site, including moving. Uh, let me show you a picture of Hanford. There's 177 of these tanks, right? They're buried in the ground. But they dumped 1.4 million tanks in the ground. These are 300,000 gallon tanks. And I, I, used, I got videos before this headline showed up. And uh, they're in the wrong format, unfortunately. I gotta reformat them so they can play on this site. And I keep forgetting to do it. But uh, tonight's a good reminder. 450, this was a Business Week USA. The plutonium facility might blow up, or they like to call it experiencing criticality event. 
450 billion gallons of industrial radiological contaminants were dumped directly into the soil, which is a aquarium six feet wide, 518 feet tall, wrapped around the entire planet more than once. This was all radioactive sludge that came out after. Moving a lot of the, uh, the, the transuranic uh, legacy waste to the waste isolation pilot plant, which is a deep geologic repository that we have in the United States today, although it cannot accept spent nuclear fuel. Or high-level waste at all. It's supposed to be just for contaminated shoes and tools and stuff like that. It's not for any kind of high-level waste. It was just bulk stuff, right? It's all coming from the Manhattan era. And in 2014, they actually had a meltdown there and successfully covered it up. Apparently, they were putting high-level waste down there, and they had to close off a whole bunch of quarters where each one is a football field size. And they successfully covered it up and said it was kitty litter and that a truck tires had caught fire, and that's why they spent $6 billion dollars. A lot of the, uh, the, the transuranic uh, legacy waste to the waste isolation pilot plant, which is a deep geologic repository that we have in the United States today, although it cannot accept spent nuclear fuel. Uh, actually, I, honestly, I don't think we talk enough about the positive cleanup story uh, that we have at some of our sites. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. And with one second, I yield back. There is no cleanup story. Chile yields back. Some of the challenges they had at Hanford initially were the concrete lids on the tanks. And then actually building the vitrification facility and the evaporation facilities and all that. So. so it evaporates. And that whole process, they're going to take nuclear sludge where every drop is. If a fly gets a leg stuck in, in a drop of this stuff and lands, say, in their cafeteria, they have to evacuate it and decontaminate the whole cafeteria. It's been shut down many times by a hot wasp or a hot bee. So it's very dangerous. So when they're talking about the dehydration, the evaporation rather, this is where they're taking this stuff and liquefying it and releasing it into the environment. And then only the dry stuff left over is going in the glass. Gotcha. I forgot about that. Dirty, dirty, dirty bastards. Dirty bombs all day coming out of there every minute. Unbelievable, isn't it? I forgot about that facet of the story, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's heartbreaking. I've been there, phenomenal environmental management effort at Hanford. <laughs> and this committee ought to go to Hanford, ought to go to Spanner Riverside and see some of the environmental well, management stuff. With that, um, Mr. Pence recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member DeGette, for holding this, and thank you to the witnesses here today. I've been encouraged by the bipartisan work of this committee under Chairman Duncan's leadership to modernize our regulatory framework for the next generation nuclear reactors. In the Hoosier State, innovators are leading the way to power the next generation of nuclear energy. Purdue University is a national leader in nuclear engineering programs and home to the country's first and only fully digital digitalized nuclear reactor used to train students and research cyber physical protection. Importantly, the university recently released a fea feasibility study with Duke Energy on how they could bring a small modular reactor to power their campus, which I've actually seen. <laughs> but there is no small modular reactor. What are you talking about? You couldn't see something that doesn't exist. And, and I knew there was something weird about that guy as soon as he, st he started talking, but my goodness. As part of their study, their collaboration will look into opportunities to safely store spent nuclear fuel on site. Rolls-Royce with facilities in India. And he never read his script, obviously, either, did he? Annapolis is advancing their designs for transportable small modular reactors that provide that don't exist. There's no licenses applications into the regulatory agency. And which means, right, once you get it in there, you got four or five, six hundred people will go over a million pieces of paper. You find all kind of flaws. 
takes a couple of years, three, four years. They'll submit it back to the company. The company will resubmit it to the engineers with the with the modification request, and they'll re-engineer everything. They'll submit it back to the regulatory agency. The regulatory agency will have hundreds of people go through it and work on the science and everything else. And this can go back and forth, and then eventually now, okay, you can get find funding. So now it takes a couple of years to find funding. Now you got to you got to level a piece of land, even if it's existing. You still got to re-engineer everything. You got to come up with all the equipment, all the pieces. There's there's all the preamble that goes into this. This is another three, four, five years before you finally start ready to try a foundation. If everything goes perfect, you're 25. You got to build one, get the kinks out of it, because it doesn't exist. Then you got to re-engineer it, build a new one. Hopefully that one's got no kinks into it. You got to take it to the national laboratories and run it there for an extended period of time to quantify it that is within reasons. But you got all the natural resources imaginable, particularly geoengineering, geothermal energy, rather, at your fingertips. Everywhere on the planet, we have access to it. Now we have the technology. And anything a small modular reactor can do, geothermal can do it, you know, one-tenth at a time. Instead of 10 years, it can do it in one year. And at minimum, because it's still a little bit expensive, but at least only half the price of nuclear. And you can, there's no adverse side effects. If it breaks down, you fix it instead of running away and abandoning your pets and your communities and your graveyards and everything else, and spending a million years trying to clean it up, you just get up in the morning and you know, wash everything down and start rebuilding. As part of their study, their collaboration will look into opportunities to safely store spent nuclear fuel on site. Rolls-Royce, with facilities in Indianapolis, it is advancing their designs for transportable small modular reactors that provide 470 megawatts of baseload power. But a small modular reactor is below 300 megawatts, so they're large reactors. Therefore, they're not modular. While Indiana currently does not have nuclear assets powering our grid, the state legislature has begun paving the way for utilities to deploy advanced nuclear reactors across our state. Dr. Wagner. How have our, uh, in, in your opening comments, uh, I, I want to take it a little further, and maybe you've, you've discussed this, but briefly, how have our allied nations such as France, Canada, or South Korea pursued spent nuclear fuel storage, and are, these, are there lessons we can learn from their approach? So each of those countries have a little bit different strategy. Um, Everything is vented into the environment 24 hours a day. It kills the robots, for goodness sakes. How is the human supposed to work there? And we are c closely connected with all of them and have, have shared uh, technologies and learnings from those processes already. <laughs> and, and there are things that we can learn. And, and uh, I'd say there's, there's always things that we can learn from each other. Yeah, for example, the recycling yeah, capabilities that France uses are technologies that, uh, that arguably were, were piloted here, uh, certainly around the same, same period of time. And so uh, we do have a good collaborative relationship with a number of those yeah, countries. But, but we have 50 states, I think you alluded to a little earlier, right? A little different than France. Second question, as you may know, Purdue University is a national leader in nuclear engineering and has done important work to advance research around materials science and manufacturing convergence needed for next generation reactors like, like that utilize advanced fuels such as HALU. Has the nuclear industry begun researching the necessary specifications for storing different types of nuclear fuel? So uh, the Department of Energy has supported uh, work in, in looking at different waste forms, both the ones that we have from different uh, DOE-owned test reactors, for example, all the way up through commercial reactors. Uh, there's not been as much work on long-term storage and disposal of some of the different, the, types. The, the different types of advanced right. reactor fuels. Although having said that, they're very, still very similar to, to a number of the uh, early test reactors. So there is knowledge on those um, that will, uh, will be brought to bear. Anyone else have a comment on that question? 
No. Okay, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Hey, just, hey, wait a second, I got something to say. Why are all the answers the same for everybody? Very scripted, everybody knows they ask the exact right question. Did they practice, did any of them practice? or Because none of them seemed very smooth, right? But they all had new exact right question to get the exact same response each time. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, for five minutes. For five Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. White, in your written minutes. testimony, you know that every year American taxpayers foot the bill for legal judgment payments for spent nuclear fuel, SNF, storage that accounts uh, to 500 to $800 million per year. Can you expand on these uh, the temporary right storage sites and the savings to taxpayers that would actually occur with a central depository? Well, there, there would be tremendous savings, and I, I can't give you a, a dollar figure, but, you know, just the fact that we're, we're currently spending somewhere in the range of $2 million a day to pay the utilities to store waste as a result of the failed program, that in and of itself would, would result in a tremendous savings. You may not know the answer to this question, but I've heard talk about there's enough uh, enough fuel around that we don't process. I think somebody said something about France you know, reprocessing it better than we do, that there's enough fuel around that if we were able to reprocess it, it would last for years and years and years. Can you speak to that? How many times have they already done that? How many times have they already talked about, the, ah, if we reprocess, there's enough fuel. So there was this. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily the right person, but I will uh, echo that that has come up. Uh, I'm going to look at a few more of these. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not necessarily the right person, but I Charlie wasn't very impressed earlier when he called in. He was pretty upset <laughs> that I had all these pictures of one-ton bags. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not necessarily the right person, but I will uh, echo that that has come up in this hearing, and the determination was that we could fuel nuclear power plants for at least 100 years. Somebody else would like to weigh in on that one? So, so I can just add to that basically what he's already said, though. Yes, there's a whole, there is a tremendous amount of uh, energy left in the spent nuclear fuel that, if recycled, could be utilized. Any others? Yes, there's, there's a tremendous amount of energy you know, in, there, in, in the fuel. Uh, economically, to recover that uh, relative to everything else is, is an open question. That's my next we, question. This country should clearly, clearly be looking at it. But no matter what the situation may evolve to in the future, there still is going to be radioactive waste that needs permanent disposal somewhere in this country. And so that, you actually brought up my next question economically. Has, it, has anybody done, I mean, they've said that we could use it for, I think you said 100 years, or it was enough for 100 years. Has anybody done a study where we know exactly, or have a range of what that would cost? Uh, there, yes, there has been a variety of studies looking at different uh, characteristics with different assumptions to try to uh, envelope what's possible. So, so yes, there are a number of studies, and I'd be happy uh, afterwards to provide such studies to you. And what's the time frame for that? If we, if we embarked upon that mission, if you will, would we be able to say that within one to two years we would be getting it back into the marketplace, if that's, not the, if that's the right term? What's the time frame involved? In, a st in Getting that reprocessing fuel and getting it where we can actually use it. <laughs> So assuming we had um, uh, infrastructure to recycle, which we do not, um, it, would, it would still be several years from discharge by the time you go through the process to separate um, and make new fuel out of uh, spent nuclear fuel. So uh, th <laughs> there's a lot of Oz. What he's supposed to say, but lacking the courage, that's what no spinal cord will do, I guess was that Savannah River tried to build a mixed oxide fuel facility 
and they were too incompetent to see it through, or even halfway. And that they stole all the money, everything else went to administration. In other words, they stole all the money. And Savannah River has a great big hole there where there should be, unfortunately there's not, a mixed oxide site. It was really quite the exhibition in greed and gluttony where they just stole everything for their own devices. How come they haven't created a robot that can work around nuclear after 80 years? What did you get school children trying to create one, I wonder? Uh, I, I'm not necessarily the right person, but I will uh, echo that that has come up in this hearing, and the determination was that we could fuel nuclear power plants for at least 100 years. S somebody else would like to weigh in on that one? Of course, that's nonsense. So, so I can just add to that basically what he's saying. In order to do it, you're going to have to have every nuclear power plant in your country running on mixed oxide fuel. This is stupid. There's no way that, yeah, we're crazy, they're crazy, but the, no, the world will never accept that, right? It's just the whole the whole idea kind of blows my mind. Already said, though, yes, there's a whole, there is a tremendous amount of uh, energy left in the spent nuclear fuel that, if recycled, could be utilized. Any others? Oops. Yes, there's, there's a tremendous amount of energy, you know, in there, in, in the fuel. Uh, economically, to recover that uh, relative to everything else is, is an open question. That's my next we, question. This country should... It would be a pretty significant uh, period of time to establish the recycling infrastructure that would be needed. Any guess? I, on, yes, sir. I, I, could, I could maybe comment. The Japanese have a national <laughs> policy to follow French, basically, with reprocessing of LWR fuel. Uh, they've been working on this thing for decades. For decades, for decades. In other words, if they try to build something in America, it's going to be take decades. This is what he's telling you. It's very rare to hear him tell the truth. It's an exceptional moment for us. Um, they haven't started, you know, production yet, but right. And uh, they had a nuclear accident there when they tried to reprocess some fuel. That's quite the statement. They're getting close, but they've spent over $25 billion, I believe, in... It's $28 billion, and they've been doing it for almost 28 years, trying to build a reprocessing site. They've been storing fuel there, but they haven't been able to reprocess it, thank goodness. What a frightening creature he actually is. They're getting close, but they've spent over 20... And he's, he's using this as an example for reprocessing in America. Oh, yeah, well, you know, it's going to cost you 25, 30 billion, and uh, going to take 25, 30 years. We'll get her done, though. <laughs> We're not evil it's at all. $5 billion, dollars, I believe, in growing uh, to establish that capability. Uh, uranium is prices certainly going up. Yeah, but it's an artificial inflation. Nuclear is going backwards. There's no demand. Right, Spro Physical Uranium Trust is buying the uranium and hanging on to it and artificially inflating it by forcing the miners to go back to work. And then the unsuspecting investors don't understand those nuances, those minutiae, those details. Just weasel. That's what he, that's what he does, professional weasels. But uh, it's worse than weasels. These are lethal weasels. They're condemning. But I mean, relatively species. speaking, unless we have a national security issue, um, it, it doesn't see, make a lot of economic sense. But nonetheless, it see, I knew this was a bad idea to do the video because they couldn't open their friggin' pie holes f uh, without telling a lie. Everything is really scripted. It, it's all orchestrating lies. That's easy to disprove, unfortunately. Then it takes a lot Certainly with the new through. technologies today, which are much better than the technologies from the... But they don't exist. There is no technologies. These are con constructs, right? They're projecting it onto you as if they exist, but they don't actually exist. The 70s that we invented, that the French use and the Japanese... No, you didn't invent it in the 70s. It was invented in the 40s and 50s and early 1900s. 
trying to use. Uh, there are advances there. So it's certainly... Like fusion, the invention that they're, the, the patent or the, the dissertation, the paper they're using on fusion was written in 1904. That's what all, almost all the models are based on exactly on that particular... They should be paper. on the table and be a they matter of a subject uh, of this committee. Well, I agree with you, except for one your statement. You said it didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I, I know economically, but our friends... And I've <clears throat> there's, there's going to be a meeting at the Nuclear uh, Energy Institute, I think it is, over at the Capitol Hill Club dinner. And we meet and we talk with a lot of folks about nuclear energy and, and uh, NRC regulators, former, you know, past or whatever companies. So it may not make a lot of sense, but I've talked to some of my friends across the aisle and said, why don't you come to one of those dinners? And I was told by one of them, well, I won't go until I prove that we can, uh, we can produce nuclear friend. energy uh, cleanly and safely. And, of course, my remark. Cleanly and safely. It's so interesting that they use those particular, right, those connotations. First off, like, the small modular reactors don't exist. They're, they're not going to be clean. They're going to produce 35% more high-level waste, 30% more intermediate-level waste, five times more fuel rods because of they don't have economy of scale. If you're smart, you're buying shares in black one-ton friggin' bags, right? If you're, take, if you're thinking ahead, that's where you're putting your money because you know that's the future. Was Well, I can prove that with Weber. two words, yeah. nuclear submarine. Well, nuclear submarines is interesting because they, they scuttled all kinds of them. They, they were armed with nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors, so they're going to pollute the ocean for a million years. Russia has 160 rammed up on its beaches. United Kingdom has 19. They don't know what to do with it. They're decrepit. And there's all kinds of incidences over the years. The American fleet doesn't hold any particular impressive records. And they're not small modular reactors. They're utilizing the ocean as a coolant. If it wasn't for the ocean, they would need a great big facility to cool them, see? Because they're in the ocean, they have a great big facility, the ocean. And they have a way of venting radiation directly into the ocean. Because they're the military, they don't have to play by anybody's rules, so they don't. You know, but when we've got people who don't think it can be handled cleanly or safely, that's the reason. Cleanly or safely. And I would say that maybe we've got to come up with a uh, system to, to make this happen because it is available and I see I'm out of time so I'll yield back. Thank you. Chairman yields back and I'll go to uh, Dr. Joyce for five minutes. For the next five minutes please. Come on. You go. Thank you, Chairman Duncan and Ranking Member DeGette for allowing me to wave on to today's hearing. And thanks to our witnesses for appearing here today. Bless your we have hearts. discussed at length in this committee how we cannot regulate or tax our way to cleaner energy. <laughs> we have to be able to innovate. Advanced nuclear power is exactly the type of innovation. Well, like, if you're going to innovate, why not do something new? Because why not geothermal? Why does it got to be nuclear? Why isn't there any room for something else? Show some, show some geothermal. Some room, that don't I'm talking room. about. By taking the clean, safe, and reliable traits of traditional nuclear generation and shrinking the size, small modular reactors, SMRs, and micro reactors can provide energy to a new market of end users. If you took all these fuckers and put them on a big, conveyor belt with generators, you produce more energy quicker and longer than you will with the small modular reactors that don't exist. That's what we need. But like all these pictures I created in the last couple of days, by the way. Yes, indeed, I've been a busy boy. <laughs> Facilities like mines in Western United States or data centers in Pennsylvania and Virginia could have reliable energy without having to strain the grid. Same Last thing. month, I visited a Westinghouse facility where Westinghouse is using their long history... Don't go looking up. Keep your eyes down. Read that script. ...history of innovation to make widespread availability of microreactors a reality. Look at them. 
He's not, he's not making eye contact with anyone. Westinghouse has transformed an unused <laughs> old steel factory into a manufacturing facility for this new technology, <laughs> bringing family-sustaining jobs back to Pennsylvania. Oh, he practiced. We need Look to do him. everything that we can to enable this innovation. Yeah, well, why don't you do everything you can to innovate geothermal? And you can put everything else away and, and call it a day. You know, solutions. Uh, that's, that's crazy talk, Dana. If current regulations for nuclear waste are a hindrance to this new technology, we need to be able to have discussions on how we can <laughs> safely reform them to allow advanced nuclear to thrive in the United States. Yeah. We need your nuki. We need you bad. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. and you're going to employ people for hundreds of thousands of years cleaning up after. And he's got shears. How the hell do we ever get to stupid? Because people don't see nuclear as interesting, right? Ah, who cares? I don't know anything about nuclear. I don't want to. It's too hard. It sounds scary. I don't want to do it. I've seen it in Hollywood. Leave me alone. Yeah, but it's not that difficult. Giggling pin goes straight in the laughing shaft. And when you pluck the laughing shaft up a few inches, and then the demons all come out to play, a.k.a. nuclear fallout. I don't know what I was thinking when I, got, when I developed up the idea. But it came up Dr. Pretty. Wagner, as I mentioned before, the end users of SMRs and microreactors might not be traditional utilities. They could be a variety of industrial users. What are the challenges with current regulations for this new type of end user? So um, you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, in your own state, a uh, recent agreement between Talon Energy uh, related to a data center there uh, taking the power from a power purchase agreement off uh, uh, Susquehanna Power Plant is an example of the, the, the interest in these kinds of things. Dow Chemicals working with X Energy is another example. In, in terms of the challenges that I hear from a number of these energy end users who want to utilize nuclear, a lot of them looking at small modular reactors and new nuclear as opposed to existing nuclear. Um, Again, like it's so confusing that they're so fixated on something that doesn't exist which is small modular reactors or micro reactors or and they don't have the fuel they don't have a facility to process the fuel they don't have a solution it's going to take according to the expert 25 years to 30 years and 25 billion to 30 billion to come up with a way to process the fuel and it's got to be now now we need it right now but it's going to take at least three decades to come to fruition <clears throat> you need a fleet of robots, of thousands of robots for each site to try to mitigate it before it gets out of control. This is what we should be doing, right? And then we're going to put artificial intelligence in it at some point because we ain't going to be around. The biggest challenge is, uh, frankly, not one of regulations. It's one of first mover costs and uncertainties in cost and schedule with those uh, reactors coming online when they need them. And let's clarify some of those costs, Dr. Wagner. I'm glad you brought that into the conversation. Like data mine centers and mines, these are industrial users, and they're going to be required to sign a contract with the Department of Energy and may have to store <laughs> nuclear waste on their sites. <laughs> So Amazon has a, a small nuclear reactor. They, they might have to store the nuclear waste on their site. So my my visions might not be so far off the off the madness after all. I might just uh, actually hit upon a good investment, invest in robots because Amazon's going to be stuck with their nuclear waste like Walmart. And Disneyland Are they going and to be willing and able to store waste on site? And will this affect ultimately? It'll be like buying a secondhand car one day. I'll, I got some pretty nice reactors in the back room. Come on back here. I'll give you a good deal on one. Don't, don't bring the fuel back, though, after. I don't want to see that stuff.
they going to be willing and able to store waste on site? And will this affect ultimately the economic deployment? So this is crazy. In order to to cook up the idea, and like, well, what about the waste? Well, we'll make them sign a paper. They got to store it on their own site. So now we can go ahead and say small modular reactors are right around the corner. No, not really. They're right around the corner at Walmart and McDonald's and everywhere else. So I can't speak to what they're willing or not willing to do, but it it adds uncertainty <laughs> to what their long-term costs uh, and challenges are. And uncertainty is a big challenge in any of these companies' decisions to he's, move he's forward. Do you think that uncertainty really will right? inhibit their interest in pursuing these? It does inhibit their interest, um, and it just kind of comes down to how how willing are they to move forward in an uncertain space. Mr. White, Pennsylvania's ratepayers are responsible for $4 billion in contributions to the Nuclear Waste Fund, which is supposed to pay for the permanent disposal of nuclear waste. There have been discussions about increasing consolidated interim storage to reduce taxpayer burdens through the Judgment Fund. You indicated that consolidated interim storage proposals should include a full analysis of cost. Can you please elaborate why? Is this to determine whether interim storage would actually reduce the long-term financial board burden on the rate payers that you represent? Yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, the, the, the idea would be to be able to do that kind of economic determination as to whether or not the consolidated interim storage would have uh, cost reduction. To and Mr. White, to your knowledge, has there been a thorough and credible life cycle analysis that would support an interim storage facility? Um, I'm not sure that there's been a, a thorough, I, you know, I think I, I might quibble with just that, you know, whether it's uh, all encompassing, because I think there's some aspects that should be considered as well. But there has been some studies done. I'm just not convinced that they're, uh, that they're, encompassing the entire uh, determination, the entire set of analysis that needs to be considered. So they need at least a half a billion for academic studies because they, lo they love it. That covers all the bases, keeps the insurance company happy, you know, which is you, the Price-Anderson Act. So they can have all the meltdowns they want. They're only going to cost a billion or two. Again, I thank our witnesses for appearing here today. Chairman Duncan, thank you for holding this important hearing, and I yield back. Chairman yields back. I now go to Ms. Miller-Meeks for five minutes. For the next. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Duncan, and I thank our witnesses for being here. Thank you also for allowing me to wave on to this important committee. The work uh, Chairman Duncan has done on nuclear uh, energy has been uh, truly profound and uh -huh. a little known secret. My father in the Air Force actually helped to decommission two nuclear facilities in the Army. The Army borrowed him from the Air Force. Um, awesome. So the expansion of nuclear go, energy baby. plays a key role in the future of the United States energy security. She has fine memories as a child of playing in the nuclear pile. Especially having a continual base yeah. load and dispatchable Better energy. Happy. Last year, nuclear reactors generated nearly 20% of America's electricity. Investments in and expansion of nuclear it's energy is essential to continuing to reduce our global emissions while also offering, most importantly, affordable, abundant, and reliable energy. Oh, she sold it like it was a pancake. It's just scary when you see people do that. However, the Department of Energy and Congress's lack of action to fulfill their contractual obligations to properly manage spent nuclear fuel only serves to act as a barrier to this necessary expansion. Uh, Dr. Wagner or Mr. Barrett, are there any technological innovations or advancements that could improve the management of spent nuclear fuel? Yes, there are, there are some. <laughs> they, they have only asked that question. Everyone of them asks that question. And you get the same reply every time. There, there's some technological advances to deal with your radioactive fallout. Look at it. It's coming. You know it's coming down the road. Well, as it get busy, you can have them built before you come. You can have them built before they come up with a solution. As Dr. Weider has explained, it can, can assist, it can assist us in reducing the toxicity, reducing the, some of the volume, but it also have side effects of more low-level waste, intermediate waste, et cetera. But all in all, I, we have a disposal system that can accommodate. We need to have a disposal system. That will oh, a little slip-up, eh?
will accommodate that. But ne ne te technology advances are going to help us. But they do not overcome the fundamental not. social political problems we have. Yeah, there is a number of technologies that will help, uh, but I will that say that we have the technologies today to safely secure, transport, and ultimately dispose of, of spent nuclear fuel. Um, future technologies can make it do, help us do that better and more cost-effectively, <laughs> but we can do it today. Um, I would echo that. As a former standpoint. director of public health, uh, we were in charge of all uh, radioactive material, and most people don't know that there is a transit of nuclear material that goes by on railway, railroads every single day, and we handle that in departments of public health. As, as Dr. Leitner has explained, it can, can assist, it can assist us. Every single day. So. Very, very concerning. You need one of those babies. They'll, they'll get rid of your nuclear waste for you. Right? If you had that, you'd be laughing. Nuc nuclear waste is not so scary if you had your robots. Because then after we're all gone, there's no more insects or birds or animals. The robots can clean everything up. Because that's basically when we'll get everything cleaned up after we're gone. Because this lot is not going to give us a chance to have a future. I think it's part of as we as we mend our broken disposal system, we need to look. In Who broke it? You you were there back when the Nautilus was originally fueled up, which meant you were there for the inception. And so, who should we blame if not you, who's been there the whole time, fifty-five years of you coming there and saying the same song and dance? That's the spectacle we have today. I think it's part of as we as we mend our broken disposal system, we need to look in, entirely at the entire system uh, in a comprehensive way, as as we've been trying to call for. Uh, in in that the in that evaluation, the newer advances in in technology can be folded into that as to how much benefit is there technologically. What are the costs? What are the schedules, as some of you members have asked here today? So it would be appropriate for the Department of Energy to, to produce such an integrated plan on what are the options and what might the cost be and what might the schedules be. But it would certainly be a very worthwhile thing to do. It's been decades since we looked carefully at what are the cost savings to the nation, let me say, be they ratepayers or taxpayers, for interim storage. There's pros and cons on the interim storage. If we can do disposal fairly soon, it's probably not economic to do. If disposal is going to be generations away, it's economical to do. But how you cite all of these things together, they're integrated. We cannot take a piece out in isolation. Mr. White, what type of amendment to nuclear waste strategy should Congress immediately move forward with to protect the interests of ratepayers and the American taxpayer? Uh, focusing the uh the program, I think, is first and foremost. Um, you know, currently we do not have a federal uh, disposal program, nuclear waste disposal program. That needs to be started back up. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the different models that that could be, but at the end of the day, we they, just need to get something going, and it should be a. They don't have a current system. Did you hear the statement? Oh my goodness. They don't have a current system. Do disposal fairly soon, it's probably not economic to do. If disposal is going to be generations away, it's economical to do. But I'm just let me cut that off. I want to isolate that that incredible statement, right? how you cite all of these things together, they're integrated. We cannot take a piece out in isolation. Okay, let me cut it off there so I can find it later, that's all. Mr. White, what type of amendment to nuclear waste strategy should Congress immediately move forward with to protect the interests of ratepayers and the American taxpayer? Uh, focusing the... Uh, the program, I think, is first and foremost. Um, you know, currently, we do not have a federal uh, disposal program, nuclear waste disposal program. That needs to be started back up. 
Uh, we've talked a little bit about the different models that that could be, but at the end of the day, we just need to get something going, and it should be a. So they don't have any any system, but they're waiting for some solution. So what's the best way to come up with a solution? <laughs> just go get busy. Like I keep telling you, unfortunately, they're not trying to come up with solutions. All the robots will be dead and gone, and they won't have a solution. Uh, high priority. Uh, and then, Mr. Barrett, the federal government, to both your points, the federal government spend millions per year on civil damages to electric utilities by not adapting our nuclear waste strategy to be realistic and functional. Should the U.S. move forward with a new strategy that includes Yucca Mountain but allows for additional options? Yes. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chilney yields there back. Go. I'll now go Good to Mr. Job. Big yes. It was easy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. And I, I share your passion for nuclear energy. is extremely <laughs> important. I'm very proud of my home state. of. I share your passion. So there, there's no opposition. Did you hear any opposition tonight? There was no opposition, was it? How come there's no opposition? Uh, high priority. Uh, and then, Mr. Barrett, the federal government, to both your points, the federal government spends millions per year on civil damages to electric utilities by not adapting our nuclear waste strategy to be realistic and functional. Should the U.S. move forward with a new strategy that includes Yucca Mountain but allows for additional options? Yes. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chilney yields back. I'll now I'll go to Mr. Carter. I was born on Yucca Mountain. Georgia and what we've done and um, we've been the number one state to do business in for the past 11 years and one of the primary reasons for that is because we have available reliable affordable energy and and that's something we're very proud of uh, my colleague um, here on this committee, um, Mr. Allen, in his district, we have two nuclear reactors that have just been um, one in, in service now, and the other should be coming up very shortly, the first in, in 30 years that we've had this in our country, and we're very proud of that. And in fact, in my district, um, Mr. Allen was kind enough to, uh, during redistricting, let me have the uh, Otis uh, nuclear reactor plant, Plant Hatch, in um, in Georgia, that's been like, in like a, a and since Hatch. it's been providing electricity since 1975, and has been licensed to go into the 2030s. So we're very proud of that as well. Um, all that said, spent fuel has has kind of been the the stigma that's hung over nuclear energy for many years and and that's unfortunate and it's very unfortunate that we haven't been able to come up with a a better solution than what we have and uh, uh, quite often when people are talking about it they they want to talk about the spent fuel and say that that's you know what are you going to do about that and i think that I've always said that the greatest innovators, the greatest scientists are right here in the United States. And, and I'm, I'm confident we can do this. I'm confident we can do a better job in, in, in making sure that we are addressing this situation with spent fuel. And I, so I, I think it's kind of unfair that, um, that we get that. I've been to Plant Vogel and I've, I've been by the cask and, um, you know. I got my picture. I got a selfie with a cast. So therefore, I'm a good expert right there, folks. <laughs> yeah, well, how do you argue with somebody with that? I, I stood on the top of uh, of Yucca, Yucca Mountain. You can be 20 on Yucca Mountain. <sighs> I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm not glowing at all. I don't think. I'm, <laughs> I gotta play that again. That was pretty awesome, man. I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm not glowing at all. I don't think. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have that at the beginning of every show from now on. Hang on. i got to cut that. <laughs> I know I'm pretty good. I'm not glowing. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, I love it. That gave me pain in the guts. <laughs> One more time, come on. My grandchildren think I glow sometimes, but anyway, that's uh, that's another story. Let me ask you. One more time. I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm not glowing at all. I don't think I'm. I'm doing fine. I'm not glowing. He's he's only slightly evil. He's not really really evil. He's he, he's getting there. You should ask his old lady. You know. What she? What did she say? No, no, he's glowing. Uh, he, he's a bit of a glow. I'm, right? I'm doing fine. I'm not glowing at all. I don't think. I'm Man, that, that was too rich. Hang on. Oh my goodness! I can't go back through all that. I'll never get there. Oh well, I poke it away over there. I'll come back again after. I don't want to lose it. It's such a rich moment, right? I'll put that down at the bottom of the pile. Oh, that didn't work out. Hang on, I just want to get put that video so I don't lose it because. Uh, My grandchildren think I glow sometimes, but anyway, that's uh, that's another story. Let me ask you, and I, I'll I'll just ask all of you this: How many commercial, private, spent fuel storage projects are in the process of being developed that you know of here in the United States? We can start with you, Mr. White. Good. Yeah, that that's a great question. Was he setting them up, or is he playing along? There's one million nine hundred twenty-five thousand nine hundred ninety-one. We can make reactors out of the the one-ton bags. They'll probably burn like a big candle. Everybody can gather up and get warmed up around that in the winter time. See? Down the line. Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with how many. There have been several uh, that have been initiated. Uh, none successful so far. <laughs> This is a winner industry. You really want to pump money in this one. They can't get a repository. They, they can't do this. They can't do that. They, they can't get a fuel pool, private fuel pool. Thank goodness. Down the line. Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with how many. There have been several uh, that have been initiated, uh, none successful so far. Right. I'm sorry. I don't have any knowledge on that. We've had about five that we've tried, okay, and all of them failed. Why? Basically because <laughs> of host state acceptance. Because of? Host state acceptance. We had a licensed one at private fuel storage in Utah. The state said no. Uh, we tried proposed, we tried to propose one in the 80s in Tennessee. The, the senator said no. Uh, there's one in New Mexico today in Texas that are, were near, they were licensed, but they were which was uh, Holtec, Chris Sings. I objections from the state of New Mexico and Texas. They are basically stopped, uh, just like Yucca Mountain is stopped. Wow, that was such a great, that was a really interesting thing. Maybe I'm too hard on that. Maybe if we all lived in, we got 30 million people and they lived in a one ton bag. So not I in mean, my backyard. We, we don't. Yes, Benimbia. sir. Benimbia. Huh. You, you wouldn't take a shot at anything? Well, I think we need to, if we had a credible long-term disposal system, it would certainly have assisted in the siting of those interim storage facilities. Right. Well, we did have a long-term, well, not credible, but he did have a long-term storage solution for about 30 years. He used to take it out on the ocean and dump it overboard. Long, the British done the same thing, right? Finland done it too. But everybody should, what you should do is put these one ton bags of radiation up for adoption. Everybody can adopt it and they can take care of it. Hey, hey. You got to admit. You gotta, but when the country has no functional system, the host state says, why should I accept this right when well, I'm going to get stuck with it for there's ever? There's the system, those three. Well, let me ask you this. How many of the nuclear plants that, that are in operation now have their own dry cast storage operations up and running? Everyone, everyone except the Harris plant in North Carolina because it was built to be four reactors and they didn't build for it, so they had very large pools. All of the others do. 
Because that because they had changed the law after the Harrisburg one melted down. Ain't that an interesting statement? Because dinosaur here, he ran Three Mile Island when it melted down. He's the guy who covered it up. He's the ruthless monster that poisoned all the women and children. Put in the shutdown plans. And, and you're confident that the cask work and that there's no problems with those? Yes. Sir. Yeah, because he's just a little bit surprised at that statement. I, I think it's just the time is wearing on Lake Bird. Those Lake casts Lake are very um, robust and well guarded, well designed, controlled, you know, reviewed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I have very high confidence in their safety, but that's not the long term solution. Right. Let me let me ask all of you again. Um, did, did you notice none of them came up with a solution in the whole fucking show? A question. Why would the Department of Energy want to pursue another interim storage facility given the potential availability of private options and, and, and the difficulties in, in sitting? And Which is Chris Singh. Licensing those facilities and questionable demand for them rather than focusing on a permanent solution. Why, would, why wouldn't we want to focus on a permanent solution, Mr. Right. And so finally, at the end of the night, somebody asks the question of how come we don't... But of course, they're, they've been asking it all night, and they're just going to get a generic answer in a moment. Jetson? Absolutely. It all comes down to time. <laughs> the amount of time that it would take to go through all the licensing and processing for a permanent storage goes on for many decades, and you could have an interim storage set up much, much faster in really just a few years. So it's really for the... You can have it set up in a few years, which is simply not true. I benefit the local communities, so they're hosting it. In the but why put it in the community? You don't have all your secret bases in the community? They really want it out of there. Anything? Well, I, we, we haven't been very successful I, I with like it so him. far. And, and until we have an integrated, sure, workable, entire yeah. national system, I don't think we're going to find a state that's going Damn to accept it. interim storage. It's going to relieve the problems that many of our shutdown sites have. But that's a shame because I think we're really missing the boat on this. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to, to wave on. This is extremely important, and, and I appreciate it, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman for being here and yielding back. Uh, I think BC Summer has wet pool storage, not dry cast, in South Carolina um, dry as well. I think so. Yeah. I can't remember. The, all of the sites, I believe, except Harris, have dry storage today. Yeah. Um, well, they have some. The majority of the spent fuel is, uh, the, is stored in water, underwater in pools that are evaporating all day long. So, so I think they're trying to cover that facet up. Ain't that interesting? Mr. Allen is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Duncan, for letting me wave on to this uh, Energy minutes. Subcommittee hearing to discuss the role of the Please. federal government in managing spent nuclear on, fuel. Uh, as Mr. Carter mentioned earlier, my district in Georgia is home to Plant Vogel, where the first two nuclear uh -huh. reactors were built in over 30 years in the United States. So that's literally nothing to be proud of. And that's the evidence there is no nuclear renaissance. You only built two reactors in 30 years, but here you're claiming there's a nuclear renaissance and it's going to be small modular reactors, and they don't even exist, not even barely on paper, but no applications into the regulatory agencies. Unit 3 came into commercial operation last year. Unit 4 is... is and how far behind schedule, and how many times over budget was it again? Oh, that's right. How many people, what did they rob the taxpayers of? It was five billion, seven billion, nine billion altogether. Uh, Tachiba, was it Tachiba went bankrupt? Westinghouse went bankrupt there, for goodness sakes. There was over 5,000 vendors that were working there, like the pipe fitters and the insulators, electricians, that didn't get paid. So, like, I find a just mind-boggling that somehow or Unit 3 came into commercial operation last year. Unit 4 is, is, is achieved 100% power and is connected to the grid. Uh, this was a significant milestone for nuclear energy and for the United States, and it further underscores uh, by the bipartisan passage of the Atomic 
Energy Advancement Act in the House earlier this year. Uh, as we work to expand nuclear energy capabilities in the United States, it is imperative that we address the management of spent nuclear fuel, which is the subject today. Uh, this issue is particularly significant for my district and state given that both Plant Vogel and the Savannah River site located across Savannah River currently house spent nuclear fuel and probably over 40 percent of those working at Savannah River site live in the across the, uh, the, the uh, line in uh, my district. Congress pre previously took action to address spent nuclear fuel by amending the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 and selecting Yucca Mountain in, in 1987 as a site for uh, the permanent repository, uh, being that Yucca Mountain is already contaminated. Uh, and uh, it is, is the place that we, I think we've got nuclear fuel stored in 21 locations around this country, spent fuel. And we're, uh, in fact, you know, that was the reason for the trust fund. Like first off, The, the idea, right, is to challenge your laws, so it's hard to remain silent more than 30 seconds because they're going to lie, right? They're, he was saying there, um, Yucca Mountain was already contaminated, but it's not. And, like, the problem is, is that every half a sentence is a lie, and if you don't challenge it, and so it took us and it's taken us, let me see, over seven hours to challenge a three-hour video because every half a sentence it's a lie that i got to come out and acknowledge. Sometimes I don't acknowledge it the most elegant way. I'll, ac I'll acknowledge that. Mm, okay, all right. But the reality of it is they're setting the policies in the future for North America, not just America. And their policies are based upon not even opinions. They're based upon deceit and dishonesty and deception and misrepresentation. And I, I'm not here to be a nice guy. I'm here to challenge every one of their narratives. And after seven hours, sometimes I'll get goofy. Sometimes I'll get a little outrageous. Sometimes I'll be spot on. Sometimes I'll be heartbroken. Sometimes... I'll say what's on my mind, but uh, I'm challenging every one of their narratives, and it's just mind-boggling that every half a sentence, there's another lie that I want to acknowledge. And it's just, after all these years, to see this accumulation show up where their version of reality has nothing to do with reality, my apologies. It's just frightening. Uh, to uh, to provide this protection at Yucca Mountain. Uh, Mr. Barrett, in 1983, on, President Reagan on. signed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act into law, and over 20 years ago, the Congress and President Bush certified Yucca Mountain as the site of the repository after years of scientific study that confirmed Yucca was a suitable site. Can you explain why the Department of Energy yeah, but there was tons of studies that said it wasn't. And this was one of the big fallacies of nuclear is the Aljabokapit studies, and the idea is to tangle it up and create more studies, more delay, because they stole the money through administration. And then eventually you can ask for more Energy under three funding. administrations has yet to follow the law of this country and license Yucca. Because the state of Nevada vehemently objects to it, and this is the United States of America, and they have the political ability to stop it because they did not believe that was fair. Um, and I would add a little bit, Yucca Mountain physically itself, that area of the Nevada test site is not contaminated due to testing from decades, many decades ago. Okay. Uh, what, what, what role did congressional appropriations play in this mess? Okay. Congressional appropriations is the, is the tool that the state of Nevada has used to block all progress forward because they do not believe this was fair. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. White, how much in ratepayer fees to the Nuclear Waste Fund have been expended on Yucca Mountain? Uh, more than $12 billion. What have ratepayers gotten in return if the Department of Energy continues to not fulfill its responsibilities under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act? Nothing. Mr. White, the people in my district, let alone my state of Georgia, should not pay another nickel to the government for high-level waste disposal until the Department of Energy actually accomplishes something. As I understand it, the fee collected from ratepayers was stopped, but Georgia taxpayers continue to pay for the failure of the Department of Energy to take the uh, title to the spent fuel. Should Congress force a public notice of the judgment fund spending so people understand the price of government's failure? Educating the public on the cost of the program and the, and the cost of inaction would be invaluable. Going forward, what would you view as a sufficient accomplishment? Uh, significant progress towards the actual licensing of the of the repository. Um, we we would prefer to see it get licensed so that we could begin construction. But at this point, uh, the fact that there is no review going on at all. Is, is troubling. We would like to see review of the license continue and go to completion. Okay. Dr. Wagner, uh, my, as mentioned earlier, my district is adjacent to Savannah River site and uh, just across the river. And as you may know, approximately 3,000 spent nuclear fuel bundles are currently stored at SRS. Uh, the site is also home to H Canyon facility, uh, which is the only operating production scale nuclear chem uh, chemical separation facility in the United States. It's been used in the past to recover usable uranium from processed spent nuclear fuel and is expected in the near future to begin producing uh, HALO fuel, a highly sought after fuel for advanced nuclear actors. Are you familiar with H Cannon, H -Cannon uh, facility at SRS? Uh, somewhat, yes. Uh, can you speak as to how it might serve as a model or an example of a need for a similar expanded uh, capability in the United States in the future? Um, it, it actually has been successfully operating for a number of years on a small scale related to DOE-owned materials and, as you noted, producing HALU, similar to what we do at Idaho National Laboratory, but in a different, <coughs> different way, different facility. But they're, they're not producing HALU fuel. They're attempting to. They've got all the money they could ever dream of. They've got more money than they'll ever need to do it. But because 90% of the money goes to administration, there's a very long learning curve before it can happen. And that, you know, the victims at Fukushima doing the cleanup don't dress like that. They don't have this equipment. And if that's radiation, you couldn't pick it up or stand alongside of it without getting seriously injured. Those are technology demonstrations that could be built and expanded upon uh, going forward. Okay, great. Good. I'm out of, of way past my time. I'm sorry. Thank you all for participating in this important hearing, and thank you for uh, helping us try to solve this problem. <laughs> Gentlemen, yields back, and um, you're correct about H Canyon as a national asset that uh, needs to remain in place for chemical separation processes. We talked about hot boxes uh, earlier, very similar situation uh, if we're going to deal with uh, the, the waste. It's been a great hearing. Uh, you saw, saw a lot of bipartisan um, cooperation and agreement on this issue. So we're going to have to decide where we go from here. It's going to take a legislative initiative. And uh, we're going to keep working on that. I want to thank you all for being here and providing your valuable testimony. And uh, members may have additional written questions for you all. So I'll remind members they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And I ask witnesses to do their best to submit responses uh, within 10 business days upon receipt of those questions. Um, I ask unanimous consent to insert the record. Any documents included on the staff hearing document list without objection to order and without objection. Um, this sub subcommittee will stand adjourned. Wow, we made it. Holy shit. Excuse the language. Thank you. <coughs> Would he leave the mic on? I'm glad they did it. I'm glad they did it. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Ye
And it feels like seven and a quarter hours to me, but hey, you know, I checked the time, seven and a half hours. Let's end it. Oh, I'm busted up. I can't even move my hips. Kink in my rib cage. Back is shot. Thank you, Colette, and everybody else. Joe, Richard, Maritime, Slave, Joey, Dana Nasana. Way to go, Dana. Dana never misses the show. All these years, man. Well, Stephen Young's out there and he's lovely. <clears throat> Mark Rogo made it through. Did you, Mark? Way to go, man. Good stuff. Starlight. Remind everybody that uh, we really do got to raise money, right? Uh, the two links, the main links directly to my accounts are in the bottom of the description. One to PayPal to Dana Durnford and the other one to my website. And we got a hard, we still got a long way to go. We got bad weather forever. It looks like it's going to be bad for quite a while in the future for next week or so. It's supposed to be warm tomorrow, so tomorrow I'm going to go out and tool around with the boat. Try to get that running. Because we can't afford a mechanic. We'll get there. Who knows how long it's take, but we're going to get there because... This year I'm planning on um, being active again. And getting out to get as much research for species in insects and birds animals on the ocean if we can pull it off get back out we like to get out before the, when the eggs are laid for the species we were studying last year and for three main species and i'll just shut up i guess that's the best thing that's the easiest way to call it a night is just shut up and say good night good night everybody thanks for coming along for the ride we'll see everybody on the very next episode, Sunday, unless there's a major event, we'll be back stronger than ever. Have a great night. Hugs for everybody. Have a great day tomorrow and a great day on the weekend. We'll see everybody in a few days. Take care.